And there we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to INE's uh, bootcamp series, GitHub for Everyone. My name is Brooke Seahorn, and uh, this is actually going to be a really cool. I know you've always heard people say, I couldn't be more excited. And you think, yeah, whatever. This is actually going to be very cool. In this particular series, what we're going to do is we're going to be diving into GitHub, looking at some of the features. And the main thing I want you to remember about this is it's GitHub for Everyone. One of the things that uh, a lot of people miss out on GitHub is it's not just for developers. It's not just for infrastructure people. You can use it in so many different ways. It's really creative, but the problem is most of us don't or are not even aware of the technical capabilities that are there. So with that said, uh, again, hi, my name is Brooke Seahorn. First of all, welcome to everyone who's showing up. I'm seeing several people, Aziz, Baron, uh, Matt, uh, Varen. Hey, everybody. Uh, Keith. Hey, man. Keith Bogart, the amazing instructor we have here at INE is also going to be sitting in the attendees room. There's actually a lot of people from inside INE who are going to be watching this because GitHub is just such a powerful tool that we want to let everyone, even the folks working in an INE, know about it. Now, for a little bit of a switch up here, there's something I need to tell you. Um, a little bit of a bait and switch. I'm not the instructor. Remember at i &E, we're all about experts making experts. And even though I'm learning a lot about GitHub, I think what I'm learning more and more is that I've been doing some things wrong. And the person I've been learning from is the person who is going to be leading this. And in fact, came to i &E from GitHub. And I'd like to introduce him now, Mr. Matt Davis. Hey, Matt, jump in, man. Hi, everyone. Thanks for showing up. This should be an absolute blast. Um, great segue, Brooks. Couldn't appreciate you more. Let's jump in and, and talk about you and I real quick before we, we get started. As Brooke cool. spilled the beans a little bit prior to i and &E, I did kind of do a little time over at GitHub uh, <laughs> and it was an absolute blast. And one of the best things that I learned while I was there <laughs> is that GitHub has so much more to offer than what we realize um, from the outside looking in. We're used to developers using it or students using it to use or to, to source code their, their actual, or version control their source code, right? So we're used to them using it for development projects. What we're not used to is the HR team using it for documentation. What we're not used to is using it to give all of our managers a view of work in progress. What we're not used to is making the work that we're working on available to the rest of our organization in case they have something they can chip in. And then we're also giving them a guide on how to do that. And that's something that really opened my eyes when I was at GitHub to the capabilities that this platform has. I'll take it even as far as telling you that to request time off, if you're a GitHub employee, you use GitHub. And that's kind of weird, right? You're probably worse used to going through uh, a system like JustWorks or some sort of HR management tool to request your time off for us or for them at github not us anymore uh <laughs> we would open issues to request our time off and what was really cool about it is it wasn't just an issue when we opened that an entire series of automation would kick off and add that time off information to google calendars to hr spreadsheets it would put put it in wherever the visibility was needed and the employee had to do nothing other than open an issue. It was really cool. So what we're hoping to do is expand your horizon on what GitHub has to offer you. Um, some of you might be developers. Some of you might not be developers. I hope there's more non-developers than developers in, <clears throat> in this session, because I think you're going to get a lot of insight on, on how you can enable your developers. So hopefully we can teach you a thing or two. Um, prior to GitHub, I traveled all over doing like DevOps consulting. And prior to that, I worked at a college. And prior to that, I did like networking stuff. So I've been all around the block. Um, and my most current stint is, is here at ID. And what's really cool is I get to bring all of that expertise to the table and talk about a tool that I just truly firmly believe in. Um, and that, that's the big thing is I could sit on any high horse from uh, a third party that said, hey, will you promote our tool? That is the exact opposite of what's happening here. Um, this bootcamp, although is about GitHub, like this isn't a sponsored thing from GitHub or anything. We at INE saw the power of GitHub 
and we we couldn't help but share it with you. So it's just something that we really believe in and believe can make your workflows a little better. So absolutely, absolutely. I'll kick it over to Brooks if you want to throw a little bit of your background out, and then we'll. Uh, oh we'll yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I've been in IE coming up on one year as an instructor here for AWS. Prior to coming here, I was at AWS, the mighty AWS, where I taught all sorts of facets of cloud. And I can tell you that you know the things that Matt just talked about, the collaboration. Looking back, there were situations where we really should have been using GitHub. One of the most, I, I, I don't know if you've ever run into this sort of situation, Matt, where you know, you're having teams collaborate just on documents, but these are big, <laughs> big, big documents. And there was a real push on inside about getting rid of some certain types of language inside our public facing documentation, or at that time, AWS's public facing documentation. The challenge was, uh, Matt, was that you're, you're talking about you know, a document that can have typically hundreds of pages in it, ha making sure that when it goes to legal, legal can see just what changed when you're passing around Word documents. Wow, that was a real challenge. Absolutely. That was, uh, dude, I mean, and it, the, the solution was right at our fingertips the whole time with things like GitHub. So I think that's really cool. And by the way, I hope you all heard the thing that Matt said there about requesting time. That's the flexibility of this tool that even things like that and become such a great single source of truth for what's out there. So anyway, yes, I was at AWS. I was there for several years. Prior to that, spent many, many, many years working within the uh, national uh, defense architecture, particularly for the DOD, the different branches of service, implementing cloud architectures. And then, of course, back before that as a software developer, still a software developer today, Matt and I have great conversations about Go and Rust, actually fighting at one another about which one's better. So Who goes uh, the better language? Yeah, so. we'll, I'll, I'll straighten you out, man. Don't worry. We'll get you straightened out. <laughs> so that's my background right there. But I can tell you, you know, truly... This tool is one of the most overlooked, underutilized things that you have advantage to you. And the thing about it is the sucker is free, absolutely free to individual users. There's some higher levels that Matt will teach us about, but it's just, it's free for the using. So we really do need to take advantage of it. So that's a little bit about me. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks for that, Brooks. Yeah, man. So we'd like to know a little about you and we know that you guys can't jump on the mic or do any kind of screen sharing, but I, I see one of you has posted in chat. It looks like BJ says that he worked or works <laughs> as a network engineer, no right. prior GitHub experience. I would love to hear about some of the rest of you guys that are in attendance. Um, you go ahead and post that in chat. Tell us yeah. you know, a little bit about you. And what we're really curious about is one, like your GitHub experience, like that's super helpful just to know like, if you've messed with the platform, under what capacity you've played with the tool, whatever mm -hmm. that might be. But the most important piece is tell us about a collaboration challenge that either yes. you currently face or have faced in the past. And I want to prompt you a little bit. Consider all the possibilities of collaboration. There's collaboration in your immediate team. Brooks and I have to work together every day. Don't tell anybody, but we have to. Um, <laughs> And that means that we have to communicate or at least our work is better when we do. So we have that inner team or that the intra team collaboration, but we also have to work with the production team. Don't tell them what we're forced to uh, again. And that's inter team. So how do we help other teams collaborate with us? And then on occasion, we might have to work with other organizations and you're probably in one of these buckets many times throughout your career. So I'm curious to, to know, like, what are some of those challenges that maybe you faced? And we'll give you like 30 seconds to type them out. Yeah, uh, just a little short blurb. Absolutely. Cool. So it looks like, like Baron says that he's also a network engineer um, working on DevOps and Ansible. High five. What up? I love Ansible. That is my configuration management utility of choice absolute favorite tool. That's how I got mm -hmm. my DevOps start. Mm -hmm. um, and you're just now learning about Git and GitHub. We are going to rock your world. I, I yes. think that you're going to leave the next three days. Not only are we going to show you how to version control all your Ansible playbooks, we're not going to dive into Ansible specifically, but all of the concepts are going to apply. You're kidding. also going to learn how to pipeline those. I've done some really cool stuff with Ansible and GitHub Actions, where I used GitHub Actions to take uh, you know, the playbook files and provision the infrastructure and just automate all these pipelines. And mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about that pipeline automation. We're gonna do a little bit for the quote unquote developer 
And then um, it's mostly going to be around like how you can apply this to things that aren't exactly dev or DevOps related, but much more like people management related. All of this stuff is going to apply. And I think you're going to, you're going to walk away feeling real good, real good. Cool. So uh, Keith says <laughs> demystifying concepts of repositories, branches and stuff like that. Yeah. You're in good hands. Uh, that's a, a horse that we will be sure to tenderize thoroughly <laughs> as, as we go through this, this boot camp. Another network engineer. Let's yep. see. No prior experience. Um, okay. I, I don't know how it might help with Cisco DevNet, but mm -hmm. it might. Um, what I can tell you is that any type of note-taking you're ever going to do, mm -hmm. GitHub is a wonderful, wonderful place for that. And on that token, all of the files that we work on uh, are going to be shared with you through GitHub. So that's the, the super cool, like magical review. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of you are probably going to want a copy of, of the, the bootcamp itself, which again, just check INE in a couple of weeks, the, the editing team, the production team, they're going to be awesome. They're going to put that up there, but maybe you want to leave something at, on Friday or leave with something on Friday. We got you covered. All of you will know exactly how to interact with the repository that we use during, through this bootcamp. And you're mm -hmm. going to get to take a copy of it with you. And that's going to be super cool. Absolutely. Uh, and going to be all set. So yep. if we go fast, right, if we go fast and if you feel like you skipped something and you really want us to share those files and those notes, just know it's, it's coming. You're going to get absolutely everything. And uh, you might even have visibility on all of our commit history along the way too. Yep. So that yep. be cool. And we'll talk about that. And one thing I want to add in there real quick, Matt, because I'm looking at uh, Matt and Brian, some of the stuff they posted in into the chat. Um, one of the best things about having Matt here to take us through this is the fact that if you've got a little bit of experience, you may have some events like where you go, because I've been doing that work where I go, oh, I was doing that wrong. Or there was a better approach to it. For example, are, we're, are we going to talk about issues, Matt, in this particular boot camp? I might have an issue with issues that we'll discuss. Yeah. Oh, see, and the proper use of issues really, it just, I, I could not believe I had missed something that was right in front of me as an absolutely game changing tool in terms of improving the flow of work, improving the flow of communication. It really does change the game. Also, when it incorporates with things like uh, the board, which I'm, I think we're going to talk about that too, aren't we, Matt? About what? I'm sorry, uh, I didn't hear that. The, the board. Oh, setting up absolutely. A board. Yeah, yes. yeah. So we are going to do a, a quite the deep dive into a lot of the surface yeah. level features. So yeah. So as you guys are going through this, not only is it a learning experience, but for those of you who have a little bit of experience, I would open your mind to the possibility that maybe we're doing it wrong because I know I have been, and Matt can show us the right way. Um, this looks like we have a question. Uh, how does GitHub provide us all of this? Um, is some of it free? Yeah. So there is no catch. Like that's the craziest thing. Yep. And, and I'll dive into that in the next section. So just hold that question for a second. Let me set these expectations. And that's actually what we're going to start with. Cause I totally agree with you. Such how a great question. So great. Yep. If there's no catch, what's the catch, Matt? And the catch there's gotta is be. There's, there's gotta not be. a catch. Like that's the craziest thing about it. Um, again, I, I'm going to get overly excited because I, I'm just passionate about this tool because of that right there. The fact yep. that there's no catch. It makes um, no sense. It makes no sense that this is free. Right. So here's the expectations for the bootcamp. Let's set a couple of things up. First and foremost, we are going to hound on GitHub. It is going to be the focus of the next three days. Most of the stuff we talk about, branch strategies, issues, version control, collaboration, it does apply to other platforms, right? Other platforms are like Bitbucket and GitLab. This isn't to say that they don't solve this problem either, right? This is just to say that this is Matt's tool of choice to solve this problem. Right. Feel free to use your tool of choice. A lot mm -hmm. of what we're gonna talk about will transfer, okay? So if your company uses GitLab, don't think, oh, shucks, I, I'm not gonna get anything from this. Same principle. Right. It's just like Azure and AWS. They're, they all offer kind of the same thing. Same thing here. Just a different name. There's different company, different tool. Okay. Yep. Um, the next expectation is if you're looking for a specific recipe on how to solve some very niche problem, I apologize ahead of time. You are in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> we are going to talk about 
leveraging this tool largely in the sense of collaboration and automating some of that collaboration. We're not gonna talk about how this tool fits into the DevOps pipeline in depth. We're not gonna talk about how GitHub provides you with this super rich history that allows you to roll back bugs that made it into production in depth. We'll, we'll touch on it, but you're not gonna leave with how to solve my specific problem. You're gonna leave with how to start thinking about using this tool to solve, solve your problem. Mm -hmm. um, second to that, if you're a developer, sorry, we're not going to build an application and ah. we're not going to be writing any code. Um, we, we might do a little bit of that, but oh, it's, cool. the, the focal point is not, is not that. Right. Does it help you understand Tanzu Kubernetes? It's going to help you understand keeping the version control for your manifests in order. Yep. It's going to help you understand working with other DevOps engineers to write those manifests you're going to yep. be able to do code reviews on those manifests. Um, again, it's going to help you understand the collaboration part yes. behind it. Are you going to learn anything about Kubernetes in this? Nope, not nope. at all. Nope. But <laughs> it's going to help you do Kubernetes mm. better. Absolutely. And especially nice. you know, with those manifests, Matt, that is such a big deal because the collaboration with a worldwide team, that's you know the sort of stuff that we had at AWS, you can easily and quickly share. You can look at the differences and you can make suggestions. It's just fantastic, uh, uh, VJ. I think you'll really enjoy it and learn a lot. Again, you're, we're not going to be diving into Tanzu Kubernetes, obviously, but you will have the foundation of going, ah, I see a better way. Exactly. There's a lot of things you would get from GitHub that we'll talk about along the way, like the security features can help with those manifests. Like you may have been in a situation, you wouldn't be unique if you were, where a sensitive API key or password kind of got stored in a file somewhere. Ouch. I know someone <laughs> that could be guilty of that at some oh. point. Uh, you know, GitHub helps with that type of stuff. So. Yeah, it does. Um, so those are, those are the major, major expectations. The, the last one that I want to hit on is that this is a 100% participation kind of thing, okay? Mm -hmm. We're going to build in some time for you to be able to, to <coughs> do some of the stuff that, that we're working on. And because of that, there are a couple prerequisites that come along with this. One, I'm assuming is a bad assumption, but I'm assuming you got a web browser. You have access to Chrome, Safari, Brave, you should probably be using Brave, personal yeah. opinion, um, whatever it might be. You have access to a web browser and here's the catch. You're on a network that can reach github.com. Okay. So if you're VPN through work, you can't get to the GitHub website. You're going to have a bad time. Get that fixed. Let's make sure you can get to github.com. Outside of that, those are your only prerequisites. I don't need you to have a bunch of other tools installed. Mm -mm. Truth be told, you don't even need to have Git installed, okay? So we're going to do all of this inside of the web interface, which is going to drive some of you nuts if you're terminal freaks. Again, this guy, uh, but that's okay. Again, we're driving <laughs> home different concepts. All right, the last thing is, if I go too quick because I get crazy excited in chat, say, Matt, you're crazy. Slow down. You've had too much coffee. Let Brooks talk. We don't like you anymore. Whatever you need to say, throw that out there so I know to slow down. Okay. Oh, yeah, because I talk slow. Absolutely, man. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So are you going to show how to do stuff with both Windows and Mac perspective? Just one plot twist. I'm going to use Linux. So oh, um, gotcha, Keith. everything I do is going to be on Linux. And I can give you from the stuff we're going to cover, it does not matter what operating right. system you use. To truth be told, if you want to be fancy, go grab GitHub Mobile and do all this from your phone because you can do that too. So mm -hmm. the operating system is not, uh, not a factor, right? It's all on github.com. So it's going to be all through your web browser. So your operating system doesn't, doesn't come into play at all for this. Um, but that being said, if you wanted to do certain things locally, you could use Windows, you could use Mac, you could use Linux. I use all three, depending on what I'm doing in my daily life. And I use GitHub for pretty much virtually everything all the time. Um, and, and hopefully you'll see why along the way. So 
don't feel like I'm on a Mac, I can't participate. Don't feel like, oh, I'm, I'm a Linux user, I can't participate. Again, if you have a web browser, you are good to go. And it's that simple. Good questions though, I appreciate them. And you're thinking in the right position here. What's really cool though, before we jump too far, when we get to this GitHub action section, you'll learn that GitHub actually supports all of these operating systems um, for its automation, right? So some of you might be deploying infrastructure on Mac or that, that is Mac-based infrastructure. Others might be having using Linux-based infrastructure. Some of you might be writing applications for all these different operating systems and GitHub is built to handle all of that. So I know when Brooks and I collaborate, he often uses a Mac and I use my Windows machine and we make commits to each other. And, and, and you'll see throughout the interactions we have in this bootcamp, it might be helpful for you to know this just based on this question. I'm gonna be on a Linux machine and Brooks is using his Mac. So as you see us interact with one another, that's kind of the ecosystem that we're working within. And uh, you'll see that he can, he can collaborate with me just fine through this. Are you going to have any breaks? Uh, no, we are <laughs> driving a tight ship. We will never, ever take a break. Um, so no, we will be having breaks at the enjoy. top. Yeah. We'll be having breaks at the top of the hierarchy. Sorry. That was on yeah. me, everyone. My always, fault. No, always <laughs> breaks. Yeah, always we, breaks. We so. will be having breaks, but what we'll be doing is either at the top of the hour or just whatever is opportune we'll be doing in there. So yeah, expect those everyone. Yep. Absolutely. We got to step away from these lights a little bit as, as the time goes on. It gets a little warm. Oh yeah. All right. So now in order to request a break though, you're going to need to submit an issue. That's, that's how it's <laughs> going to work for breaks. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to start. I'm going to throw up a quick poll, right? Um, before we really dive into this, I have a, just a couple true false questions for you guys that uh, I kind of just want everybody's, again, participation on. So let's take a look at this statement. GitHub provides developers a place to store project source code. If you think that's true, go ahead and hit true. If you think it's false or you're unsure, go ahead and hit false. And as soon as we, yeah, that's great. Awesome. We got 12, how many other people? Oh, we got 29 people. Nobody disagrees that this is true, huh? Oh, some people, we got maybe unsure, okay. <laughs> We're gonna call it unsure rather than false, right? Because that's important too. Cool. So you're right, right? This is how Get Home, GitHub, Get Home. GitHub is known. <laughs> it's known as this tool used for, here, I'll share these. Um, everybody can see the results. This is known for hosting billions, if not trillions of lines of, of source code, right, from developers. And uh, that was its primary purpose when it was first developed. It is now not the case thanks to things like DevOps, right? The push for DevOps said, we need our tooling to do much more than just be a simple version control interface. Let's jump to the next one and take a look at what that has to say. Um, I'll launch this poll for you. GitHub users need extensive command line knowledge. This is uh, something I hear quite a bit. So let's see, see what people think. I wouldn't be surprised. Yep, yep, there we go. Making a little more sense exactly, right? There's this idea that this is true. But some of you might have thought this before this question came up, but if you tuned in just a tad while we were talking throughout this intro, I said, we're not going to use the command line at all. We're going to go all through that web interface, right? So that's the awesome thing. Think about this when you're trying to talk to your teams. Let's say you have your production team, okay? We love them. They're not developers and that's okay. So GitHub is foreign. It's a foreign tool. It's as foreign to them as Adobe Premiere Pro is to me, okay? They might, your HR people, same situation, right? They might be intimidated to jump into a tool like this because the assumption is that they're gonna be in a terminal using all these command line commands to get any work done and they don't wanna star in the next hacker movie, um, <laughs> which they should, because yeah, good movie. Uh, however, this is a common misconception. So I'm glad that 
a lot of you seem to have picked up on that or knew that prior. So here's the next one. I'm going to do this for an hour. Okay. So mm -hmm. get comfy. Uh, placing code on GitHub means my project is open source. Let's see where we land with this one. That's a big one right there because there's a lot of managers. If you go to and say, hey, can we put this on GitHub to try to do collaboration? They're real quick. If they've been misinformed or if they don't understand, are going to say, wait a minute. Anybody in the world can see that. Exactly. And this is a, just a judging thing for me, not to judge you, but to just talk about how, how this is, is affected. All right. So this one is a little more split. Okay. And this is a very common misconception, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for it. You'll see when we get to the GitHub webpage, it, it prides itself on being the home of open source projects. Right. So you see that and it's really easy to immediately think that anything I put on GitHub automatically becomes open source. The actual answer to this is that that's not true at all. Not at you all. can have completely proprietary stuff on GitHub and you can keep it 100% private to your organization. Why does this matter? Well, think of the context we're talking about GitHub in using it for non-code things like your hiring policies, your job descriptions, right? If let's say your, your team is hiring and you post the job roles, responsibilities, all that in a file on GitHub that everybody in your organization can see. You've now made it easy for all of your employees to know exactly what the company is looking for and somebody can jump in and say, hey, you said that you want a DevOps engineer, but you're expecting them to have 35 years of Ansible experience. That's impossible. Can, right. let, me just, let me just edit this and fix this for you to something that's more realistic, right? And these things can, can happen. And that has nothing to do with open source versus closed source, right? So right. that's going to stay 100% proprietary to your company. It's not a, a code project by any means. And that's a huge misconception that hopefully we can clear up for you. And Matt, if I can just jump in here real quick, that of has course. been a major source, uh, sore point for me, working with different companies, particularly HR, uh, the HR departments, who've been doing exactly what you said. They put together um, these descriptions for a, like a DevOps engineer for AWS. I look at what they've posted and it makes no sense whatsoever. It's not their fault. Okay. They're in HR. They're not you know, they don't particularly care to know about AWS, how long it's been around. So when somebody says, and I've seen this before, somebody said, must have 20 years of AWS experience. So I was like, okay, that's neat. Uh, I know of no human being on the planet, including Andy Jazzy, who helped lead the whole thing, who's got that much experience. So when you get into a collaborative environment, and this is why we call this GitHub for everyone, this could be the place where HR puts the wreck out and reaches out to everyone and says, hey, does this make sense? And you can collaborate real time and really put together a tight document. And it's so easy to do. It's actually to the point of, I think, Matt, maybe you can agree or disagree with this, where it's almost to the point of, it was a mistake not to use it. Yeah, I well, I would absolutely agree. But I, again, super passionate about GitHub itself. And honestly, that statement of it's a mistake not to use it is not a GitHub specific statement. It is a version control kind of specific statement. True. So Very you should true. be using something like GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub. There's there's others out there. Those are just the, the major three players in the space. Your, your teams are going to benefit exponentially from mm -hmm. the ability to collaborate on stuff like that. It's a super easy fix, right? And and let's face it, the maybe the, that person that drafted that job requirement for 20 years of AWS experience, maybe they meant to say two right. and they accidentally bumped a zero on the keyboard. The right. fact that you had a hundred pairs of eyes on it means that you caught that before it went out and it took all of five seconds to fix, which you'll see. It'll be awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. On to the next one. It is difficult to navigate the GitHub website. Now, if you've never been if you've never been, we can uh, we can go with true on this one. If you've never been, we can go with true. Here's the kicker behind this question is it's kind of a gotcha in that the GitHub website, so GitHub, fun fact, GitHub <laughs> builds GitHub using GitHub. So what I mean by that is all of the source code for GitHub 
is on GitHub. It's closed source, by the way, uh, at least part of it is. So all of the source code for GitHub is on GitHub, which uses GitHub to then deploy GitHub to its cloud environments, okay? And they're a DevOps product and there's DevOps all throughout GitHub, which does many, 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 many deploys a day. Uh, I'd say on average, probably 50 deploys a day to all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that causes this website, the actual web application itself to change very frequently. Um, one of the best things about being, being on staff is I got to see all of those changes really early because I had what was called a staff view. So I could see the features come and go, but it also made work really hard sometimes because buttons would move, they would mm -hmm. disappear. I would get super cool new features that were useful and then they'd take them away for some reason. Um, but expect this to be very fluid. <laughs> exactly, Gitception. Um, it's going to be fluid. So if you find it hard today, it might not be hard tomorrow. And if you find it easy today, your time's coming. Don't, don't get comfy. Your time's coming. All right. We got just, just two more, a couple more of these. And then this is really going to help us. And then uh, we'll, we'll stop beating this pole horse. Yeah. GitHub helps project managers view work in progress. I like this question, Matt. I know you do, Brooks. I know you do. I like it. I know. Yeah. That's awesome that everybody agrees on this. Now, my follow-up question would be, do we know how? And, and I bet that's where some, some really cool mind-blowing stuff is going to show up. And we talk about how project managers can view this work in progress because it's much more than just being able to see what changed or what's in the process of changing. Um, some through insights, we'll take a look at yep. insights. Uh, mostly through projects, it's kind of a collection of all of it, right? And if you know where and how to look, uh, using tools like insights, projects, pull requests, issues, the whole thing, um, you'll see, ex you'll start to form like this entire map in your head about exactly how fast and how on pace a project is, how behind it is, who is doing, you know, taking on what responsibilities, for that project. Um, as a project manager, you'll know who to ping in Slack and say, hey, Brooks, I need you to do that review, man. Like you've, it's been sitting there for two weeks. What's taking you so long? And Brooks is like, you know, I, I just, you know, forgot about it. Yeah, I'm right. human. How about that? Uh, and you're like, and then he goes and he checks it and he, he takes care of it. And as a project manager, instead of chasing Brooks down for four days, trying to get something done, it was one ping in Slack and your, your job is now easy because, uh, Brooks went, went ahead and took care of that really quickly because he had the right tools. I like the converse argument on that one, dude, where they called me up and they say, hey, why haven't you done that yet? And I can say, did you not go check GitHub? Exactly. <laughs> did you exactly. not go check? <laughs> All right, two more. GitHub is a tool for development teams. It's another trick question, isn't it? Mm hmm Exactly. Yes, it is a tool for development teams. It's not a tool limited to development teams, though, and that's a huge at all. misconception. This is this comes every time you you look at something on the internet for a course on GitHub or you're in college or whatever. It really seems like this is only for devs, right? Or maybe DevOps engineers at this point. And honestly, it's just unfair. I would uh, when I used to travel, I would use GitHub project boards to build my packing list on what I needed to take with me. And I would just slide the cards over as I pack. Oh. So I've used this for all sorts of things. And that's when I, when I say firmly believe in it, it's because I've thought of very creative ways to, to use the platform and it really helps keep me organized. All right, last one. And, uh, and then we'll uh, get on to talking about some of these accounts and we'll get back to that catch. Knowing how to write code is necessary to use GitHub. He's a little bit of a trick question, but not, not much. I can very some, easily divide the room with how that's I was going to say, you did put some tricky ones together, man. This is tricky. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's graded, so get it right. And, uh, right. And then we'll be fine. Cool. Majority of you say false, which is, which is great. Uh oh, we switched. Yeah, no, we didn't. Okay. Sorry. Which, uh, which is great. Most of you say false. It is not necessary. We, we have a couple unsures most likely, 
Um, I could easily divide the room by saying GitHub has its own language. Uh, it's not really a language. It's a, it's a markup format for, for writing awesome documentation. And we're going to spend some time doing it. And it's going to, at first you might be like, man, why am I doing this? But once you start using it, you're going to realize that you can make documentation that is intuitive and has all the cross-linking you could ever want into it and examples and everything really, really quickly. Um, it's, I've used it so much now that I find it really hard to write Word documents or Google Docs documents. I can't use regular word processors because it takes too long to format them. When yep. if I use Markdown, it's really, really fast for me. I think I'll go, so, a step, I'll, I'll go a step beyond that, Matt. I would actually go as far as to say is that I think it's going to become a required skill. I hope really, it does. I hope it does too, because at the end of the day, when we're talking about comparing very large documents, again, something like HR, where they're setting some sort of legal precedence that's going to go throughout the organization, and this is a multi-page dense document, and somebody wants to make a change to it, being able to quickly find that change, Markdown set up for it perfectly inside things like GitHub. And so then why am I dealing with this giant document with embedded control characters that I can't even see that when I try to do a dip, it's just going to go nuts. So with that said, Markdown, just everybody, it gives you so much more capability. I don't, let me get off the soapbox on that one. It's a skill <laughs> you need. We'll touch upon it here. Yeah, we're going to do some cool stuff with it too. So it might seem a little drab at first, um, but we're going to do some really cool things, at least oh, in my yeah. opinion. Absolutely. Um, All right, so what is GitHub, right? We've kind of answered this along the way, so I won't beat this horse too much. It is the industry leading tool for mm -hmm. source code management, right? And it is becoming the industry, uh, or it's trying to become an industry leader in all things collaboration and project management, right? And to include the source code that goes along with that. It really wants to be your entire DevOps one-stop shop. And it's working hard to do that. Um, it has a long way to go and that's okay. That's, that's our space. We constantly iterate, right? GitHub is so important to the world that it is ready for a disaster recovery situation. Fun fact, okay? Wow, wow that's true. GitHub has more source code on it than any other platform, right? So most of the world's open source projects are on GitHub. So much so that GitHub believes in a disaster scenario, they could recover most of the code that is in existence today. They actually purchased, you could look this up, they, they purchased space in what is called the Arctic Code Vault. Right, it's in the, the Arctic Circle next to the the seed bank. You're probably all familiar that with the seeds that are stored up there, so that we could replant the earth if we needed to. Well, uh, about a year ago, they took a snapshot of all of the public repositories on GitHub, so all of the code in the public repositories, and they stored that on a drive in the Arctic right now, and they updated every now and then but it's, it's stored and, and ready to go in case of a disaster recovery scenario where we need to restore a bulk of the world's programs. And that's how critical good version control and actually keeping track of this stuff is. And that's how widely popular this tool is mm -hmm. that there's that much code that we could probably rebuild the world, which is mind blowing to me. Yep. What's really fun, uh, is if you had a GitHub account prior to this, you now have a really cool little badge on your GitHub account that says that you're an Arctic Code Vault contributor. So that's uh, that's super cool. Mm -hmm. so that's look. That's a little about GitHub, right? We're gonna we're gonna dig more into it with the uh, Arctic shells rapidly melting. Should I be concerned that my strawberry seeds will be lost? <laughs> uh, beats me. I don't. I I mean, the question is, are you 20 or are you 70? Right. If you're 70, you don't need, you don't care about those seeds, right? If you're 20, <laughs> strawberry shortcake might be off the plate later on in the future here. So, oh my gosh, how did we get on that subject so quick? 
<laughs> what strawberry shortcake? How do you yeah. not get on that subject? I That's don't know, man, but we swerved part. right into it. <laughs> All right, so um, that's the GitHub, right? We need to expand this thing to be much more collaborative in our regular work because if we're doing that with source code, like what if we did that with hiring processes? What if we did that with inner team connectivity processes? What if we could recover that in a disaster recovery scenario, right? So that's kind of cool. All right, so let's jump into these GitHub accounts. We're gonna get, we're gonna kill this PowerPoint at this point. We're gonna talk about GitHub accounts as a whole. Okay. Hey, enough of the slides. So, if you've ever been to GitHub.com, you're greeted with this super cool screen. Mm -hmm. Changes all the time. All right, this is just one of those things they do. They give you some really cool stats, um, and you're prompted to sign up. Okay. Um, I already have an account, so I'm not gonna go ahead and, and sign up again in this is kind of a teaching point. One of the things that comes with GitHub accounts is that you shouldn't have five of them, right? Ideally, you use the same GitHub account for your personal projects as you do for your work projects. GitHub is like built for that. There are plenty of checks and balances in place that ensure that I can't accidentally like merge the two where they can't see each other or whatever it might be. There's no harm in using the same account for, for those things. Um, as a matter of fact, like you can be a part of many groups with the same account. Um, but if we look at some of the pricing, right? This is the gotcha going back to that question. Look at this for ah, compare features, right? For in an individual account, just a user, a regular you and me, it's free, $0. What do you get? Well, unlimited public storage, which is great. Public means Brooks and I can collaborate with you. Public means somebody across the world can collaborate with you. Maybe the DevOps engineers that you were talking to in Discord want to help you with your Kubernetes manifest. So you send them a link to your public repository. And guess mm -hmm. what? They help you. But what if it's work related? Or what if I have a super secret Tony Stark project that I'm working on? Go Iron Man. Well, I can also have private repositories, which means only me or who I allow can, can see these things. And all of this is free, but this is where the gotcha comes. Look at this. No access to code spaces, right? So what code spaces is, is I'll show you. It's, a, it's an online editor, a text editor. You don't need it at all. It's not something you need in order to use github it also there's a reason why it's not on free accounts it doesn't really benefit the individual user it really benefits the team or the organization or the enterprise the reason for that is your developers or whoever's working on your stuff would never need to put a local copy on their machine they could do all of their work on GitHub without ever having a local file on their machine. If you're just you, that's totally fine, right? You're not running away with company secrets unless it's your company, right? So it's, that's one of the, the advantages and that's why it's not included. This stuff, this actions minutes, hey, look, it, you get a little bit less. This is the catch, this is the gotcha. The free account gets 2000 minutes. The enterprise gets a whole lot more, but look at this. I don't know how well we can see that. So I'll zoom in. Free to public, free for public repos. How about free that? Free for public, right? Because GitHub does focus on open source in collaboration, the more stuff you do publicly, the more features you get. That's the catch for free. You're going to get more, more stuff to do it publicly. Same thing with packages. You want to store Docker images on GitHub? What might not even know you could do that, but you can, mm -hmm. right? You want to store Docker images on GitHub or NPM packages or some of the other artifacts that you're building. That's great. You get 500 megabytes of storage for free in private repositories, public, unlimited. It's free. It's great. Yeah. Can you take a second real quick here? Patrick has a question yep. and just briefly, because I know we're going to talk more about it later. Yeah. What exactly is actions? What does that do for us? 
Actions is an automation tool set that's built into repositories and they execute over time on virtual machines. Mm -hmm. So when it says actions minutes, it, it genuinely means that let's, let's make this hopefully bring it back to something we all maybe understand a little differently is let's think of an AWS EC2 instance, a virtual machine in the cloud, right? We turn on that virtual machine and we start paying for it by the minute, right? For every minute the virtual machine is on, we get a little bitty charge. GitHub Actions is, is the same thing for every minute, the what's called a workflow, which we'll dive into. Every, for every minute that workflow runs, it, it's accumulating those minutes. So if you hit more than 2000 minutes, you won't be able to trigger another workflow for that repository. What's crazy is this is a repository by repository basis. Okay, so like, let's say you had one private repository. Well, you get 2000 of these action minutes before you have to pay for them. There's the catch, right? Like you could buy more minutes. You could also just create a second private repository and get 2000 more minutes or a third private repository. And now you have 6,000 minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you're slick, you can kind of link all those things together and have unlimited private repository minutes uh, if you did some finagling. And uh, I say that, and I don't know if it's against the, the terms of service. I haven't dug into it that much. <laughs> I do know that I've, I've done that for like a lot of proof of concept things for GitHub themselves. And nobody's ever like scolded me for that. Um, so, Unlimited though for, for public. So this is just quite literally how long your automation process takes. And to, to kind of put a button on it uh, for you, Patrick, when we're talking, and for everyone who's, who's watching about what Actions is, one of the things I've used Actions for personally is, is I like to use a, a framework called Pulumi to create AWS architecture. And basically you write it in Python. And then what I can do is, is I can send, I can push that code up to GitHub and then via GitHub Actions, that is the compute time, it actually reads my code. It will create my architecture for me in AWS. And there's a lot of examples of things like that, for, you know, particularly with containerization, deploying containers, the time that it takes for their servers to kind of crunch what you've done and put it out there, those are those minutes that Matt was just showing us. And I think it kind of, I mean, for me personally, Matt, it's one of those moments where I cut my jaw drops a little bit more because I realized that was free. I right. did that at no it's cost crazy, right? so flipping ever. If you went to go hook up Azure Pipeline, you're paying for that. Oh my gosh. Right? Like AWS, y'all, you better so buckle up. It's nuts that it's free as long as you're willing to be public like that's yeah. that's like okay how many of us have learning experiences when we're trying to figure these things out like just set that stuff up for free in a, in a public repository like it doesn't look bad on you if you learn something right like that's why you're here like you're not ashamed to be in this boot camp maybe because you're hanging out with brooks but for the most hey. part like <laughs> <laughs> like you're here so you you embrace learning so why not make that public and get it done for free and it's not free like google offers you here's 300 dollars in credit no it's mm -hmm. just it's just free like i can't unfree it it's that free well not to mention this whole thing that you and i've talked about so much when we talk about this engineering uh, stuff that we're working towards it's the idea that when you're sitting in anything including our videos where we're teaching you something use github create yourself a little repo based on what you're learning and put your notes in there because of two reasons. One, obviously it's going to be your notes, but two, when you get to that job where you need to remember, wait a minute, Matt told me how to do that in GitHub. You can just go to your GitHub repo and look at your notes right there. Exactly. Again, why I'm talking about Markdown is such a big deal because GitHub will render your, render your Markdown very beautifully. So you've always got that stuff available. And as bonus points, when you go into that job interview and back me up on this one, Matt, when you go into that job interview, uh, like we were talking about uh, Kubernetes and they say to you, how would you do that? Nothing, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pound the desk. Nothing will win the day like you're going, well, actually, if you want to, let's take a look at my GitHub repo. Bingo. I've actually got some code like that. You've just won the interview. Exactly. You just and then won it. when you start, you know, you might, you might run into a problem. You're like, man, didn't Brooks teach me how to do that with a script? in that right. course, like you have right. that script, just take it to work with you, right? It's a toolbox. So again, what's the catch? Let's go back to that. We'll circle back to that. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's public, it means everybody can see it. That's the catch. 
what does GitHub get from this? More code to put into the Arctic code vault. Mm -hmm. There's also this thing that we're not going to dive too much into detail. It's called GitHub Copilot. It's a, it's a programming bot that you can tie into like Visual Studio Code and it uses AI to suggest code snippets for you, right? You can actually write a whole lot of code with ever, without ever writing code. The data in the code used to train Copilot comes from public repositories. So what does GitHub get from that? They get to make their stuff better because they can analyze the things that are taking place in the community, right? So that's the catch. GitHub gets to use your public stuff to make GitHub better for your public stuff. It's like, that's the catch. So the other catch is there's tiers, right? You see 0, 40, 210, this isn't exactly accurate. And again, this changes all the time, so we're not going to harp on the price. But what you do need to know is that this is for free. But what if I want some of these things to exist? Um, let's see if I can find one. Like, what if I wanted required reviews on a private repository and I'm an individual user? I can sign up for something called GitHub Pro. And it's not listed here, but it does exist, I promise. If for a whopping $4 a month, so what, a third, maybe a quarter of the cost of Netflix at this point, you mm -hmm. can enable a lot of these features in an unlimited fashion for your private repositories, okay? So like, that's what you get out of the upgrade is all the stuff you can do in public repositories, like you get in the private ones. You're also not gonna get support, like, but that's okay. Um, you, you're not going to need it. That support is for like the enterprise servers and stuff like that. It's not for .com. Um, so GitHub has like a lot of different things like product SKUs, right? So there's .com, which we all use, but there's also enterprise server, which if you're an enterprise admin, maybe you care about, but for this bootcamp, we're, we don't, we're not going to dig into the enterprise side all that much. Um, so then there's there's team, which is also called organization. They, they go back and forth between these terms. It looks like it's team today. This is where you want to have like a core group of people you want to work with. So I'll give you an example. I have a, a small group of people that I typically work on projects with. We, we try to launch startup ideas on a regular basis, and we use a team or an organization to do that. So all the rep repositories for our stuff exist inside of, of this team realm. And then I use my individual account to interact with, with the team, okay? Um, and I'll show you what that looks like once I log in. I'll show you uh, an, an organization that I'm a part of, and I'll show you how we can all see that stuff. And uh, I might even, I don't know if I can create another one. Uh, the limit is, if you don't want to pay for organizations, so here's the other thing. It says team is 40 bucks, but it's not. Like it is, but it isn't. Like you can create a free organization that kind of inherits all this free stuff that we have. Oh, sorry. Uh, from this column of free stuff here, it kind of inherits that. But as a team, if you want to upgrade your team to do more intense private kind of collaboration then you can do that for a fee there is no such thing as a free tier on on the enterprise okay so that's the catch is there's these free tiers that are offered that offer you pretty much all of the functionality on public repositories there is a small fee for the quote unquote pro versions of those those account types that give you the access to the advanced stuff on private repositories. And then there's this outlier that's enterprise, which, you know, that's probably a decision that's a little higher up on the chain than us, but that allows you to run GitHub on-prem, right? So you're in that situation, maybe you're working with the DOD, finance, health, something highly regulatory that says, we can't use a cloud product. Well, we can get you GitHub on-premise. You just mm. need enterprise to do it. Um, so we're not gonna harp on that, but that's a, a huge thing about the account differences in the account types. So I'm going to log in really quick to my account uh, for you guys. And look, this is my username. And I'm perfectly okay with you having that. Doesn't, doesn't hurt me. It's public. <laughs> um, you guys should, uh, should absolutely 
go look at some of the repositories that I have. Excuse me, I have to authenticate, which we're going to talk about, which is why I'm logging in. Um, so I'm going to use my two-factor authentication code. If you steal this, it's okay. It's about to expire in a whopping 10 seconds. Uh, and here we go. Okay. So same screen, but if I come over to my profile, you can see I, I have a user account. It's, it's no different than what you would have when you first sign up. Uh, this is the Arctic Code Vault contributor stuff, which is really cool. Um, but at quick glance, so this is the, the individual user account, right? This is a personal account, not an organization account. Okay? Let me ask you about that, Matt, real quick, because I think this is interesting. This is your personal account. Yeah, absolutely. But this is the exact same account that you use to interact with me all the time inside the INE space or anything else that we're working on, correct? Absolutely. And, and yep, and I'll show you exactly that. Um, so that's a great question, actually. I only have this account. This is the, my only GitHub account, period. I use this for learning. I use this for work. I use this for personal projects. I use this for notes. Like I, I genuinely use this for everything. Well, the reason I ask is, and I think it's probably been about two years ago, I worked with an organization up in, uh, up in the Boston area. They actually had separate logins. You know, like when you came to work, they had their work-based GitHub account. And I remember looking at that thinking, I think that's a bit inefficient. I think that may not need to be the case. It is 100% in contradiction with what GitHub recommends as the best practice. So mm. the best practice recommended by GitHub is you just use one account. It's easier for them to, to gather the right metrics to help the community if you're doing that. It makes it easier on you. You don't have to manage different logins. Like I just had to two-factor my way in. That's one security feature. There's like, what if I had access tokens, another security feature, which we're going to dive into in a second, for all these different accounts. And I forgot to, to roll my tokens or whatever it might be. Um, it's just better for me. And better for GitHub if I have that that one account. It's Makes also sense. better for your organization because, like, INE, for example, has an organization in GitHub. They didn't create me a brand new INE GitHub account. They said, "What is your GitHub handle?" and and we invited me into the organization as as me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's really cool about this at first glance, right? Public, first and foremost, 143 repositories. Now. If you think that I have 143 software development projects that I've worked on and deployed, you'd be sorely mistaken, okay? Public, 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 public. Wait a minute, we see a theme. The guy with 143 repositories that spends some time at GitHub as an employee has a lot of public repositories, okay? But it's not limited to that. If I'm sure, if we look through here, look, private, private, private template, right? These are different repository types, which we're going to jump into. So don't get, don't get hung up on that right now. Don't try to steal my Harry Potter voice react app either. Um, so there's that. I'm kidding. You can't steal it. I don't think if it's public, it's open source. And you can get it. <laughs> yeah. And it's not even a remotely complete project. I was teaching somebody how to do some react stuff. So Again, collaboration, right? I do a lot of mentoring with people that are like going through like web development boot camps. And oftentimes I will create a repository and we will collaborate in my repository, hence the Harry Potter React voice app thingy. Um, so this is my profile. It's just like any else, anything else social. Like I can have followers so people can follow the work that I do. I can follow other people. Um, I can have uh, like... These are Docker images. This is an NPM package, whatever it might be. Um, I can have all these things and they're all associated with, with me to a degree. If I come down here though, we see organizations. And if we go and we click on, click on this one, this is an organization that myself and these other people are part of. Okay, so this is an organization account. And we can see that this is private and this is private and this is private and this is public or whatever it might be. And this is at the organization level. This is where we can do fancy things like 
manage teams, right? So I can create a new team if I wanted to. I can come in here and I give it its name, its visibility. I can create secret teams. I can't do these things as an individual. It doesn't make sense for me to create a secret team in, in my namespace. So that's the big difference between organizations and users is you get like this namespace where you can do people management, right? So I can say, hey, like here are all the people in this, right? And what their permissions are and who and what they can see, okay? So we're gonna pop out of here and we'll go back to my personal account. So now we're back to the personal account and you'll see I don't have the ability to manage people. I just don't because I don't need to. This is my individual account. So if we look at i and &E, I hope we can look at i and &E. I think we can look at i and &E. We just won't click into anything. We can see, here's this. We can typically see who's a part of it, right? We see there's 18 different teams and that's because i and &E is an organization account. And it also contains stuff like this. If you were to go to the URL, github.com forward slash internetwork expert, you would land on like a public splash page that you probably wouldn't even see that this, this exists. You would never know that this repository is real because it's listed as private. Same thing with my individual user account. If you go to github.com forward slash Matt Davis 0351, I'll even copy this for you. And I'll put it in chat just in case anybody wants to. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see any of the private repositories I have. And why is that? Well, it's because that's one of the security features is I can decide the visibility, both at the organization level and at the user level. I give more control at the organization level. I can set up when I create my teams, I can say, hey, Brooks is just a member or he's an admin or he's an owner, or he's a maintainer, and all of these give different levels of read-write permissions, okay? So if you want to go there, you can. Uh, another quick thing on your profile is you get this really cool contribution graph. I think it's safe to say I use GitHub just a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of contributions in, in the last year, in 2022 all, already. Uh, I think it might go for the whole year, but whatever. Um, and I can see where those, those contributions are going, what they're coming from. Uh, I can even scroll down and see my contribution history. Okay. So let's pause for two seconds and think about this from that project manager point of view. I need to know if Brooks has been working on something. Well, what can I do? I can just go look at his profile. I can scroll down and I can see, oh, Brooks created four repositories. Matt created four repositories. Right. Oh, look, there's open pull requests. Not only did, did they open this person open three of them in two different repositories, I can quickly see their status. Two of them have been merged. One of them is currently open. Well, what's a pull request? You got to wait a little later for that. Yep. But immediately on, on just me, I have very quick, uh, like a 30,000 foot view on what my activity looks like. Um, there's something missing here, though, that we're going to work on. It's going to be kind of cool. Let me jump in here with a question real quick, Matt. Before go ahead, Matt. I'd love you. Before we go to break. Um, so if I create a GitHub account mm -hmm. and I create a public repo, boom, it's out there for everybody to see. What about if a situation comes up? Well, let's say I want to show off. Let's say I've been working on my uh, skills with uh, Rust. And so I want to show off some Rust code. Can I take a private repo and move it to public? Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, before we get started, I actually want to ask everybody a question. We don't have this ready as a poll question. It's just something I'm interested in to see if anybody's noticing this. So over in the chat window, if you want to answer yes, no, true, false, one, zero, don't care how you want to do it. I've got a question. Has anybody caught, because I didn't know Matt was going to do this for us. Honestly, I did not know he was going to do this. Has anybody caught on to the fact that he's been giving us inside info? And I'm not talking about things that you can't find out. It's just things that are hard to find out about GitHub. I'm just curious if anybody else has noticed that that's going on. Because to be honest with you, I didn't catch it until just a moment ago. I was like, oh, he's telling us inside stuff. Yeah. Giving Very you all good. the secrets. Yeah, I know, right? Didn't notice. Patrick didn't <laughs> notice. I didn't either. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. Oh, okay. Oh, so, oh Brian. Outstanding. Remember what I said when I started that this is my VM. My personal computers when like so I only use this VM to teach. Like when I use things regularly, I am in dark mode, hands down. No excuse. No excuse. Yeah, it also well, show, I think it shows better on video. Well played, Brian. Well played. I don't like the way it looks. What's really <laughs> cool is you mentioned dark mode, but I had dark mode on GitHub before it was cool. Oh, mm, I had mm. that staff hookup, right? Mm, so I've used mm. like five different five different dark mode versions uh for github matt doing wheelies in the parking lot oh <laughs> making us look bad yep yeah. yeah. so cool yeah i just want to make sure everybody was aware of that that um there are things that matt's teaching us about github things that he's taught me as well that it's out there in the documentation you can find it but yes. it's just going to be hard for you to do. So you're getting a little bit of inside, although public info about how we can use GitHub really, really effectively. We might be able to quickly see, I get like feature preview still. Um, let's see if they quickly have dark mode enabled. See, there's just too many. There's just too <laughs> many. Do you want dimmed? Do you want default? See, default's kind of harsh, right? It's like really black. We'll, we'll switch it to dimmed. Ah, uh, Dracula. There we go. All right, let me come back to my profile. All right, awesome. I don't think that shows better, but we'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, all right, so let's talk about security around uh, the user account, and then we'll talk about security in, in organizations, okay? So um, before we move forward on that though, take the time, if you didn't do it during the break, and create a mm -hmm. GitHub account. Just go create a free individual user account. Um, we're about to get into some interactive stuff that I, it's you're just going to get so much more out of this if you have an account ready to go. Like if you don't have two-factor authentication enabled, I'm about to show you that. If you don't have scoped personal access tokens, I'm about to show you that. And these are things that you can apply right here, right now to your GitHub account. Hold on, Matt. We have reached a teachable moment that I have to slam on the brakes and ask you about. Now, uh -oh. This is this is what it is. Everybody, please pay attention to this one. This is something. One of the discussions you and I had very early about GitHub was talking about sort of the professionalism of what your account looked like. I was really concerned about the idea that I could have some goofball account over here and I didn't really want to show it because it's got like, you know, I used a goofy icon for myself. I didn't use like a personal picture or anything like that. Or I didn't use my name. I used something like just whatever I made up. Talk to me, and this is going to be, this is, this is really insider stuff here. Culturally, when we're talking about GitHub, does that even matter? It matters in the sense that you shouldn't think about it. You like, so ah. when we had that conversation, you had overthought that. Um, so for example, if we're looking at my profile quickly, this is, this is my, this is my name, right? Like in that form of like setting up your profile like this, I could change this to Bobby Bobberson. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably actually going to change it uh, to my crypto domain name is probably what I'll change it to. However, this is what's called my handle. Mm -hmm. right? And it is highly encouraged that you be a little bit creative and a little bit goofy with your handle. Um, for e example, uh, I tried to get the handle MD, but like E-M-D-E-E. -E -E when I got hired at GitHub because everybody is referred to as their handle and MD sounded cool and it would look a little cool. It could have just been a, a goofy little thing. Um, a lot of the people I knew uh, have fun handles like Hector Sector. That's, that's a handle of somebody I know that um, very professional still, um, beard of EDU. It's a guy, big bushy beard and he runs around doing enterprise level enablement. So beard of EDU. And you just kind of get known as these handles. So you don't have to be super clean and proper with it. Like I, I went and I had to throw some numbers on there um, that are sentimental to me, but they just, there's a lot of Matt Davises in the world. I'm not very unique in that sense. Um, but I had to do that to get something unique. And in hindsight, if I could do it all over again, I would have a much cooler GitHub handle <laughs> Same than, here. than what I have. Um, the other thing is like, you're going to find in, in the documentation and all over the place with GitHub emojis exist everywhere. Right. And it's just this 
this culture that that exists for this tool that says loosen up a little bit, have a little fun. As long as you don't have something obscene or offensive yeah. as a GitHub yeah. handle, you're good to go. And honestly, if you have something really stuck up like mine, like you're probably looked down on a little bit. Um, <laughs> I know very few people that uh, within GitHub specifically that use anything re related to their name. Um, I know an Admiral Akbar who clearly is not Admiral Akbar. Uh, that That's his handle. Like yeah. you're going to find a ton of really awesome stuff out there. So, and awesome as, so as they're creating these accounts, you know, if they're really fretting about something like that, it's not that big a deal, I think is what we could say to them. Make it cool, make it slick. Don't worry about, oh, I've got to really button this up and make it look exactly a certain way. That's not how this culturally in tech, in the cyber world, this is actually viewed. This is this is a little bit looser, a little yeah. more uh, creative. So yeah, don't worry about that. If, if you're creating your account as part of this, uh, this boot camp, or if you're in the future watching this as a recording and you're creating one, don't sweat that. Create and here's the thing is cool. you can change this later too. Mm -hmm. um, but the more organizations you become a part of and like, let's say it's a work related account and it's all like through federated login and everything that change could cause a lot of problems. But if it's just you on an individual user account, like I am right now, and I'm not, you know, in some single sign on situation mm -hmm. with with work or anything like that, yep. I could change my username right now and I'd be fine. The problem is, is now everybody knows me as this. And yeah. Like, I don't hey. want to change it. Hey, Benjamin's uh, got a question for you, Matt. Bad in your handle. Notice some problem using actions, pushing something to Docker, using the handle. But Docker does not allow uppercase letters. Yeah, so that's a Docker problem, right? It's not a, yep. a GitHub problem. There's a lot of weird little stuff like that that you have to consider. Um, what you could do, and this is a little off topic, but I'll give you a, a quick way to do this. In that workflow file that you have for actions, leverage the, the, the GitHub actor environment variable to get your username, turn it into lowercase, and then send that over to Docker. That's the actual fix for that. Um, we're not going to dive much deeper in it than that, but you could force lowercase so that Docker you know, does things the way it's supposed to. The other thing is, is it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't think like when you type it into the URL, I've, I don't think it matters if it's uppercase, lowercase. Um, but what does matter is spaces. What you'll notice in all of my repository names, there's dashes where there's spaces and they're all lowercase. This is not a requirement. This is just experience bubbling to the surface and me having countless problems mixing case and not including dashes for spaces because plot twist, GitHub adds the dash anyway. So every time I need a space, I use a dash um, when it comes to naming branches, everything. And I always just do stuff lowercase. There's no like best practice for that. That is just, I've been beaten up by not doing it. So that's, that's how I do it. So that's the quick fix to your problem. Um, and then there's the, the potential fix is just uh, trust everything in lowercase and question everything with yeah, next case. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so if you have an account, then all this will make sense. When you go to github.com forward slash your username, okay, you're going to see this little profile icon on the top right. If we click on that, we get all of this stuff. My profile, my repositories, my code spaces, my organizations, my enterprises, you'll see that I kind of fit in all of these, my projects, my discussions, discussions is new, we'll get to that. My stars, my gist, these are all just different features. And the most important piece is the settings, okay? In the settings, we can come down here to this whole access side of things, right? Um, we can look at our password and our authentication. So if I want to change my password, I can here. And right here is what is important, right? I can enable two-factor authentication. Now, there are lots of two-factor auth ways. The way I signed in earlier was with the Microsoft Authenticator app. Why Microsoft? Plot well, twist, Microsoft owns GitHub. There's your answer. <laughs> Am I limited to that? No, that's just the app that I used. You can find the supported Authenticator apps in the documentation for GitHub. I can tell you right now, the Microsoft one works and it's easy. 
The second way is using something like a Yubi key or you Mac people with the touch bar. That little fingerprint reader also works as your two factor to get in if you enable it. It's really slick, kind of cool. I don't know if the new Macs with their Apple chips like have any impact on that, but I know the old ones, I used to always use my security key. The security key that's configured is not a Yubi key, but this is where I would configure that Yubi key. You can also use the GitHub app on your phone. It's another guest suggested way to log in to GitHub and you can have them text you, right? So as you can see, I have a couple different two-factor things enabled. And this is simply because if the authenticator app breaks, I can still get in through the mobile app. Or if I'm not on my Mac and I can't use the touch bar because I'm on a Windows machine, I can use the authenticator app to get in, right? Because I work in a lot of different environments, um, I have multiple two-factor authentication methods set up. These are really easy. This isn't configured. All I do is hit edit. You're about to change this, right? You get all of this stuff. Um, I say set up using this. It will send you my authentication code. I hit continue. I go through these steps and I'm good to go. Now, for me, I don't feel like doing the, the SMS one. I have enough, okay? But pick one. For right now, it would be great. You could use the SMS one if you want. Set up your two-factor. It takes two seconds, right? Mm -hmm. You also have these recovery codes. Um, when you set up two-factor, you're going to be given a set of recovery codes. Treat them like a secret. Keep them safe. Um, you can roll new recovery codes, but this is just helpful if for some reason you don't have access to any of your two-factor authentication methods. You can enter your recovery codes. And, and get into your account, okay? So that is the huge thing. The other thing is like, maybe you're curious. Uh-oh, <laughs> dang it, y'all know where I am. How about that? Um, you can see what sessions are logged in and what devices. Yes, I'm in freezing Las Vegas, Nevada at the moment. Oh, it's very cold today, All right? So that was obvious. If I have SSH keys and stuff, like they're here, but you'll notice I, I don't. I don't have any SSH or GPG keys. I don't have any of this set up, but I don't actually authenticate with a password. Time out. You saw me use a password earlier, Matt. You're a liar. You're right. I am. Uh -huh. uh, on the website, I need to put in my password and then I'm prompted for two-factor. When I use automated tooling like GitHub Actions or Git from the terminal, I don't use a password at all. I use an access token, okay? So that is the next piece that I think is really important to set up. That exists under the developer settings. Such right? a strange place for it to be. It is and it isn't, right? Because it's typically for application or programmatical access, but it's still, I would like to see it with the other yeah. piece. Yeah, just give me just give me something there that says create this because for, for those of you who ever want to start using this from the command line, the first time you try to do it and it says give me your username and password, you're very quickly going to get a message that says, we're not using passwords anymore. You need a personal access token. And that's the thing that Matt's showing us right here. Yes. Yeah. If you try to use this from the terminal, you will absolutely get that message. Um, so when you come to dev settings, you're going to end up with three choices, GitHub apps. Like these are applications that, that you can write that act on your behalf um, and they interact with the GitHub API. Okay. This is not the, the token that you're going to paste in at that message. But if we look at, at what one of these might look like is you can come in here and this is where you get like your client secrets, uh, your information about the app, like where it's hosted any type of callback URLs. If you're a developer, all of this stuff kind of make, a web developer specifically, all this kind of makes sense to you. Um, but if you're not, what you might care about is this, this permissions and events situation. If you're not a developer, that doesn't mean you cannot use GitHub apps. GitHub apps are everywhere and they're really helpful. Some of them do things like add badges to pull requests. What's a pull request? Yeah, we'll get there. But they add badges to them. Some of them interact with Jira. They might like have a Jira integration to help move your Jira issues around based on what happens in GitHub. 
These are apps and they need specific permissions to do this. And this is where you can come in to deny or accept the different permissions for the application, okay? There's some default permissions those apps need, right? Developers are gonna say, hey, I need uh, these permissions. They actually build that into a small schema in the app that's outside of the scope, it's there, okay? The second major piece to this is OAuth apps. And these are things that you build that do some OAuth stuff. I don't have anything of like super awesome example in here, but they're very similar to GitHub apps. The only difference is they authenticate a user through OAuth, kind of simple. So I can get information about my, my user account. Again, if you're a developer, that makes sense to you. If you're not, it's okay that it doesn't. I just want you to be aware that this exists. This is the one that you should be aware of regardless of who you are, okay? So these are your personal access tokens. When you try to do something using Git, or if you're trying to do something with GitHub Actions, you might be prompted to enter a token. You might see something that says token authentication is required. In the event that you see that, this is what it's talking about. And it basically gives you uh, a token that you can set to have an expiration date. You see, this one doesn't expire. Bad, make sure your tokens expire. This one does expire, okay? When it expires, I need to come in and create a new one. This is the one I'm using today. There's a reason why it expires because you guys are seeing stuff on my account and like whatever, it's part of this VM that I just recycle all the time. Um, and you'll see if you're on an old version of a token, like this one is, you can regenerate it to take advantage of the new token format. This is another thing that changes in GitHub all the time. They're constantly beefing up the security of their personal access tokens. Okay. So to create one of these, it's really simple. You create it, you hit generate a new one, you give it a note um, for boot camp, not boot camp, boot camp. I can set the expiration and then I can scope all of these permissions. And if you want to know more about the details of those, there's a link right here. But basically, if I just want to be able to use this token to manage stuff in a repository, I can do this. If I never need to use packages, I just don't use packages. If I'm not talking about an org, I don't check org, right? And We'll, we talked about what an org was to a small degree. We're going to get into organization security in a second, right? We might, if I don't want to ever be able to accidentally remove a repo with this token, I don't check this. So all of these permissions get built in. It's not just a password. And then I hit generate. And now I have this token. If you go ahead and you log in and use it, you can read and write to my repos. You can't actually uh, delete anything, right? I, I just limited the scope on this thing you're only ever going to see this once and then it goes away i hope you had it guess what it doesn't work <laughs> anymore okay um if you try to use it now it's gone so that's yeah. how you can revoke tokens how easy was that i revoked it right here in front of you okay? so basically the idea matt is you know this token that we're talking about it's just a little text string it's something we're just going to paste in when it's asked for we can delete them quickly we can put and most of all we can put limits on them would you ever recommend somebody like turning on all those check boxes yeah like this one um <laughs> yeah uh would i recommend it no is there a use case for it yes um okay. if i'm doing something like developing specific github integrations where i don't know the exact scope of the permissions i'm gonna need Mm -hmm. oftentimes I will overprivilege first. This is just my way of doing right. it. And you shouldn't mm -hmm. adopt it. Right. I will overprivilege first and then trim privileges as you go. You could underprivilege first and add them, um, but some of the debugging is a little bit cryptic if you do it that way. So because I understand the debugging messages for these things in a specific way, I like to overprivilege and then scope backwards. Um, but you'll see like this one, I haven't used it in six months. Mm -hmm. So like, that's another cool thing. Your security people might need to, to know. And, and from the organization point of view, like you could audit this. This one I used just this last week. Mm -hmm. I used it today, plot twist, right? right? Um, 
This one I used in the last three weeks. This is kind of a bad uh, indicator because I used it much sooner than that. I think I used it in the last week, to be honest with you. Right. Um, so since this one hasn't been used in six months and this takes two seconds to roll a new one, I'm just going to go ahead and delete this one too. Okay. So as they're actually starting to use Git, uh, GitHub, if when they start running into like problems, it's not working. I have found that like the thing that's always got me, man, was I set up the, the, uh, the pat wrong. Yes. Okay. I'd set up my personal access token. I'm just getting some sort of problem there. And like everybody, I hope everybody saw just how easy that was to do. You generate new token, give it a name, set an expiration on it. Don't let yep. it go forever. Okay. In fact, uh, you know, the, the, the principle you should always have in mind is least privilege, like give that token, just the privileges it needs. So as you're learning GitHub, if you're finding you're getting permission errors, well, maybe you need to regenerate a new token with a few more permissions and then start using that, but you can find your way to that least or, 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 or least a permissive token that applies for that particular situation. You can get that. exactly. And that can be, you know, like role based um, for like, if you're HR, then you don't need packages permissions, right? But if you're a developer, you probably need packages. So to once tokens are created, if you just click on them, you can edit them. You can never see that string again. Like the, the actual string is gone forever. I'll never see it again after that, that page. But what I can do is I can rename this. Uh oh, this one's over scope. Why yep, is that? Yep. Because it's a developer token for me. But you know what I never use on GitHub? A gist. Yeah. I just don't. So I'll come in here and I'll do that. And um, I could regenerate it to set an expiration date. You okay. can't edit the expiration date, um, but I can update the token as quick as that. And you'll notice it doesn't show it to me again. Right now that token has, has changed its permissions. So your users don't have to roll a new token just because you need them to change their permissions or you want to change the permissions. You just go change them and they work real time. And that's going to change as soon as we do it, right? So we make the change. Done right now. We rerun yep. the command that was failing because of security. Boom, fixed. Yep. Very cool. Very so that cool. is from the user account point of view. organizations in depth we're going to show you how to add some people to those organizations and we are also going to take a look at some of the additional security features for organizations that take place okay so um, let's go ahead and, and jump over and do that what's really fun is now it's going to start getting interactive if you follow along with with this and you create an organization which costs how much money again what was that price again? I couldn't remember. 190 free, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you create an organization, which I encourage you to do, feel free to post your GitHub handles right in the chat and invite each other and follow along with some of the Absolutely. stuff we're doing. Absolutely. Get a feel for it. Um, when we move forward and stuff and you see the repos that we're going to be using, feel free to interact with us too. It'll be super mm -hmm. sweet if you do that. So don't hesitate. I'm going to come back over to an org that is pretty empty, but one that I own personally. So we're not going to work in a work org of any kind. Um, we'll go to this one. Okay. Doesn't have any public repositories yet. So if you tried to go to this, um, this site's not up. So don't even bother trying to go there. <laughs> uh, we were working on some educational content. Um, this is all just empty. None of this, none of this has anything. There are no commits. Uh, the whole point is that it's super empty. And I think I'm the only people. Yeah, I'm the only people. So organizations like user accounts have repositories, as we could expect. They have packages just like a user account did. But then they get these cool things, people and teams. Mm -hmm. And their settings are a little different. Okay, so in their settings, we can jump down to the security section and we get some other awesome things, which we'll jump to in a second. But the first one we're gonna talk about is authentication. If you're a part of this, this org, I can force you to have to two-factor in, right? So if I'm managing an organization, 
I can ensure that everybody that's a part of it has to two factor in. I can also set up allow lists to figure out what IP addresses are allowed into this organization. Now, this isn't super in depth, but when we start layering that with things like member privileges, right? The base membership of everybody that can see this org and the people that are a part of it only have read permissions. You can limit the types of repositories that can be created, right? You can decide what forks and who can use pages. And there is a plethora of options in here for you to craft that very specific use case for you and your teams and how they interact with this. So is there a risk? And the answer is there's always a risk, but there are a lot of built-in features that you can use to mitigate and scope everything you need from that organization level. And that is the moment when you realize you need to use an org. When do I use a personal account? When do I use an organization? If it's me and I'm accepting outside people's contributions, that's my personal account. If I'm forming a team and I need to have administrators in that team, or I need to have in, in groups of instructors or groups of people, then I'm using an organization. And it's very easy to, to create an organization. Um, I think you just come into these setting, maybe your orgs, it's been a while. Yeah, and you click new organization and it will take you through this process of, of setting up an account, just like an account for an org. Okay. That's that. I'm not going to create a new one because we're already here. So what's, what's, what's again, Matt, what's, what is that point at which, what is that thing I'm looking for? What is that thought that goes through my head? What is that requirement that I have that says I need a new organization? What is that in like in a pithy, like, what are the thing, what is the thing I'm looking for? I use organizations to bundle tasks. So let's say I Cloud College, for example, this was uh, some some offline in person meet space mentoring that we were going to be doing me and a, a handful of friends of mine, we're going to set this up. And uh, so we created an organization. Um, and we never ended up pushing it farther because we got sidetracked on something else, but I needed collaboration with them. I needed mm -hmm. them to be able to see more than one repo associated with this bigger idea. Okay. So if we scope this bigger idea even bigger and we did something like this, github.com slash GitHub, this is the GitHub organization, mm -hmm. right? So this is everything that is about GitHub. You can see there's 400 repositories. There's all of these people. There's these projects, whatever. This is what they show publicly. These numbers aren't accurate. There's tons of private stuff, right? And you get this whole read me on what they are. And you'll see, going back to our emoji discussion, it's fun. It's playful. It's this is markdown, right? Mm -hmm. And they did this really easily. Um, so GitHub is the idea, right? It's, it's the product that, that is going out there. Now, if we look at the repositories, there's not 406 GitHub, you know, code bases. <clears throat> What there are is these public repositories to do certain things that drive the idea of GitHub. Mm -hmm. Or there's some projects that GitHub has worked on, like providing COVID-19 stats to the World Health Organization. I got to, to work around with them on that. That was pretty cool. Wow, that's cool. Um, right. So from our perspective of INE, like INE is the idea. It's the name of the business. And we have a lot of different repos in a lot of different spaces, but we need teams and people to work towards that idea with us. So that is the the, the D mark for me. Okay. Is this a personal project, or is this an idea that is going to benefit from a team that is a standalone idea? If it's, mm -hmm. hey, I would like to build a course on Ethereum, I'm not going to create a new org. I might put it in Cloud College. Right. Right. Okay. I got you. So if it's like a civic project or something like that, we're going to work with part of your community to do something. We're going to build out something that could help 
say your you know your local area that sounds like an org type situation right there correct yes and it's because you, there's limitations on personal repositories mm -hmm. so if i go to a personal repository and i pick this one that's private this is another one of those gotchas for like why use a free account well i don't have a people tab mm -hmm. i don't have a teams tab that doesn't mean that i can't have collaborators mm -hmm. but the amount of collaborators i have are much it's much smaller i think right. i have like six or something like that so maybe if I have six people and we're working on one, like one off project, we won't create an org for that. But if it's a much bigger deal and we need yes. more than six people in a private repo <coughs> that, and, and I need them to be teams because here's the other thing is I'm just going to add people. For example, if I add, if I look for Brooks and I add this, I can only like put you here. Like you're just, a collaborator you're not grouped mm -hmm. as an instructor or you're not grouped as a developer or you're not grouped as a, as a project manager you're just a collaborator whereas if we come back over to the organization side of things let me do that we come back here and i go to people i now have different kind of tiers of people i have members i have outside collaborators i have invitations i can see who i failed to invite i can see these seats and i don't think this is a, a pro account uh, right or whatever it is yeah so team plan charges you a little bit this is a free org so like keep that in mind as we show you this stuff like this is what you're getting for free so i can add people to this no problem now I'm not inviting a collaborator. I'm inviting a member. And it's the same thing. I grab Brooks. I can hit invite. And now I can say, whoa, is Brooks just a member? Or is he a decider? Is he somebody that can have full administrative rights of this project? There's another demarcation point for you. Do you need more than one person to manage what the heck's going on mm -hmm. with this project? If so, Maybe I add him as an owner. So we don't trust Brooks. So we're going to add him as a member. We're going to hit send invite. And now he gets this member tag. Right. To this token, I can come in here and do the same thing with teams. I can create a new team and say, hey, like this is going to be a team of devs, um, description, build stuff. And I can say other members. So other people in the org can find this team or I can have a secret team. Right. So like maybe we have the super secret ninja team that talks junk about Brooks behind his back and we hey. want to have that team hidden. Oh, we can't do that. No, not, okay. no. Keep it visible. Darn. It's too much fun. That way I can, I can collaborate with the haters. Dang <laughs> it. Guess what? We'll make it secret anyway. And he'll never know. So, ah. Right. Or you can make it visible and Brooks would find out that we're talking about him. Oh, you see, Ooh, but now be, you, you're but now be careful with that. I mean, that, that is the thing right there. The thing where you accidentally not thinking it through, make it visible when you should. And, and, you know, Matt and I are having fun here, but this could seriously be something where you've yes. come up with a great idea, like something really, really cool. And you set the darn visibility wrong. So yep. as you're worried, I know a lot of you are just setting your accounts up for the first time. And so, uh, and by the way, Hey Matt, thanks for uh, uh, pop popping in your uh, share in there for us. Um, that uh, is something you've got to think about, y'all, when you're doing this. Again, think, make security job zero. And it means not only protecting access, but protecting the data itself. How sensitive is it? Is it, I hate to use the word classified because it makes it sound like something from the Department of Defense. But if you've come up with the next great idea, that's some pretty sensitive data. And you're going to want to make sure you've got that thing set to secret. So don't just rush through, think it through. And you can really uh, leverage a lot of these capabilities here to create safe, controlled, secret projects. Exactly. So we're going to go with visible. We hit create team. And mm -hmm. now if I want to add, I can start a discussion here. First step to collaboration. I don't get this uh, unless they've added it, which honestly, they may have added this to our private namespaces. Let's see. I don't think they did, though. Yeah, you'll notice that Brooks has a pending invite, but there's no discussion. He's a collaborator. So our discussion 
takes place a little different, which again, it's coming, I promise. Right. But in an org, you get like this forum called discussions where we can have a, a, a conversation within our team and only within our team. Right. I can also add those members to it. So now it's just like adding Brooks as a collaborator. I follow him. He's here. He's invited to this organization. We can also invite him to the team, whatever. We have limited seats because this is a free org. I have some orgs that aren't free um, that, that have much more seating that, that goes into them. Okay. So then we can change role, right? And we, he can be a maintainer. He can be a member and we can further scope that out in the settings. So organizations grant us this, the team management and membership aspect. Mm -hmm. they also, or they also afford us some really cool stuff in the settings for our repositories. And this kind of goes on to the security side of things. What you'll notice is that orgs can enforce things like two-factor authentication. Users cannot. I don't have the authentication box in a personal repository. In an organization repository, I have the authentication option. What I do have in an organization are these security features. And you get more, especially with public repositories, all the stuff is enabled by default. With private repositories, we have to do some stuff around here to enable them. And, and if we're free, we're limited. That's the catch, right? So we can enable this dependency graph. What this does is it shows us all the dependencies that are in our, our source code. If you're not a developer, you don't really care about this. We can enable something called Dependabot. Well, if we have a bunch of repositories, Brooks, and our users are allowed to create whatever repositories they want, mm -hmm, how do we know mm -hmm. they're not introducing vulnerabilities into our structure? That'd be a good thing for me to catch, man. It would. The good news is, is GitHub will do that for free automatically for you. You click in this little checkbox, and every time your users create a new repository, because this is an org level, this is an organization, right. it is enforcing right. these rules throughout all of your members, this will automatically be enabled. And the moment that that JavaScript library has a, a, a CVE published, GitHub will aggregate that to its database and a bot will send an alert to you saying, we found a vulnerability in your source code. Oh, by the way, here's the fix for it. Just merge it in. Hold up, man. Hold up. Stop right there. Hold up. So what we're saying now is, is that we've gone from, hey, there's this thing called GitHub that you can put code in to, Hey, there's this thing called GitHub. Where we can create projects and we can collaborate and we can talk to something like this, where I've got automated security alerts so that when people are putting code up there, maybe they're good. But, you know, if it's a civic project, I may have somebody I ran into that says, hey, I know how to code. No, they don't. And they're starting to put all sorts of garbage in there. This thing will actually catch it for us. Yep. Let me see if I can find one um, really quick. Here we go. <clears throat> What is this in, aha. So here is an app that I have. This is a repository, mm -hmm. right? And right here, I didn't do this. This is that depend about feature. We mm -hmm. found a potential security vulnerability in my dependency, okay? I can click on see that depend about alert. We got some new features and it tells me, hey, this is a high priority, problem that you have in this repository is 17 security vulnerabilities in this code base. Wow. We can click into each one and we get detailed information. We can see all the metrics for it. Um, we can see what package it's a part of and so on and so forth. We can see the ID of the CVE. Yep. So we can dig into it and, and go from there. Now, because this is a personal repository and I can tell because it's my username and then right. a repository, not right. cloud college or INE or GitHub or Microsoft, and then a repository. It didn't do the automatic fix for me. Okay. So but there's a catch. It doesn't do the automatic fix, the fix for me. However, if it was an org and I had this box checked, easily mm -hmm. upgrade to non-vulnerable dependencies, it would apply the fix. So this is a situation where not only as we as developers creating code, trying to work towards a project, 
But if we have somebody who stays working as the community manager, or if it's actually at a company where there's a project manager, because it is all of this available to them just to go look at at any time. Yep. And some to a degree, right? If you're only a member, you might not see some of these settings. If you're an owner or an administrator or a maintainer, you might see some of these settings. It's hard to say what GitHub's going to show you because, again, it's a rapidly moving project. And one week, everybody might be able to see what's enabled, but not mm -hmm. change them. And the next week, they might hide it. So I can't tell you for certain exactly what your view is going to be when you do go click into this. Sure, sure. But what I can tell you for certain is that we can manage these things. And this is enforced to all of our team members, whereas in order to get Dependabot set up for this repository, it's public. I didn't have to do anything. Because it's a public repository in my own namespace, wow. it's just there. But again, I don't get the cool automated fix this for me. But I can jump right in here and read all about the, the CVE. But look, they even, they did this. They said, hey, like, we're not going to automatically fix it for you because you're, you're a freeloader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything but if you just click this button here you go we have everything we need it's it's starting this automated process to where it's going to go update our code for us so even though i'm free i could just click that button really quickly and bam yeah but, but i mean this gets to the point matt and i hope everybody's I, I'm, I'm i'm chime i'm making a point here because i'm such a just an absolute hawk when it comes to security that even for situations where you have security teams that are needing to go in and check repos, they basically are getting it handed to them. Here's the latest CVEs. Here's code that's non-compliant to the point of they can really take ownership of that process where I've been in orgs and I know you have too, Matt, where, you know, typically security has been that team sitting over there. Yes. They let you know there's a CVE. An afterthought. Too. Yeah. They're sitting over there. The thing's already out there. They're not proactive. They're coming out and saying, oh, there's been four CVEs uh, published this week. Uh, you need to create some sort of workflow to make sure they're addressed. Utter nonsense, complete and utter nonsense, where if you have something like this, you can update your source code, push it back out through automation. Again, talking about things like actions that we'll look at more. And I'm hoping everybody's seeing this is a huge time saver. It's a worry saver. That's always a worry, a worry denier because it can deny you from worrying. But, but also because of the visibility, and this is something Matt and I spoke about earlier today. When those questions come up from the management and from project managers about where is this at, I like the answer of saying, did you go look in GitHub? Go yep. look. You can Absolutely. see what's the problem, what we're doing, how it's being resolved. This is an awesome tool for things like that. Now, it's not going to give you 100% coverage. Please no. don't think that y'all know. There's no such thing. You're going to have to get your hands dirty. But as a way to get those low hanging vulnerabilities out of the way, as Matt just showed you, I mean, it was just click, 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 and he's done. Yeah. And that's on a, on a personal account, right? And, yeah. and to that point, like DevOps, right? What's the big mantra? Shift left, shift left, shift, shift left. left. Well, what's more left than the source code? maybe the planning and the schematic, right? Like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is pretty left as, as far as that goes. So this isn't deployed. This isn't out to the public. And we knew there was a vulnerability in the dependency. Now that's just the dependency. That's not static code analysis. That's not, you know, runtime analysis. Mm -hmm. It's not some other stuff that you, you could do to check the security of the application. It's not a penetration test, right? It is quite simply dependency analysis. There are other things though with GitHub Actions that you could enable to do static code analysis. And um, it's not exactly static code analysis. It's kind of a new thing they're trying to do where they're trying to detect vulnerable patterns and stuff in a specific way. I don't know the, the nitty gritty about it, but you can tie that in and have that happen as well. So this personal account on a personal repo has mm -hmm. these security features. I can set up a security policy. I don't have one set up. Now, what this is, it's just a text document that tells users how to report vulnerabilities, right? Now we're in collaboration. This is a public repo. Brooks happens to stumble upon it. And he's like, hey, man, you're really bad at writing code. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And he's like, I need to report a vulnerability. How do I do it? And instead of saying, well, let's jump on a Zoom call, Brooks, and I'll tell you how to interact. 
I can just say, read the security policy and it'll tell you exactly how to collaborate with me. So the second thing you'll see is that this code scanning, right? This is static mm -hmm. code analysis. Uh, it's not set up for this. And if I click on this, I can configure code QL and some other code scanning tools, right? Um, it's not in, configured by default for me. And that's okay. Again, personal namespace. Um, we have our advisories. So I can also disclose a new vulnerability. Maybe I find it in a public because I'm, I'm doing some bug bounty stuff and I find it in an open source project. I can draft a new advisory to tell everybody about a vulnerability that I just found. So the collaboration about security exists right here. Coming back exactly. to the org, we get similar things. The difference is, is really that it's forced upon the, the membership and the repos of the org. It's not enabled on a per repository basis. The other thing you could set up is approved domains. And we can then also do some secret management stuff. So we can store encrypted secrets and credentials that we might need for automation pipelines. We can do that in the personal space too. Um, it's just a little different. It's not applied to every repo. In the personal space, it's on a per repo basis. In the organization space, these settings exist for everything that takes place within our organization. It, they, these are blanket rules that come into place. Yes. That and does no not, though, that does not eliminate our ability, see Cloud College organization mm -hmm. repository, it does not limit our ability to come in here and have access to the same features. That's that what I was going to ask. Very cool. Very okay. cool. So now we're layering it. We're saying by default, you look like this and you'll see these were enabled by default and that's an org level rule. This has not been enabled. I could enable that. Right now that's enabled. So I would get automatic fixes for my dependencies that are out of date, which scary sometimes, right? The broken dependency or dependency fixes can break things. Um, so double check everything, but you do get a chance to do that. I get all of these alert and I can say, hey, like um, if you're an admin or I need this security professional to know when something goes wrong, like let me set them up with alerts so that they get everything they know. Or let me make sure the maintainer of this repository knows when there's vulnerable dependencies. I can also do fancier things like configuring any type of deployment keys I might need. And I can manage the secrets a little bit different and I can, right. But because this isn't a repo in an org, okay. Yeah. This is just the general security that, that kind of exists for us. And then I can also see the differences in roles here, which I don't get in the personal namespace. I just get collaborators in the, the organization namespace, I get these fine grain controls over what that means. The other piece of this is in a personal namespace, I invited Brooks to a repository. He will never be the owner of this repository. I will always be the owner of this repository because it's under my user account. In an organization, if Brooks create a new repository he is now the owner of that repository he can assign that team ownership of a repository he can decide who gets to see what uh, as far as what teams have visibility on that repository even though it's within the org so you can still fire off private repositories that only the people you want to see can see and manage that without eyes that shouldn't mm -hmm. see us seeing it okay mm -hmm. um even though you're in an organization <laughs> together exactly you know real quick let me jump in here before we go to break again because yep. there's a point i want to make to everybody um and this is not a little point i'm about to throw something really big at you i want you to grab onto this um if you look at the research that's been done over the past three to four years on devops cultures inside major corporations something kind of scary is happening the space or, or the grouping between companies that are falling behind and companies that are doing the best looks like an inverted sign, okay? Where normally it's like 
these folks are doing terrible. There's like a nice big bell curve. This is most of the people. Then over here are the people that are really doing well. The thing flips upside down. There's a whole lot of people not doing well. And there's a pretty good amount of people that are doing uh, fantastic. So you've got awful and not well. And that group, those groups are spreading right now. I can dig more into the numbers. I don't want to uh, bore you with it. It is a huge research paper. Here's the thing. The stuff that Matt just hit you with about, let's do 10 minutes on this one, Matt. Um, the stuff that Matt just hit you about, about the collaboration, the ability of a security team to quickly see what's going on, the ability of PMs to quickly jump in there and see where a project is to see if something's gone off track because they've lost members, members have been sick, members have been retasked and they didn't know about it. All those sorts of things that seem so just, eh, what's the point? That's the stuff that the high performers and the DevOps community have latched onto and allows them, and, and Matt can back me up on this, this is a critical metric. They can generally, and we'll talk more about main and branching later. I don't know if we're going to get to it today or maybe mm. tomorrow. But from the time a change has been pushed to main to its, you know, it shows up on my phone here is about an hour. The time for them to be able to say, oops, that didn't work. Do they do a rollback? is about an hour, which means they can push updates constantly. And the only way you're going to do that, y'all, is if you have a tool like this and you understand how to use it, so your team can collaborate real time, quickly see what's going on and be able to address those issues. So even though we're just kind of showing you what looks like, oh, that's kind of nice, that's kind of nice. No, it's not kind of nice. It's going to be things that's going to be critical for any organization going forward to be super successful with what you're seeing happening in the space over the next coming two to three years. Yep. And a lot of that seems like it's only for source code, right? Dependency management. You're not uh -huh. going to have that in documentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, all of the access in the roles and the collaboration pieces behind that are not. And in documentation, people could commit secrets on accident and GitHub scans yep. for those. Two. So yep. yeah, that being said, let's take a break. Let's hit this break. Come back in 10 minutes and uh, we'll carry on. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, now moving into the afternoon, what are we going to be looking at next, Matt? After a break, ooh, repo features. Yes, we are going to jump into the different features of GitHub repositories, and um, again, follow along. We are going to create a repository that, at the end of the day, is going to be a, a little bit of "quote unquote" fun homework. So we're going to work within, and it's going to be one that we build upon for the remaining days of this boot camp, So it's really important that you do get this set up if you want to play mm -hmm. along with us. And I think this is the one, if I'm not mistaken, they really want to do this one. This is a cool one. Well, the good news is last time I checked, you want to do all of them. But yes, this one is, uh, <laughs> this one is really, really No, cool. it wasn't a suggestion that, no, no. Got but him. everybody, listen, I know where Matt's going with this one. This is a cool one to do because it'll get you on your way to having a really cool repo that you want to show off. Absolutely. Um, so if you go to github.com and you click your little profile icon or yeah, in the right corner and then click your profile, it looks like this. And this is cool, but it's kind of boring. Like there's a lot of things we can do to this that personalize this a little bit more. And we could have like a welcome page. We could have like a resume. We can have a lot of stuff show up right here. Um, but we have to use a repository to do that. And so the first thing we're going to do is actually start that repository. And then once we have that repository created, we're going to talk about all the different features of a repository and kind of demystify some of the stuff. And this goes back to a question that Brooks had asked earlier about issues and what they're for. And I will tell you my issue with issues as it pertains to discussions. Uh, and that's a very telling and foreshadowing statement. <laughs> Um, so the first thing is you can, if you're at regular, the github.com landing page, you'll see a green button here that says new. You can click that. If you're on your profile page, and again, we're not in an organization. This is just our, our namespace. Okay. You can click this repositories tab right here. And you can click new from here. Either way, you can do that. And uh, you'll be greeted with this screen 
when it chooses to load, okay? This is creating a new repository. This exists in your namespace. I recommend that you make this public. It's up to you. Um, you're only going to be able to leverage its coolness if you make it public, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the first thing you're greeted with is this. If you already have a project somewhere else and you want to put it on GitHub, follow this guide. Maybe you have a Bitbucket repository. Maybe you have a GitLab repository. Maybe you sat down and you ran a command in your terminal that was similar to git init, and you have a local repository that you need to move up to GitHub. This is your section for that. Kind of tells you how to do that. We do not have that situation, so we're going to create one from scratch. The next thing we have is a template, and we'll talk about templates as, as we get into this. But for this case, we're going to use no template. Okay. And what's cool is if I'm an organization, I can set up templates for people to use. So there's some learn code templates, there's some GitHub training templates, and there's even some templates I have in my own namespace. So maybe I have a structure that is very common for repositories. I can create a template for that so that my users, when they create them, it goes really quick. And we'll show now, you is that, that something? Is that something I set up? Because uh, Matt was just asking, and so is Patrick. They don't have any templates, so that's uh, is that something that's automatically populated, or is that? Something I think I know what that is. Okay, that's a catch. I'm on a pro account. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that it had. That's probably uh, a feature that I get for having a, a pro account. So that's something that might be worth the four bucks a month to you. I don't know, um, to put it in perspective to you or for you, I never use this. <laughs> it's, it's such a rare <laughs> feature for me to use. Um, I have used it in the past, but uh, very rarely. Really, yeah. you have a pro account and no repository template. Interesting. I don't yep. know what's giving me the ability to see this then. I might have something set in my settings that allow me to use templates uh let's see repositories um doo -doo 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 -doo. that's just showing me a bunch of stuff i'm connected to i might have something set up in my settings that's interesting mm -hmm. that you can't see it i thought that was a pretty standard thing to see so it's weird to me that uh oh so somebody has it and they're not on pro yep yep yeah, and so, I've, got the, I've got the same sort of thing because I've actually got one project. It's Pal Fawcett, and uh, Pal Fawcett is actually set up as a template. So when I hit mm -hmm. my drop down in my own personal account, boom, Pal Fawcett shows up. But that's the only so thing that I have. Here's the other thing I could think of, and it wouldn't surprise me if this is the case. And that is if you have templates available for you mm -hmm. to use, you might see this. And if there aren't any templates available to you due to organization membership or the fact that you don't have them set up, it might not even show up, right? Because at the end of the day, it's a dynamic app, right? We can just render that component. Yep. So that's what I would guess. It looks like there's something in the docs about creating a yep. template repo, which we'll get to. Matt, yep. Matt B beat me to it. Nice work, Matt. I was going to try to- Is that duck, what it duck, is? Go, yeah, duck, duck, go that one. But before I could get there, Matt B beat me to it. So yeah, if everybody will look any questions about that, Matt's got a great uh, link down there over to creating template repositories in your account. It'll explain how. Yeah, so creating the template repository is really easy. I'll show you how to do that. It's a checkbox. But I'm guessing that's why this doesn't show up for you is you just don't have any available to you. Right. I can think of some really simple React logic that would do that. Um, so we can give it a name. And like, let's go back to that fun culture stuff. You have to give your repository a name. But notice, if you can't think of one, GitHub suggests one. And you can just click on that and it'll populate it. Nice. But these are all goofy. It's just like if you're familiar with Docker, all the container names for Docker are all goofy. Um, so these are just goofy names, but you'll see they're all lowercase and they all have a dash. And this helps because they become URLs mm -hmm. and you don't see spaces in URLs. You see dashes to, to reflect those spaces. So um, what is actually going to happen is it's going to be github.com slash Matt Davis 0351 slash studious journey. Okay. Before you move too quick though, some of you are about to end up with a second repository because you already hit next or create. <laughs> You're going to name this repository the same as your username. Hey. 
and you'll see that we get something interesting that pops up. This is a special repository. And this repository creates this added piece to your GitHub profile, and it's really cool. So go ahead and create it with the same name as yours. You can give it a description if you want, <coughs> it's optional, okay? I'm not gonna do it, we're gonna override it anyway. You can make this public or private. I'm gonna make mine public. I have no fear here. We're not gonna put anything crazy. So this is what you were talking about a moment ago when you said, let's make this thing public because this is gonna be like our resume in GitHub sitting out there. I hate to use the word resume because of all the connotation. Y'all, that's not what I mean. But it's like your public facing piece of GitHub. Is that yeah. right, Matt? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and you'll see how it ties in once we build it. Now, it's for a teaching point, Earlier, Brooks, you asked me, if I have a private repository, can I make it public? Right. I think we should find out. So Ooh. I'm going to set mine as private. Don't do it. And I'm going to try to change it later. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> We're going to do it. You don't have to follow this. You can set yours as public. At the end of the day. Set y'all's to public. Mine's going to be public. Just <laughs> set y'all's we'll, to public. <laughs> we'll spill that spoiler now. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the next thing you can initialize it with some files. Okay. Since this one says, if we add a readme, it's gonna to go to our profile. Let's go ahead and add a readme. Now, and what's the extension on that readme file, good sir? It'll automatically be put in, but it's .md, which is a markdown file. Ah, markdown, here it comes again. So here's the best practice for you. Every repo should have a readme. It is the thing that shows up when we first click it right here. What gets rendered, you'll see this one for some reason doesn't like this. It says add a readme. Maybe it's in the wrong spot. Maybe I did something wrong with this repo, whatever. Um, it should render just fine. It's probably empty as a matter of fact. That's, I would bet you a dime a dozen. Yeah, it's empty. Yep, yep. Um, so let me go back to uh, a different repository that I have and I'll show you this. Some of you might know this. It could also just be new to everybody. So in here, here's a readme. That's what gets rendered right when I first land in any repository. And honestly, it's what gets rendered when I land in any folder within a repository. See, welcome to oranges, da 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 da, -da whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's coming from the readme. So always initialize a readme. This again, let's shift our documentation left just like we shifted our security left and will give us a landing page for anybody that comes to that repository, okay? The second thing, we have the option to add a git ignore. We don't need to worry about this today. Um, if you're using the terminal and you're using like git, the tool git, fun fact, git is not GitHub. They are not associated in any way, <laughs> shape or form. They're two different companies. Um, then you might wanna add a .git ignore yep. file. I'll show you one later. Okay, so don't, don't fret about that. We actually are going to set one up as we uh, do a little DevOps stuff with a small web app later. We're going to have to ignore some files. In fact, that's for those of you that are on a Mac, that is the Mac Git push of shame right there. So um, get that DS store, huh? The, the DS store, exactly. So we'll be looking at that, everybody, definitely. And for those of you who are on a Mac, you're going to want to uh, see that. Yeah, if I see a DS store in your repo, I'm probably going to do a drive-by on it and comment that you're silly and you need to add a get ignore file. Exactly. Um, Thanks the next thing is choosing a license. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Why does this matter? Well, if I'm going to make a project open source, that means I'm probably okay with contributions and other people using it and adding to it and modifying it so I can add a license to protect that property. It's that simple. Wow. Um, and, nice and there's easy. a bunch, if you choose add a license, like you pick, like it's not hard. If I want to set up an MIT license, bam, it's going to be set up. I'm not going to do this. I don't need a license on my profile. Read me. It doesn't apply to me. But let, let's, let's stop there for a second because then this again, y'all, this is one of those things we, Matt and I drive by real fast. We don't make a big deal out of. I'm going to stop though. If I were to have said to you, create an open source project and apply the MIT license to it, how many of you would have gone like, okay, yeah, whatever. Or how many of you would have gone like, um, I don't even know what that means. Right there, click, click, and it would be done. That's again, one of these really, it's almost a superpower 
of GitHub to move your project down the line faster by allowing you to left shift those sorts of things like that. Yep. And if you don't know what license to choose, click learn more. Wow. There it is. Here's all the information about the different types of licenses and you can get all sorts of helpful information. Again, like GitHub's the home for open source, right? So anything about open source is going to be at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. You can also add this later. So you don't have to decide, are we open source right now? We can decide that later. Um, we got some default branching, which we're about to talk about branches. And then you probably don't see this. This is a, a marketplace GitHub app that I have in my namespace. So every time I go to create a repository, I can select which GitHub apps I want to apply to that repository as well. Um, at the organization level, you can have these show up and say like Jira, like you can have Jira and you can force that app to be a part of every repository too, just saying. So when you're ready, hit create and we wait and the magic happens. Hey, and look at that. Look, I have a readme, it's rendered. It says, hi there, what up? It even has an emoji. Now, why does this matter? If I come back over to my profile, I get this really cool thing not showing up. And <laughs> we'll see why in a minute, I guess. Um, it should show up here. It probably takes a minute to propagate, to be honest. Uh, oh, ha. Ah, I know why mine doesn't ah, show up. Do and look you. at that. It even told us what the problem is. Isn't that nice? Exactly. Remember I made mine private? Oh, shucks. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and go to the settings. And on this general tab, if I just scroll all the way mm -hmm. down, you can see all the different stuff. Oh, let's enable discussions too while we're here. Hey, neat. Um, let's enable... Danger That's zone. Fine. Oh, change visibility. We're going to click that. We're going to say make it public. It's going to warn you what you can do. And then it's going to ask you to type the name into the box and hit change. Wasn't that easy. So now it's public and I enabled this thing called discussions. So if you don't see this tab, code issues, pull request discussions, go into your settings, scroll down until you find discussions and click that checkbox. And just as easy as you can turn it on, if you're like, uh oh, should have never done that, turn it off. Exactly. So now if we come back to my handy dandy profile, look at this. Hey, look at that. This renders. So this is really cool because you can say you don't have many of those options. Are you on a pro account question? Which options do you have? If you can tell me the options you have, I can help a little easier, I think. Yep. Um, right. So this is really cool. Maybe I, I've seen a lot of cool ideas with this. I've seen guest books to where mm -hmm. you come to somebody's profile and they have a button in their readme that says, click this to sign the guest book. And it adds your name to a list of all the people that have visited their profile. I've seen people put their resumes up here. I've seen people put their top five projects up here. And I have a cool task to show you a little bit of automation for hours, but I encourage you to come up with something and be creative. If you do a little bit of Google foo, um, here, I'll go back to mine in just a second and you'll be able to see the tabs. If you do a little bit of Google foo about GitHub profile readmes, you're gonna see a lot of really awesome ideas that you can set up and, and have as a GitHub profile readme. <coughs> Steal them. Yeah, this is bad though. Like we don't want this. So we're gonna end up changing ours as we go yep. over these features. Yep. So this is now changed and says, if you want to edit it, you can edit it. So these are the tags I have. Oh, you mean in the settings, you don't have those. Yeah. You should, you got to be under the general tab. I yeah. almost guarantee you have the danger zone because that's you where should. the leading a repository is. Yeah, Patrick, you should have that danger zone at the very bottom because you've got to have that delete repo. Take another look and take another peek. Let's yeah, uh, under all circumstances, you have the delete repo problem yep so it's under the general tab uh, yep he found it cool patrick cool. thanks for settings. looking man cool all right so let's start and we're just going to go top to bottom left to right okay we're going to talk about all the features that exist here at a very high level 
And then tomorrow and the following day, we're going to get hands on dirty with those features. Okay. So mm, make sure that good stuff. you ask the questions about them today so that we can just drive and, and do and interact with them tomorrow and the next day. Okay. Uh, the goldfish memory feature. Yeah, it is a good <laughs> memory feature. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. Cause I was like, wait, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, but you so can old. never be upset because you never remember why you're upset. So it works out. <laughs> so first things first, this, this left-hand thing, the first part of this, uh, locator, I guess is your namespace. So is it an org or is it a personal account? And the second one is the name of the repo, right? This is all appended to the end of github.com. If you look at your URL up here, it's github.com slash namespace slash repository name, mm -hmm. right? This is why we put dashes and not spaces, quite simply, okay? If your repo name has uppercase letters, it just gets squashed into lowercase letters anyway. So it's not a problem, at least in the URL, I'm pretty positive. Okay, second to that, is we have this, this little pill that tells us the visibility. If you ever try to go to a repository and you get a 404 error, like if Brooks sent me a link that I didn't have access to because it was private, it's gonna 404, immediately double check that you're a collaborator or that you have read access at a minimum to that repository. You probably didn't 404 because there was an error, you most likely 404 because you're unauthorized. We get this pin, button this is new never seen this before my best guess is that it pins this to your popular repositories tab um, you could pin this if you want you don't need to because this automatically shows up watching and unwatching this is really cool if i go to let's say i'm really interested in pandas i'm going to search all of github and i'm going to go to the pandas dev not pandas, the animal, but no, nope, no nope. <laughs> Python pandas, the other animal. Yep. And I want to know when they do stuff. I want to get notified when pull requests go in or whatever. I can click this button and I can watch and I can set what type of alerts I'm going to get. But this is going to tell me like how I'm going to get alerted when repository actions happen here. That is a huge deal, y'all. That is the sort of stuff that somebody in your organization pops up one day and says, hey, we need to take a look uh, at something because it looks like they just updated the pandas code. And everybody's looking around like, how did they know about this? It's just that simple. They're not that smart. They don't work harder than you. No, 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 no. They've just got features like this that they're taking advantage of. So in a project where you're watching, you know, and, it, and again, we're talking about code here, but this could be documentation. Say so it could be the... Um, you know, so again, some civic project where you're setting up the requirements and rules for how the community is going to contribute to something. Um, if there's ever a change, let me know. For example, you know, we're talking about, you know, like local government setting up rules and regulations for a city or something like that. If they put those rules and regulations instead of in some, pardon me, some stupid Word document or on some stupid website, if they did it in places like GitHub where there's collaboration, you could go in there, do a watch, and if there was ever a change, you would know about it. So I'm hoping that don't get too close to the action here and go, well, this is just a thing for developers or this is just a thing for code. It applies to anything. And that really can empower an organization to keep a tab on what's going on in terms of documentation, code, and so forth and so on. Exactly. Uh, that's a great point. Um, another example, just to take it away from code, is let's say you have an organization, MyCorp, and it has uh, a hiring manager team you're a part of that team and you mm. have a repository that says job postings and you need to know when a new job is created or a new role is created. You can watch that repo and you will get an email alert that a new job posting has been added. You need to go collaborate on that to make sure you're not getting an AWS candidate with 200 years of experience. Exactly. And oh, by the way, speaking of that, I'm not going to name the company. But there's a company that I know something about that has the worst hiring practices that I've ever seen. It's not the one I'm at right now. They do it slick, but it's some other company. And their hiring process is a hot mess. And one of the problems is, is the amount of documentation that's generated for any candidate whatsoever. When you hear things like that, or you're experiencing things like that, y'all, think of things like this, like saying, hey, why aren't we creating repos for this stuff? So that everybody just dumps their documents in. 
We all watch it. When there's a change, we can see what happens. This is an enabling tool in that aspect. And that's one of the powers. I know, I know we're sitting on watch for a second, but we've got to make a big deal out of it. So you don't miss the opportunity of what this tool can do for you and your organization. So opposite to that, maybe things are too noisy. If I click unwatch, I will, I can say, Hey, never notify me. And I will never get a notification on this repository. Okay. Or I can say only notify me if I get an app mention. Now, the extra cool thing about that is, oh, that didn't, why didn't you watch? Watch. Okay. Whatever. The other cool thing about this is this button can trigger automation. Okay. Mm. Let's think from a non-code point of view. What if I had this repository and Brooks lands in my namespace and he's like, man, Matt, this project's really cool. And I'm like, I know Brooks, I made it. And he's like, I want to keep track of it. And I want to, you know, make sure I see all the updates. So he clicks watch. Well, I could manually find out who all of my watchers are and send them a thank you email, but I think that I'm not paid to do that and I have better things to do. What I could do is when he clicks watch, I could tie automation into this that automatically mentions Brooks in a comment and says, hey, Brooks, thanks for watching the repo. Really appreciate your interest in the project. If you ever want to contribute, consider checking out this documentation on how to contribute to the project. By hey. the way, contributions are welcome. Hey. And I could automate yeah. that. Yep. So that has nothing to do with code. It has everything to do with community management and shifting quality to the left again, because quality isn't just product quality, it's experience quality. So you will you may have noticed, mine says pin, but Panda says sponsor. If for some reason you do have an open source project, you can set up a sponsorship program to where people can like tip you for using your project. That's what that is. So like if you used Pandas a lot and you're like, man, I really wanna pay the maintainers like give them a tip for like maintaining this giant library. You can do that here, mm -hmm. um, which means if you have the idea in your head for a giant open source project, but you don't want to waste time on it because you're not going to make any money, you can also set that up to where people can tip you. Just saying. Um, the next thing, it's grayed out right here because forking is not enabled and this repository is locked. Um, it's most likely because it's this very special mm -hmm repository. If I go to um, a different repo in my namespace, uh, like glowing Octo umbrella, you can see the fork button exists. Um, if you click fork, it will create a copy of this repo in your namespace, for example. Now we'll dive deeper into forking later, okay? Tomorrow as we go to do things. But just understand that that is a button that says, hey, I would like a copy of this repository, but I don't have access to it, right? I'm not added as a collaborator. I'll show you an example of that. It'll probably take a little bit of time. But if I were, I, I am not a part of Pandas. I do not have access to the Pandas repository. But if I want a copy of Pandas, I can click fork and I can click on this and it is going to copy this entire open source library or repository into my namespace. So now I can work on my own pandas project. Maybe I wanna extend pandas, okay? Maybe I wanna contribute back to pandas. This would be a required step for me to, to send a change to pandas because I need to be able to have right access and pandas is not gonna give me right access to their organization, but I always have right access to my namespace, okay? And we'll, we'll dive deeper in the forks later tomorrow because cloning is scary and forks are scary and they're very similar. <laughs> and I'll tell you everybody a great reason why forking can save today too. Something funny that happened just recently. So, the next thing is this star count. It's just like watchers, only it's like, I'm not paying attention to alerts. I'm just, I think your project is cool. Again, that fires an event that we can listen to that we can tie some automation into and say, hey, like, that's really cool. Thank you. 
then we get into this first tab, which is the code tab. This is where you see what's in the repository. And we keep saying repository, but let me demystify what a repository is. It's a folder. It's a very fancy folder. So we all have folders. We got our family photos in there. We got our monthly budget in there. You have all the jokes that we tell about Brooks on the back end in there, hey. whatever it might be. That top level folder, like my documents folder, that's this repository name. Like that's just the top level folder. So a repository is just a fancy folder that remembers some history. And if you think about it like that, you're going to be just fine. So the code tab shows us that folder. We can add folders to this. We, we see that over in Pandas. Look, here's a folder. Here's a folder. Here's a file. It's no different than a big, giant, funny folder. But when we're on the code tab, we immediately see the readme for whatever folder that we're in. And in this case, we're in the root folder. If we were to go into, uh, I don't know, scripts for pandas, now we're in the scripts folder and they do not have a readme, so nothing is rendered. Okay, so we can navigate this just like you're nav navigating through a file explorer, which I think I have one here, right? It's no different, ah, baby, come back. It's no different than navigating through this. Wow. <laughs> okay, so I can click into AWS and I can see that stuff there. Same thing. As a matter of fact, if I were to click into my home folder and find my INE folder, this just happens to be the repository that I've created for this bootcamp. So we could actually go take a look at that and you would see the repository maps perfectly with what I see in my file explorer. We're not gonna go through that. I think you guys get that. You're all smart and uh, have computer prowess, okay? So the code tab just shows us a file explorer. It also renders files, watch, look. If I come over here and say, let me click oh, on- this is so cool. Run vulture.py, so cool. check it out. Here's the code. Syntax highlighting everything. This is what's in that file. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's Markdown, same thing. Same thing. Markdown rendered by default in the README. Oh, it's a fancy README status badges. We'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Right. I can even click into that README and now I can see that that file standalone on its own. Let's find a different file. Uh, here's a YAML file. Um, where's the text file? Here we go. Here's a text file. And it shows us what's in that text file. So this code tab is helpful for very quickly without downloading these to a <coughs> local machine, seeing what is in each of these files. Okay. This is also where we edit stuff. There's a little pencil right here in the right hand corner of the file. If I click on that, I get an editor right here. And this is all commented out because it's Markdown and we're going to get to this in a minute. So don't, don't jump ahead unless you're real comfortable with repository features, but we'll, we'll jump back into this and we'll edit it in a minute. So if I hit cancel, we kind of edit that out. Okay. I can go back to the code tab and it's here. If I ever need to know where I am, I can look right here and I get the file path. So this is the, the root folder, but this is the file path of the, the, thing that I'm looking at. So if I click pandas and I come into CI and I come into depths and then I come into this, you'll see I get a trail of breadcrumbs telling me where I'm at in the repo. If you don't see that, it's because you're in the root. Pro tip. All right. The next thing, oh, also the code tab is where you manage branches. We'll get into branches. Uh, it's where you can add more files. It's where you can go to a specific file. It's where you figure out how to clone a repository. Um, that's all on the code tab. This is like the main tab that you're gonna land on to do stuff. The next tab is the most controversial tab in tab history, so much so that they created a brand new feature about it. It's the issues tab. Now, Issues sounds like a bad thing, right? If we come to look at pandas, look at how many issues pandas had. What? 3.3 thousand. Is pandas really that broken? There's like three Python developers right now that are like, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> the truth of the matter is it's probably not. 
when you're going to do something on GitHub, traditionally, this is changing, okay? But traditionally, it starts with an issue. The work starts with an issue. I'll say it again. Everything starts with an issue. Need to create a new job role? Open an issue. Mm -hmm. Have an idea? Open an issue. Need to do a bug fix? Open an issue. Think this boot camp's great? Open an issue. This Open is an the issue. one. This is the one, y'all. That when I was talking to Matt about it the first time, I had one of my first oh moments because it occurred to me that this really shows off something about GitHub that it's about doing work. Yes. That's the point. It's about doing work. It's like what do we do to keep up with what we're doing? Issues. Throw an issue up in there. It's a great way. Not only for that, but again, thinking about managers and stuff like that, trying to figure out what's going on. Go look at issues. You can see what we're trying to tackle right now. So this is cool. You click the issues tab. We're on pandas for the record. You can search any, any repository. We're going to jump into this. We're going to create some issues and stuff later. So again, theory today, prac app later. We can scroll down this and we can see, hey, here's a bug. Here's an enhancement. These are all tagged. Boom, project manager. Hey, what, what's in the pipeline? What's in the backlog? Click on the issues tab. Do yourself a favor. Oh, look, it's nicely organized. Here's a needs triage. Here's an extension thing. So here's docs. Hey, missing links in the docs. Um, I don't know that they have ideas in there, right? It's up to you to decide what issues are used for. But the idea is issues are used for everything. Um, we might be able to sort to see if they have like an idea label. I uh, thought they did. Yeah, ideas. Yep, they've got an ideas. So if we look at ideas, here you go, disk. What do we think that might mean? Mm. Discussion, right? Yep. This is not a broken thing. This is not a feature. This is not a change. This is a conversation, right? And if we look into it, this is what's great. Oh my God. Project manager comes by, says, hey, where are we at? We'll go check the issue because we've updated the issue and you can see all the conversations that we are having. Look, JB opened the issue. He said, hey, this is what the issue is about. Topper commented on the issue. JB commented. This person commented. All of these are comment. They've even mixed in some changes and linked to other things that all pertain to this work. Boom from a project management, from a work in progress, from a, I need to know what's going on point of view. Mm -hmm. It's all in front of my face. I look, he added a tag. He referenced it somewhere. If I click on this, bam, this is where it was mentioned. So I can go look at where all the cross links to this discussion was going through. And if you think issues are a bad thing, this is Issue number 39,133 for pandas. So simmer down, create issues. Guess how much they cost? Hmm. They're free for the first thousand. Guess how much the remaining ones cost? Hmm. They're free how too. Much? There's no oh. limit. Just create issues. They're free. <laughs> They're super duper free. Okay. So What's great about these two is you can set up issue templates. Let's come over to pandas. Notice how this one says discussion. This one says bug. This one says enhancement. They probably follow a structure. So if I, since it's a public repo, found an issue, right? So if some other team realized 20 years of AWS experience isn't acceptable, or if a student took your course and noticed something wrong they wanted to contribute a fix they could say hey new issue mm -hmm. and look at this these are templates these are templates and i can just create a blank issue too if these don't fit my needs if i click this i say get started it opens this issue and it gives me this little form to fill out and it's handy dandy all issues are going to look the same so if we go look at a bug all bug issues are going to have this structure to them. Real quick, I'm by the way, guess what they're written in? Um, markdown? Markdown. And that's why we get cool things like checkboxes, syntax highlighting for code, images, expanded details. You name it, it's all <laughs> here. By the way, for any of y'all who, who um, have experience with Jupyter Notebooks, when you put a Jupyter Notebook 
with the proper extension into GitHub, it executes that Jupyter notebook. I got, yep, I got you. Give show me, me show me, show me, show me. Y'all, this is a big deal. If you're trying to get a job as a data analyst or something like that, and you've put together some really slick things with pandas like we've just been showing you, you put that into a Jupyter notebook, you put that into your GitHub repo when you're at the interview or when you're showing your what you can do and stuff like that, and they run that particular notebook, it'll actually execute the code inside there, your Python, and put those um uh and actually should like if there's gonna be a graph generated something like that it'll put it on the page for you it is very slick in that regard so i see the question in chat from from benjamin I'll yeah i'm gonna get out of the way while you answer this one just in case uh, you i'll answer up. that i'll answer that in a second so <laughs> shout out to to my my wife who built this by the way stunning data scientist um threw together this right so look this is the readme it's funny and there's links and here's what Brooks is talking about. This is a see Jupyter the execution notebook. happen. Did you just did everybody see that? This Very is a Jupyter slow. notebook that is just the the PNYB or whatever the file extension, yep. the IPYNB. Mm -hmm. That file is committed. The notebook renders. So it's really cool. I'm sure somewhere in here there's graphs and other fun stuff. Okay. The data but, that y'all are seeing, that is not stuff that she typed in there. That is the execution from right. the code that she's like, for example, uh, we can see line uh, 13 right there where she does the value counts. GitHub will execute that for you and then put the result right there up underneath yep. it. It'll actually execute the block. So if you need to show off capabilities for data, or for example, even better, if you're just going to a meeting and you want to show off a proof of concept because you're in some data-driven uh, organization where all the decisions are made on data and you want to show that off, this becomes a really slick way of showing this off outside of going, oh, let's go put together a PowerPoint presentation. And it's not limited to pandas. It's Jupyter Notebooks. So whatever you can do with Jupyter Notebooks. That's true. Thank you. I said that wrong. Thank it you. renders. Yeah. So um, yeah, shameless plug on that. Super cool. Beware though. Sometimes that gets a little wonky. Sometimes it doesn't. So double, just double check it. It's strange. It's cool, but it's strange. So the question is, do we even need Jira having GitHub issues? You are really hoping that I divide the room. I'm getting I, under the desk. Bye, everybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer this. this. Personal opinion? No, you don't. Right. Right? You, you <laughs> absolutely don't. Now, does that mean that you go into your organization using Jira? You sit at the, the whoever made that decision's desk and you're like, you're silly. We're switching to GitHub issues. They're probably going to be like, you're crazy. No, you're not. Yeah. What you can do is integrate Jira with GitHub issues, right? So this is how you do the whole DevOps grassroots movement stuff. You integrate Jira with GitHub. Then when you create issues on GitHub, it automatically populates Jira. And then as you slowly get people accustomed to using GitHub issues, you slowly phase out Jira, right? That's the, that's the actual answer of how, how you would go about that if you decide to make that shift. Now, here's the thing no problem with using Jira and GitHub, right? There could be plenty of tickets and stuff that you track in Jira that aren't suitable for things like GitHub. For example, if you are making video content and you're tracking that work in progress in Jira, GitHub is not the place for video content. It doesn't handle those type of files very well. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily want to do that now you could manage that whole project in GitHub and never upload a file because you can just add a link to a readme file that points to the video, whatever. Right. You can do that. You have to understand that you are asking an entire organization to learn a brand new tool just because you think it's cool. And you're not wrong. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. It's also really useful. It's also a productivity increase because it's not as bloated as Jira is. However, that is a giant ask. So it's better to just integrate the two. And then as you work on new projects, your new projects use strictly GitHub, your old existing projects can kind of be a hybrid kind of thing. And you can slowly phase that out. There's a bunch of strategies <clears> to go about it. The short answer is no, you don't, you don't need them at all. Right. The long answer is find a way to make them work together. What you're going to find, Benjamin, is a lot of organizations spend a lot of time, money, and effort learning how to use Jira 
uh, trying to get it to work the way they want, yeah. bending their own, bending their own processes to fit Jira. And so then when you go forward and you say, Hey, there's this other thing that's really easy. There's going to be, you know, it's, it's almost like, okay, so we wasted time and effort. So you've got to be really kind of sensitive to it and careful with it. That's why Matt's suggestion about go grassroots, show the interconnect, show how we can use GitHub. We can still have it send stuff to Jira. We can get that one-to-one -one sort of mapping between what's happening here and what's happening there. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can read on it to, that makes it not that big a deal. So yeah, but careful with it, man. Don't just run in there and say, this is what, because they'll, oh, they'll be so angry. Ease into it. To continue down this side rabbit hole, just to break this up a little bit. If you search for the GitHub marketplace, <coughs> you'll find a link, it's github.com slash marketplace, okay? And you could come in here and you could search for Jira. You will find, if you look carefully, you'll see that this is verified and it's it's from Atlassian themselves, which, okay, probably pretty safe. Mm -hmm. um, this is about integration with Jira and GitHub and you can set up a plan and add this. Now guess how much this costs? <gasps> Wow. What's the catch? Okay. Wow. The catch is Atlassian might set a price to use this. They might say, hey, in order to use that integration, we're going to charge you. GitHub doesn't. All of these GitHub apps are regulated by their developer, right? So if we looked at this, this is another one. It's from a verified publisher. They meet some requirements that GitHub sets. It has some sort of integration. They have a free trial. Oh, that's not the same as free, is it? But that's not GitHub that decided that. That's mm -hmm. that's this organization, okay? So GitHub offers you these integrations for the low, low cost of absolutely free. But the maintainer might say, not so much, man, pay me, okay? So that's the, the situation that we end up in. So to do that integration, come grab the Jira software plus GitHub, set up a plan, go ahead, take a look at this, and you can tie those things together lickety split it's probably not difficult to tie them in at all okay so um that's how you can do that so issues i think we get what they are they're everything just talk have a conversation mm -hmm. hey brooks have an idea oh don't tell me in slack open an issue an issue exactly right you know why because this let's go back to Let's go back to pandas, right? This is why. 3.3 thousand issues. Those are only the open ones, my friends. 18,000 closed issues. Remember that time, Brooks, six months ago where we, we had that discussion, we fixed that thing. I think it's coming up again. Do you remember how we fixed it? I have no clue, man. No uh, let's just go clue. try to find that in an old issue that, oh, look, right here. Yep. Oh, and I have the issue and I have our entire discussion around it. And I can very easily replicate that fix because I have history of our discussions. Mm -hmm. Hey, Brooks, remember that time that our manager said that we didn't do something, even though we were actually doing something. And now he's decided to give me all of your bonus. Yeah. Uh, I think I can find the issue that supports otherwise. Like, let's go do that together. Right. Let's go find it. Exactly. So, History is key. That is, it's, that's the fancy behind the folder, right? It's just a folder with fancy. Mm -hmm. So creating issues is easy. Click the new issue button, give it a title, some issue, give it a body, some markdown, hit submit. What up? New issue. Check it out. If I come back to issues, I have an open issue. If I'm watching, I got an alert. If I click into the issue, uh-oh, timeout, slow down. What up? Look at who created the issue. I can see who created it. I can see how old it is. I don't even have to click in. Now I click into it though, because I'm fancy. I'm fancy and I want to see what's in it. Bam, here we go. Issue body, who is the owner of it, right? Or the owner of the repo. It was created by the owner. But what if I want help? What if I want to assign this to somebody, right? Oh, well, Jira gives us the ability to say a task belongs to somebody. Well, so does GitHub. I'm going to assign this to myself. Look at that. I'm going to add a label. Oh, it's a bug. Cool. I'm going to, 
Oh, we're not going to add it to a project board yet. Nice try, suckers. <laughs> Same with milestones. We're not going to add it there yet. Pull requests. We're not going to add it there yet. I can subscribe or unsubscribe for notifications. I can pin this issue to the top of the issues tab. I can manage its visibility. Okay. And look, I can also see the history of the behavior I took to this issue. And now if we go look at it in the issues tab, who's it assigned to? Me. Oh, and it's a bug. I don't even have to click into this if I'm managing a project. That's powerful. And real quick, just if you could point something out to me, Matt, because this has always kind of got my attention. I noticed there's a number one down there, ah. hash, hash one. What does that mean? I mean, obviously it's there for a reason. It is just telling you a way, a serialization of the issue. So this is the first time an issue was ever created. So this is issue number one. Watch what happens. Let's create a new one. Issue two. Ooh, lie. Issue two. <laughs> Right? I'm going to submit a new issue and I'm going to come back to issues and you'll see it's number two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's just serialization to track things. And this is helpful because if I want to comment on an issue or maybe I made a mistake, so I'm going to edit an issue and I'm going to say C and I'm going to say number two. Look at hey, that. Hey, did everybody see that? Did Instant everybody see that it looked the second inside issue. there? It looked right inside and said, this relates to that. If I just type That's number cool. one, it typically shows up. If it doesn't show up, that doesn't mean you can't do it. If I hit preview, it still takes me to the first yeah, issue. It, it self-references in a weird way, but as long as like another issue, yeah, you can pop them yep. in there. And that is so, a cool way to reference. Okay, so that's enough on the dead horse on issues. They're for everything, <laughs> everything. So much so that GitHub created, we're gonna skip pull requests for a second, GitHub created this discussions thing. And you'll see Pandas does not have discussions enabled. I enabled it on this repository. This is a new feature or newer feature so that issues can be issues and discussions can live somewhere else. So if you choose to manage it that way you can, you can come in here, grab any issue that already exists and say convert to a discussion general maybe ideas i understand convert this issue now here's the thing it closed it because it moved it to discussions so now when i open a new issue what number should it be mm, let's see well, there's only issue number one up there right so this is obviously going to be issue number two wrong it's issue number four hey because two was the original issue three is the discussion see how it's referenced right here so what that tells me is all discussions are issues <laughs> they're just in a new tab okay but it but breaks just, that but it breaks that idea apart right so that as they're working inside github an issue is an issue like this is a thing going on if you want to talk about it that's something else. And we can reference back and forth using those numbers. And you'll notice I, I have participants instead of assignees. I can still add labels. I can't put it on project boards or anything like that, right? So the issue has much more flexibility and visibility than a discussion does. Which one should you use? Figure it out, whichever one you like. I will probably never use discussions until discussions matures more and add some more features to it only because I'm stubborn. <laughs> That's the answer. Okay. So you're not wrong by keeping your discussions and issues. I like them in issues because then they can be managed a little differently. So let's jump back to pull requests. Pull requests are issues. Weird. Every pull request is an issue. Not all issues are pull requests. Pull requests say, hey, I made a change and I would like you to move that change into the code base. Can you do that? And we can see what changed. We'll dive into those a little later, but they're very similar to the, the issues tab. You create a new pull request. They, they're so similar to issues that it's like they are issues. Yep. They're issues with a change attached to them. I enabled discussions by clicking on the settings tab under general. And again, yep. I'm on a pro account, so I don't know if you'll see it, 
Uh, and I scrolled down to features and somewhere in here was the discussions Discussion. box. And this is how much I don't believe in discussion. <laughs> cool. So we're just going to turn those off. You don't have to turn them off. I think they're good. I think they're, they just have a long way to go until they're at a maturity level that I'm comfortable with using them. Okay. So if I want to make a change, it's a pull request. If I want to talk about something, it's an issue. So the way this works is work starts with an issue. It then gets a branch, which we'll get into branching tomorrow. That branch gets a pull request and that's the flow of work. The pull request is the work. Okay. Very cool. So before we go to break here, um, does anybody have any last, any other questions floating around about issues, pull requests, discussions? It's quite a subject. And as Matt, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited that y'all get to hear this from Matt. You're probably not going to hear somebody say what he just said about issues and discussions. You're just not going to hear that. You're going to hear more. I don't want to say toe the GitHub line, but they're going to follow more along with whatever Git. If they're at GitHub, they're going to say what GitHub says. If they're working for GitHub as a contractor, they're going to say that. You're tending to hear a little bit more of the inside stuff here. So as you're hearing this, don't be surprised at looking at other people who may be talking about this material who don't quite say it in the same way. Again, yeah. this is the inside uh, information about it. And it uh, doesn't look like we have any questions right now on that. So can we take another brief, our last break of the day? Yep. We'll, do, uh, we'll do 10 minutes. That's fine. And then we'll come back. And what are we going to talk about when we come back? We got one more feature to cover. And then we're going to jump into Markdown. And then you're going to go and you're going to get your homework project that we'll work on tomorrow. Okay, everybody, welcome back. So what we're going to be doing now for the, uh, we've got mm, a little more than 30 minutes. Um, I think we're going to talk about projects and then mark down and then a little bit of the readme stuff. Is that right, Matt? That's the goal. We'll see okay. what we can get. If we don't get all the way through that, that's okay. We can kick the tomorrow off um, with something. So okay, uh, cool. the last immediate feature that we're going to cover, the project managers are going to rejoice on this, is this projects tab. Okay. Hey. This is super duper cool. It is a built-in project board or Kanban that you might have in other tools. So I can quickly come in here and say, hey, I want to create a new project board. I'm going to call this the bootcamp project. What did we learn about names? Don't do it. In there. there you go. I can use a template. Now, I don't have to set these templates up. And we're going to get into a, a better template later. So we're not going to use one now. But some of these templates have built-in automation, right? Which is really, really cool about them. Um, but the automation can be a little bit fickle at times. So I'm going to go without it for now. And I'm just going to hit create project. And what's really cool is now I can say, I'm going to add a column. It's going to be our backlog, right? I'm going to create that. I can add another one and say in progress, whatever it might be. I'm going to create a third one. I'm just going to call it done. Okay. And what's cool about this is now, if I need immediate visibility on what's being worked on as a project manager or project contributor, I can click into the project and I see this. The first thing I can do is I can add a card by just clicking this little plus symbol right here, which also takes markdown, which we'll get to in a second. I can say, hi, Brooks, check me out. And I hit add. And there we go. Now I have this card that I can now move around by just clicking and dragging into each of these sections. So this card can outline work. It can outline ideas. We can have as many of these columns as we want to this project board. Adding another one is easy. So I'm going to add one called ready for review. And I don't want that to be after done. So I can drag that to reorder that too. Okay. And this is great, but it gets even better because now if I come back to my issues, which is the suggested way to do this, right? Adding those cards are okay, but you get some really cool things if you add issues instead. So if I go over into the issue, I can now associate it with a project. That's going to add it to a project. If I build in some automation, I can add it to 
the column in the project. So I'm going to add this to the backlog, all right within the issue. So now if I come back to the project, I click into it, you'll see the difference immediately. The card is very bleak and drab. The issue is a card, but it shows me who it's assigned to. It shows me the labels that are applied to it. If I click it, it pops open the issue over here and I can read about it and whatever I might need to look at. And if I want more info, I can click this link and it opens the issue in a new tab. The card doesn't do that for me. The only thing I can do with the card is move it around. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can still move this around. Right. And you'll see this updates in the issue right now. It's, it's updated to in progress. And now it's updated to ready for review. And it just goes about that. So we can track all the stuff we might want to on the project board using issues. Now, guess what? If pull requests are issues, we can also add pull requests. So we can add pull requests to the board so we can see the actual work. And remember, pull request is the actual change. It's the real work. It's not the talk. We can see where that real work is. We can see who did it. And we can see it, like what our backlog looks like. And all of this can be automated by default by just adding some automation to stuff. If I click into this, these three little dots, I can say, hey, manage the automation. And I can set a preset. Uh, on where it goes and how it works. And I can update that. I can manage that with actions too, if I wanted to. But this makes it really simple. All work starts at an issue. Even if it's an idea, it gets added to the project board, to the backlog column. And you can have as many project boards as you like for the low, low cost of, there's still no catch. <laughs> have your project boards, they're free. You can add it here. You can assign it, like maybe your workflow is once it's in progress, we then assign somebody to it and so on and so forth. And you can click in to see everything. What you don't get though, is like the weird, like burn down rates and other stuff that like more robust project management tools might give you. It's a little harder to predict time. You can, you can set up things called milestones, but they're a lesser used feature. Um, and then somebody had asked about the insights tab. This just kind of gives you a bunch of stats about the repo. You can see pull requests, what issues were closed, how many active issues you might have, who's contributing, um, what the community looks like. So this is just a lot of like stats about the repo and just to quickly cover that insights tab. So those are the big major features that just give us, boom, instant, immediate feedback on what's going on, right? To include, if you're really fancy with your readme and some people get really fancy like build status and version badges and stuff of what's going on this doesn't just apply to code maybe this is version one of a job posting and you just put hey this is version one of the job posting whatever it might be okay those are the main features that are going to exist we're going to talk about what it means to clone and fork as we talk about what a git flow looks like Okay, but this is just the main features that exist in the README. We are going to take a small diversion, right? And I said we're not going to do code, and it's not really code, but it's going to help us write documentation. We're going to take a small diversion. I'm posting a link in the chat right now for that is not it. I just accidentally copied all kinds of crazy stuff <laughs> off of that pandas. <laughs> oh, I almost pasted you all of their badges. Mm -hmm. So this is a cheat sheet for how to write Markdown. And you don't have to do this in GitHub, but don't close this repo. I'm going to show you my favorite online markdown editor. Oh, it's called hackmd.io. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite place to be. Um, you can sign in with GitHub if you want, which is what I'm going to do. I, I have this all associated with my um, GitHub account. I'm going to click this green new note button. And this is going to launch me into this really cool real-time editor. Now, there is a, get, a catch, a small catch to this. GitHub has its own Markdown language. It's based on the, the bigger Markdown standard. So most things work. HackMD has its own Markdown language. So not everything I do in HackMD will translate to GitHub. Everything I'm going to show you and everything that you have in that guide that I linked you will translate. I'm not going to show you the fancy... HackMD stuff, so you don't have to worry about it there. 
but you'll see this can link right to repositories. I can push and pull. I could use this as my editor. We're not going to tie in that integration either. But Markdown kind of works like this. The Octothorpe, favorite word, word of the day, Ugh. right? Also known as your hashtag or your pound sign, depending on how old and hip you are, is going to be a heading. And if I just type it here, it starts suggesting, hey, do I want an H1, an H2, a 3, 4, 5, right? Or tags. And I can just put that in. And now I can start typing. Welcome boot camp. Awesome. If I want to make a list, or I can say, hey, let's, let's skip the list. Some just paragraph text. Hey, how are you all finding the boot camp? Great. I can add checkboxes with simple little dashes. And this is the power of, of Markdown. It's good. It's bad. Uh, Brooks looks funny. Okay. What? Which one? Oh, but we don't need your input on that one. We already know. Okay. <laughs> so we can do these simple things. What if I want to quickly build a table? Name, age, um, hair color. Right. I can come down here. Some of you have written Markdown before. If you haven't, I just changed word processing for you completely. Uh, so buddy, cool. um, 67, hair color, bald. Okay, cool. I'm very quickly building a table. Um, Angel. Uh, and why he's building that table. Let me point out something to everybody. This is a sort of low level thing that allows you to make quick comparisons between different versions of a file. Uh, yeah, we'll, large... dive, we'll dive into diffs tomorrow though. Oh yeah, but I'm just, I'm setting you up here because you can see on the left, everything is just text. It's just there's text. No, there's no funky stuff that we see inside Word, no funky stuff that we see inside a Google document that is their little control characters to make things work. It's just text. And because so many organizations are embracing Markdown, as you can see right there, it renders out very nicely. Yeah, Inside. that's a really good point. On, on like yeah. a Google Doc, it would be really impossible for me to tell if you added a row to this table or added a column to this table. When we get into the power of what's called a diff tomorrow, we could very easily see what changed about this table because it is just text. So you can do all sorts of stuff. We could do, um, here is some code. I could say, I don't know, pseudo mat is awesome. Okay. And now this is like raw text. So I could actually copy and paste this into a terminal and I wouldn't have to worry about like ASCII encoding or new line endings mm -hmm. that could screw up that. Um, I could even say um, here is some like informational text, <coughs> right? And it highlights it a little funny. It's a quote or I could do block quotes. So I could say, hey, like I want... Um, JSON actually will do Python. I can, I can specify a language. Like maybe I need to write code, even though this isn't about code, maybe I need to write code and I can have this code block that has syntax highlighting. And notice that everybody, it's actually rendering it exactly like, say, if you were inside something like visual studio code, uh, it gives you that look and it's just, and look, and look all it was was three ticks. To start yep. it, three ticks to end it, specify the language, and you've got a really, really cool output. I can add subheadings. I can also say, hey, like I want this to be bold. So I can bold an individual word. I can mm -hmm. italicize an individual word. Really funny, right? So like I'm not, it's, it is super sweet, right? Thank you. That, that's <laughs> so, ah. Uh, this is why I can't use word processors. You know how fast it was to do all of this? I would have to click all that silly UI to actually in, like format a mm -hmm. file like this. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. And look, I can go, oh, I want just a break in the page. Yeah, it's I can and do so much fancy stuff to include um, links really quick, right? I could say- Yeah, like, do a reference link, yeah. Matt's GitHub, right? And then- https colon slash slash github.com slash matt davis 0351 and now if i gave this to somebody they could just click that link in the markdown and go to my github it's that simple yep and the thing about it is also other than long the is a great hair color yeah brian got us on that one he sure did 
<laughs> just two other things real quick I want to point out. I think I can remember my second point. I'm going to stall on the first one until I remember. For those of you who are not familiar with there's an there's an application called Pandoc, P-A-N-D-O-C. When you start out with Markdown, you can easily take this thing into other formats. Like if you needed to take this and shoot it into a Word file because somebody's just got to have a .docx, you start with this, you run it through Pandoc, Pandoc can present that for you. Not only that, and to Matt's point about uh, word processors and stuff like that, there's a lot of other extensions that we can take advantage of with Markdown. For example, being able to create slide presentations with something like this, with, with a system like Mermaid that uh, Matt just showed me recently, we can create really cool slide presentations and they're text-based. I challenge you to put together a presentation in PowerPoint where you can quickly go through and find changes that somebody would have made. When it's rendered in simple text like this and you need to take it through a very contrived process where say somebody creates it, an editor double checks it, it has to go through legal to make sure the company can is okay with it going out. It has to go through a final process of upper level management saying it's cool. Doing that on changes is next to impossible. I've been there, done that. It's not a pretty thing. This makes it easy. So this oh, what is, is something, this? This is something we're going to talk about in, a, in the following days, but this is a web hosted slide presentation and it's ugly and it's supposed to be, it was just a simple proof of concept. Um, this was designed and built using Pandoc coupled with GitHub Actions and every one of these slides you see is actually just a markdown file. So consider I need to collaborate on a presentation. Have you ever needed to know what changed in a PowerPoint presentation? Ugh. Well, with something like this, all of these slides, let me get back to it. Of course, it's gonna be fickle to get mm -hmm. back to it. Um, let me head back. The I'm only gonna, downfall I'm, is how this is deployed is a little bit frustrating. Yeah, yeah. But I'll make, I'm, I'll, 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 I will mitigate that by pointing out that, hey, have you ever tried to collaborate on a PowerPoint file? Ain't gonna yeah. happen ain't gonna happen it's a nightmare it's impossible right so if i come back into that repository i know it's very awesome named and i look at this slides folder you'll see slide one is a markdown file welcome is a markdown file slide with notes this is simply a markdown file if i look at it here it is like these are the slides and then i oh, added easy. like yeah. speaker notes to the slide yep. with some pandoc fanciness right but all of this is built with an automated pipeline and that's what's important. Um, but nonetheless, so that's just another reason that that's in GitHub. That's not code. That's, that's Markdown. So Markdown is super flexible to Brooks's point. If you come to like Google docs, you can, uh, there's plugins that will let you write <coughs> Markdown and it'll render it over and do the formatting for you. We are gonna take a small diversion, right? And I said, we're not gonna do code and it's not really code, but it's gonna help us write documentation. We're gonna take a small diversion. I'm posting a link in the chat right now for that is not it. I just accidentally copied all kinds of crazy stuff <laughs> off of that pandas. <laughs> oh, I almost pasted you all of their badges. Mm -hmm. So this is a cheat sheet for how to write Markdown. And you don't have to do this in GitHub, but don't close this repo. I'm gonna show you my favorite online markdown editor. Oh, it's called hackmd.io. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite place to be. Um, you can sign in with GitHub if you want, which is what I'm gonna do. I, I have this all associated with my um, GitHub account. I'm gonna click this green new note button. And this is gonna launch me into this really cool real-time editor. Now, there is a, a catch, a small catch to this. GitHub has its own markdown language. It's based on the, the bigger markdown standard. So most things work. HackMD has its own markdown language. So not everything I do in HackMD will translate to GitHub. Everything I'm gonna show you and everything that you have in that guide that I linked you will translate. I'm not gonna show you the fancy HackMD stuff, so you don't have to worry about it there. But you'll see, this can link right to repositories. I can push and pull. I could use this as my editor. We're not going to tie in that integration either. But 
Markdown kind of works like this. The Ocothorpe, favorite word, word of the day, Ugh. right? Also known as your hashtag or your pound sign, depending on how old and hip you are, is going to be a heading. And if I just type it here, it starts suggesting, hey, do I want an H1, an H2, a three, four, five, right? Or tags. And I can just put that in. And now I can start typing. Welcome boot camp. Awesome. If I want to make a list, or I can say, let's let's skip the list. Some just paragraph text. Hey, how are you all? Finding the bootcamp. Great. I can add checkboxes with simple little dashes. And this is the power of, of Markdown. It's good. It's bad. Uh, Brooks looks funny. Okay. What? Which one? Oh, but we don't need your input on that one. We already <laughs> know. Okay. So we can do these simple things. What if I want to quickly build a table? Name age, um, hair color, right? I can come down here. Some of you have written Markdown before. If you haven't, I just changed word processing for you completely. Uh, so buddy, cool. um, 67, hair color, bald, okay? Cool. I'm very quickly building a table. Um, Angel. Uh, and why he's building that table. Let me point out something to everybody. This is a sort of low level thing that allows you to make quick comparisons between different versions of a file. Uh, yeah, very we'll, large... dive, we'll dive into diffs tomorrow though. Oh yeah, but I'm just, I'm setting you up here because you can see on the left, everything is just text. It's just there's text. No, there's no funky stuff that we see inside Word, no funky stuff that we see inside a Google document that is their little control characters to make things work. It's just text. And because so many organizations are embracing Markdown, as you can see right there, it renders out very nicely. Yeah, inside. that's a really good point. On, on like yeah. a Google Doc, it would be really impossible for me to tell if you added a row to this table or added a column to this table. When we get into the power of what's called a diff tomorrow, we could very easily see what changed about this table because it is just text. So you can do all sorts of stuff. We could do... Um, here is some code. I could say, I don't know, pseudo mat is awesome. Okay. And now this is like raw text. So I could actually copy and paste this into a terminal and I wouldn't have to worry about like ASCII encoding or new line endings mm -hmm. that could screw up that. Um, I could even say um, here is some like informational text. <coughs> Right. And it highlights it a little funny. It's a quote or I could do block quotes or I could say, hey, like I want um, JSON. Actually, we'll do Python. I can I can specify a language like maybe I need to write code, even though this isn't about code. Maybe I need to write code and I can have this code block that has syntax highlighting. And notice that everybody it's actually rendering it exactly like, say, if you were inside something like Visual Studio Code. Uh, it gives you that look and it's just, and look, and look, all it was was three ticks to start yep. it, three ticks to end it, specify the language. And you've got a really, really cool output. I can add subheadings. I can also say, Hey, like I want this to be bold. So I can bold an individual word. I can mm -hmm. italicize an individual word really funny. Right. So like, I'm not, it's, it is super sweet, right? Thank you. <laughs> that, that's so, uh, this is why I can't use word processors. You know how fast it was to do all of this? I would have to click all that silly UI to actually in, like format a mm -hmm. file like this. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. And look, I can go, oh, I want just a break in the page. Yeah, it's, I can and do so much fancy stuff to include um, links really quick, right? I could say- Yeah, like, do a reference link, yeah. Matt's GitHub. Right. And then https colon slash slash github.com slash Matt Davis 0351. And now if I gave this to somebody, they could just click that link in the markdown and go to my GitHub. It's that simple. Yep. And the thing about it is also other than long is a great hair color. Yeah. Brian got us on that one. He sure did. <laughs> just two other things real quick I want to point out I think I can remember my second point I'm gonna stall on the first one until I remember for those of you who are not familiar with there's an there's an application called pandoc p-a-n 
D-O-C. When you start out with Markdown, you can easily take this thing into other formats. Like if you needed to take this and shoot it into a Word file because somebody's just got to have a .docx, you start with this, you run it through Pandoc, Pandoc can present that for you. Not only that, and to Matt's point about uh, word processors and stuff like that, there's a lot of other extensions that we can take advantage of with Markdown. For example, being able to create slide presentations. With something like this, with, with a system like Mermaid that uh, Matt just showed me recently, we can create really cool slide presentations and they're text-based. I challenge you to put together a presentation in PowerPoint where you can quickly go through and find changes that somebody would have made. When it's rendered in simple text like this and you need to take it through a very contrived process where say somebody creates it, an editor double checks it, it has to go through legal to make sure the company can, is okay with it going out. It has to go through a final process of upper level management saying it's cool. Doing that on changes is next to impossible. I've been there, done that. It's not a pretty thing. This makes it easy. So this oh, what is, is something, this? This is something we're going to talk about in, a, in the following days, but this is a web hosted slide presentation and it's ugly and it's supposed to be, it was just a simple proof of concept. Um, this was designed and built using Pandoc coupled with GitHub actions and every one of these slides you see is actually just a markdown file. So consider I need to collaborate on a presentation. Have you ever needed to know what changed in a PowerPoint presentation? Ugh. Well, with something like this, all of these slides, let me get back to it. Of course, it's going to be fickle to get mm -hmm. back to it. Um, let me head back. And the I'm only gonna, downfall is how this is deployed is a little bit frustrating. Yeah, yeah. But I'll make, I'm, I'll, 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 I will mitigate that by pointing out that, hey, have you ever tried to collaborate on a PowerPoint file? Ain't going to yeah. happen ain't going to happen. It's a nightmare. It's impossible, right? So if I come back into that repository, I know it's very awesome named. And I look at this slides folder, you'll see slide one is a markdown file. Welcome is a markdown file. Slide with notes. This is simply a markdown file. If I look at it, here it is. Like these are the slides. And then I How added like that? speaker notes to the slide yep. with some Pandoc fanciness, right? But all of this is built with an automated pipeline, and that's what's important. Um, but nonetheless, so that's just another reason. That, that's in GitHub. That's not code. That's, that's Markdown. So Markdown is super flexible. To Brooks's point, if you come to like Google Docs, you can, uh, there's plugins that will let you write Markdown, <coughs> and it'll render it over and do the formatting for you. So you've gotten Markdown a little bit. So now I'm going to show you GitHub flavored Markdown to a small degree. It's not any different. Everything that I wrote in HackMD would work over here on GitHub. All right. They just have a couple of tweaks that you can make. And we're, we're probably not going to dive too much into those, but I want to show you GitHub's Markdown editor specifically. And then I'm going to give you a task that you can do today. And, and I would genuinely put effort into it because it's like you get to keep it, right? It's your, your account, your profile, your everything. So like, let's make it cool. So back into our repository, where do we go for code? Code tab, right? Mm -hmm. We want to edit this readme. How do we do that? There's a little pencil. I'm gonna click that pencil. And here is our markdown, right? And there's some little ideas in here. So you'll notice this is a comment on line three to 17. It's a comment. If you know HTML, it's an HTML comment because Markdown renders into HTML. So on HackMD, it's the same thing. Like it's just a comment and this doesn't show up, right? Like it's never gonna render, okay? Everybody see that? It's the, it's the less than exclamation dash dash and then it ends with the dash dash greater than symbol. And anything you put yeah, in there- Yeah, there's a, yeah, a bang okay. in there. You'll see it if you if you click edit, you'll see the, the start of it on- There it is, yep. And yep. the end on 16. So what's really cool about this is you can use these comments to say, I'm going to add objectives section or whatever section you might want to have, right? And then maybe down here, I want to have another section for um, add skills section, right? You can, whatever. This becomes really helpful in your issues, like your issue templates, because we might include a comment that says 
attach a screenshot of the behavior or include a synopsis of the bug or whatever, right? Like you can give instructions and they don't render. So we have high there. You can change that to whatever you want. But if we're going to make a change, like we're editing this file real time, I'm going to say edit me. And I don't know what it looks like, but I want to see it, right? Because this is really cool. Like HackMD like shows this to me right now. GitHub does too. You just have to click this preview button. And now you can see the changes that exist. So in order to save these changes, because even though I changed this file, if I just go back to the code tab, it's going to say, hey, you made some changes. You sure you want to leave? No, I'm not sure. I want to, I want to make these changes. Or maybe I don't. So I hit cancel and it just takes mm -hmm. me back. Like maybe I screwed up. I'm editing the wrong file. I come all the way down here to the bottom and I make a commit. And you don't have to worry about what this is today. We're going to dive into to all of this tomorrow. But I don't suggest doing this either. We're going to dive into branches tomorrow. So I want you to commit directly to main this one time and this one time only. <laughs> I want you to commit directly to main and you're going to hit commit changes. And put in a description. Put we'll in get, a, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, dive, we'll get we'll to dive that. Into but that. if y'all want to do it as an optional, jump in there. So now I have a new a new readme. What's funny is it's not usable because again, GitHub Flavor Markdown says these little check boxes, like they're usable over here. Mm -hmm. oh, if I can click properly, they're not usable um, in a readme, but they are usable in issues, right? So like, hey, issues take Markdown, right? So we can do the same thing. I'm an issue, uh, do, 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 task one task two, I hit preview. I can see what that's going to look like. I can update the comment and look, now we can check it off. And what's really cool is if you add these check boxes to an issue up here, it says like this issue has two tasks. So now if you're, if you're thinking project management, you're seeing like, Hey, you can use, you know, this issue is in progress and it has three out of five tasks complete and it's assigned to this person and everything else. Mm -hmm. Question is, any opinion on using VS Code for Markdown work? I use it exclusively for Markdown work unless I am using HackMD. Um, most of the time I have a repository down on my local machine and I use VS Code for that. Um, VS Code will render Markdown. It does it with no problem. Yep. Uh, let me, I think I can very quickly show you. Let me open VS Code here. I might have some Markdown. Okay, cool, I do. This is super secret markdown, but I can't seem to, to zoom in, but trust me, uh, oh, it's just slow. If I click this button here, it renders markdown just fine. Yep. I know it's a little messy because it's my, my workspace and it's all weird and I didn't prep it for display, <laughs> but you can render markdown just fine yep. in VS Code. On that, oh. on that, on that point, Brian, yeah, I backed that up completely. I use VS Code quite a bit because it's, it's easy to use. However, and, and this is not an endorsement. This is just a personal Brooks. Matter of fact, I'm going to cover my I and E thing right here just for a second. If you ever have somebody who's like, I want to do Markdown, but I'm not interested in all that nerdiness y'all are doing. I can't recommend Typora, T-Y-P-O-R-A enough. It's a really simple application. You do have to pay for it. But from my experience, if you have folks that just don't want to do or learn how to do it, that's a great little app. It does pretty good integration it doesn't have integration but the the uh the hashtagging it uses the control character it uses works really well with github so if you've got to go with something that's really just simple they can just type away type or but other than that vs code is just fantastic and oh by the way like so many things we're seeing here absolutely free it's just yeah, a great vs code awesome free and then so yeah like vs code is what i would typically use but again i i wanted to keep this in the web right like the whole point was i didn't want you to have right. to download VS Code. I didn't want you to set it up. I want to show you how to do this with the web. Now, since you're asking about VS Code, I'm going to show you something cool. I'm going to throw you a bone. I'm going to throw you a bone, okay? Because oh, you what are you going to do? Boy, that VS Code do? has an online editor. Now, <gasps> guess who owns VS Code? Uh, Microsoft? Microsoft. Oh, shoot. <laughs> guess who owns GitHub? Ah, Microsoft. So it's almost like there's probably a feature that allows what? me to do this. So if I click this markdown file and I see it here, 
and I press the period on my keyboard. What? I just pressed the period. I didn't do anything fancy. I just pressed the period key. He just it, pressed the period key. It just launched an online VS Code editor for me for my markdown. It does have a terminal, I think. I never use this. I just know it exists, so bear with me. Yep, Brian, that was slick. That is a very slick feature. I think and there's a terminal somewhere. There is, um, dude. And, I forget you, where it is, but you, you, yeah, you can through, launch it. You can go through your entire Git flow process right here in this. So you can, if, yeah. you're used, if you're used to Git and you know Git, you know you can Git add, Git commit, Git push, all of that. And it goes right back into the repository. So yeah. I, now caveat, I don't know if this is a pro feature or not. I know when this was being developed, it was only available to enterprise people under the, the code name of code spaces. So mm -hmm. code spaces would let you like spin up these editors for specific repos. I yep. saw a post on LinkedIn that said, if I did this, that this feature was, a, was now in existence. So if you can't do it, it could be a pro account thing, but it opens the exact file right there. I, there's gotta be a terminal somewhere. Um, view. It's there account. somewhere. To, there I it thought is. it was there. Yeah. Terminal. Got it. Right. So, okay. So terminals are not available in the web editor, but if you're right. using yep. code using the, the visual commit thing, Cool. It works fine on just free. Um, if you're using the visual commit, you can create your pull requests and, and add your commits here. But again, please don't let that bog you down. Don't also let me stop you from playing and experimenting, but uh, you can also just add it like this, right? What you can't do that for is issues, right? If you're creating an issue, you can't yeah. open VS code for an issue. Um, oh. Won't work. So, so that's the downfall, but there yeah. is that built-in editor. So it's really cool, right? Is like, if I'm a developer or I'm scratch that, if I'm an employee and I have access to a repo and my company doesn't want that code to live locally on my machine, because maybe it's a government thing or a highly regulated yep. industry, yep. it doesn't have to, I can still leverage all of that. And UVS code savvy people, I'll tell you this, if you're familiar with dev containers, some of you DevOps people might be like dev containers inside of VS code. I can add a dev container file to a repo. And then when I press the period key, I get all of the desired extensions and VS code configuration that I want. So again, y'all, that was nothing but hitting the period key. Yeah. And that was like, that's something you would just never know. Like, I guess you got to be on the inside to know that that's yeah. the best insider info. Again, y'all, that's, that's why I was saying, this is why I was so excited to have Matt teach you all this, because this is that insider stuff that just doesn't show up. And to be honest with you, uh, after Matt showed this to me, I did some searching. I don't see a lot of people who even know about that trick. Yeah. So glad I didn't actually didn't leave. I would have been so confused. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. Um, there's a lot of weird shortcuts. Uh, a lot of them have been disabled for me at this point. Um, like the staff's view of this, like I could see all sorts of stuff. I just, I could toggle my view from staff to, to regular user. Here's another mm -hmm. super fancy thing I didn't cover. We'll, we'll cover it a little later. Um, if I come in to here and I type slash, uh, they're not enabled. You can also do some slash commands, right in issues and pull requests yep. and stuff like that. That might be an organization thing though, but there's a lot of like little bitty hidden features that kind of exist all over GitHub, um, which is kind of cool, but that's one of them. So UVS code people, you really want to use it. You can, you can also copy and paste this stuff over, yep. but like what doesn't render is like HackMD lets you do this. I could say info, this is info. And it does this really cool thing and it puts this green box around it. But if I take that over to GitHub, this is where these things differ. And I try to preview that, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't preview right. it. So there is a little bit of a syntactical sugar depending on your markdown renderer, which is like, I know Brooks threw out his, his recommendation for that type of stuff, but you have to look out for the differences yep. in how GitHub is gonna, right. gonna render that. Um, here's another, I'll leave you one last super cool thing before I give you your final piece. Let's say I have a link to sketchpad uh no nope, that's oh bad. this is a good one yeah this is a good one y'all watch this trick actually um i don't know how to snip let's we're gonna yeah. do a super safe google search okay we're gonna search for cats if you're afraid of cats close your eyes <laughs> i'm gonna hit right click on this cat photo and i'm gonna copy the link that's all i'm gonna do 
is I'm going to copy the link and I'm going to not put it in my readme. I guess I will screw it. It'll be fun. Um, so I'm going to come into my readme and I'm just going to paste it. Boom. And GitHub should, oh, why don't you do it? Is it only issues? It could yeah. only be issues. Yeah, I think it's issues, dude. So if I do that in an issue, because like maybe I took a screenshot of the problem, okay? right? Um, and I paste that. Oh, does it have to be a picture picture? Let's see. Yeah, well, you've got the link unless it's doing a preview type thing. Save so. image as, we'll just save it. Yeah, I know I had the link. It's being finicky. You can yeah. take you can take these and put the, and it'll create a permanent link. So I'm going to copy the picture. Notice how I copied the JPEG, not the link. And now I paste that in. Oh, yeah, it's going to give you your absolute. Yeah. 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 You can, I promise you that you can take pictures and paste them directly in without building. You don't have to build the markdown link. Right. Um, and it will <coughs> create like a permalink in it'll like upload it to github and it'll give you this crazy url and it'll always be there for you they store them indefinitely um so you can just have pictures show up uh for example if i come back into that that one little pandas thing that uh i have here um let me find it we were just there we were just there we'll come to my orgs that's how uh, the, the picture got there for that pandas thing I showed you mm -hmm. earlier. So if I come in here and I look up pandas, like this picture, if I click edit, you'll see that, oh, she actually, never mind. Oh, she, she resized it. So there's okay. a trick is she, yep. she wrote a little HTML. So here's another pro tip. You can write HTML inside of Markdown. So she wrote some HTML so that she could specify some attributes to this picture. But most of the time, uh, you can just paste the picture directly in. So like if you had a GIF, you could paste that GIF in or whatever it might be, and it will create a permanent link for you. Um, I don't know why it's making me look foolish. I guess I got away with too much today that didn't backfire on me. So it had to throw one my <laughs> way. Um, but yeah, so that's last little bits of pro tips. So what we're going to leave you with, and it's in, I gave you the guide for Markdown, okay? I if you were to look in this, this readme, originally it had some ideas in the comments. I asked you to Google up some cool readme, profile readme ideas. I want you to just take some time and write some markdown just so you can get used to it. Take some time, write some markdown and uh, commit it to your, your profile readme, okay? That's it, just, just commit it here so that when we view your profile, we can see what you did. And uh, if you do something really cool, we're gonna we're gonna ask a couple of you to like share them with us tomorrow because we want to see them. Absolutely. Um, why this is important? Not just is it great to like build your GitHub footprint, uh, but if you want to participate in doing some of this non-code related automation stuff that we're gonna do, it's gonna take place against this README. So it's really important that you do have that yes. set up and configured. Um, so I'm gonna leave the remaining time for you guys to ask questions about what we covered thus far. I know we didn't get into like get flow and all of that, but that's coming tomorrow. There's a, mm -hmm. we're out of schedule people. All of that's coming. So that's if you have questions about features or accounts or whatever it might be, the floor is now yours. Go ahead, type them up, ask us our questions. And if you don't have questions, we will see you tomorrow at the same time, at the same place to continue this. And be sure. If you didn't do it today, create that GitHub account. Please. Get that thing set up. Jump in there. Follow the instructions about creating a repo that's named after your handle and create that readme file. Before we go, for any of you, because I don't want, because I know it's going to disappear, grab the link, the one to the markdown.org forward slash cheat dash sheet. Mm. Grab that link right now while you have a moment. Put it into a web browser tab so you've got it so that you can work on this. This again, this is going to be like, I love the way you said it, Matt. This is your footprint, your first footprint into GitHub. So spend a little time with it. Fancy it up. Put some of your capabilities in there. Some of the things you've worked on, put something in there you can show off. And tomorrow, if you want to, we'll ask you to post up your uh, GitHub uh, URL and we'll throw it to the screen so everybody can see it. So do something fancy.
Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to day two, or welcome to day two of GitHub for Everyone. I hope everybody had a great evening. I hope everything went well for you. Um, I know there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, a lot of concerns about things, but I'm hoping for the next few hours we can focus, get right down to business, and learn more about GitHub with Matt. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be doing today, uh, we're going to be talking about collaborating. Uh, Matt's going to talk to us about GitFlow. This is not a little thing. It's, it's pretty cool. And then beyond that, if we have time, one of the things I'm really excited that we're going to have the opportunity to get to is going to be actions. And this is something that Matt knows quite a bit about, taught me quite a bit about. And that's something that's going to be really cool to share with all of you. But before we get started, hopefully all of you had an opportunity to do some homework. And that is create your GitHub account if you didn't do it yesterday and Set up that special repo that Matt showed us where we set up that readme. If you have done that, and if you don't mind sharing, and by the way, feel free to share. Let's see that posted your URL over in the QA, and let's all take a look at what you've done. Yeah, let's see those profiles. Put a couple in chat. Yep, I'm really yep. curious. I'm, I'm super excited to see yep. what you guys In particular, uh, there's, one, uh, there's one person in the room that I do want to call out, uh, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but their uh, initials are Matt B., what happened was, is I had Matt B's window open from yesterday. I had, yes, exactly. I had tea in my mouth. I look over and Matt's updated his with a picture of General Kenobi. So I see, oh, I see, hello there and boom, spit on my freaking monitor. So thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. <laughs> no, it was really that. Yes, yes. Matt, mission accomplished. No, it was really good, Matt. That was well done. I really like what you did there. So for any of you, if you would like to go ahead, drop in there into the, um, drop into the Q and A, drop your URLs in there. You can yeah, drop it. Be... I'm sorry, into the chat, mm -hmm. into the chat. What a knucklehead. Drop it into the chat, especially you, Matt. There we go. Everybody, there's Matt's. If you want to jump in and take a look at what he, Matt did. Very well done, Matt. Very well done. If anybody else has one that they'd like to pop in there, go right ahead. There we go. Good gravy. <laughs> awesome. Oh, interesting. Look at that. Question for you on these links. Did you manually put these in here one by one? Hmm? This looks very similar to something that I have in mind, which is why I'm asking. Very cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So you used the markdown. So you did, you, you manually typed them in. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the other thing on links, haha, funny, funny plot twist. Yesterday, <laughs> I was bragging about the fact that you could just copy and paste pictures and things. And uh, it broke on me, right? If you guys remember right. Um, as soon as you guys left, it worked just fine. So I'll give you that example really quick. And then we'll check out this other profile that just got posted. Yep, if you thanks, right Barry. click on it, you don't want to copy the link. You're going to copy the image. So if I copy the image, I can then put it in the middle of like an issue. So if I, we delete this and I hit paste, you'll see that it's, it's uploading and it uploaded it to this really strange URL. So it permalinked it. And now I have that picture right here as a part of my comment. And all I did was, was copy and paste. So that's like super convenient and a really easy way to just be, I guess, a little more visual with uh, your, your issue writing and your markdown usage. Um, if you're on like HackMD, it does the same thing. It just uploads it to Imgur rather than, than GitHub. But the advantage of doing it on GitHub is it, it uploads it to the GitHub servers and it's not mm -hmm. going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, got a question. When we get, when will we get the recorded sessions? Adam, I don't know if you're there, sir, or if you even want to speak to us. Is there a timetable for publishing a, uh, the cleaned up version of this? Yeah, typically it takes the production team about a week, um, two weeks at most um, to get this course edited down, kind of put into a way that can be um, ingested on the platform. Um, so usually about a week or two weeks at, at the most. Yep. So yeah, if you come back on the platform, uh, Baron, week, two weeks, you should see it out there. Maybe even cleaned up a little bit with some of our nonsense gone. <laughs> All right. We got an initial profile here, which is good. There you got go. it set up. And that's, that's honestly what the important part was, was making sure <laughs> that you fine. have it. So 
Um, yes, this is great. This is great. See, this is this is where you kick it in. This is where you start it, y'all. This is this is good stuff. So, yeah. So even though if if you haven't done it or you just didn't want to share a URL, if you're getting to this place right here where you're just getting it set up, good job, y'all. Very very good. So these are really cool, right? Because they're they're profile landing pages and. Like I'm not connected to Matt at all on GitHub, but by just landing on his profile, I can guess a few things about him because of this readme, right? Yeah, I can right. look at the fact that maybe in a past life or in an alternate universe or some string theory situation, he can hook me up with Luke Skywalker, right? So maybe that possibility exists. I can also see some of the stuff that he's into. It's, it's mm -hmm. mostly about me and Markdown, but that's fine. I'd be into me too. It's a, it's a map thing, I'm guessing. So um, I can see stuff about him, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And this starts to highlight a social feature of GitHub, which I don't typically highlight. Um, and it's this followers and following section, okay? Mm -hmm. Just like Twitter or LinkedIn, you can use GitHub as a social platform as well. You'll see Matt's following five people and he's got 47 followers. So he must be up to something interesting if yep. so many people find him interesting, right? And you can just click this follow button and you will then have like that feed. And that feed shows up for you. Uh, I forget exactly where. I think it's just here at the base GitHub screen. Like there's like this feed. I can see everybody that's, that's followed me. I should be able to see some of the stuff that, that you guys are doing. Um, so you can see like who is starring your repositories. You can see who's cloning and or who's forking. I'm pretty sure. Yep. So you can see forks. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that, that you can see from the social aspect, right? So don't hesitate to take two seconds, go to each other's profiles or, or find projects and people that are contributing to projects that you care yep. about and follow them because you can start using this as a, a little bit of a professional profile too. I know yes. some of you uh, were like network engineers or DevOps engineers that were kind of focusing on networking. It'd be really awesome if you guys networked on GitHub because you probably had a, have a lot of overlap that you can share with one another on, on the types of infrastructures, code files you're using and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So maybe you have super fancy scripts that, that you've worked with that, would benefit somebody it's a really good place for that um and it's also one of those things where employers might check in oh, yeah. the sense of i see a lot on job applications nowadays it says what's your github you put in your github handle i go to your profile i see who you're following all right and then based on who you're following let's go back based on who you're following like i can maybe one of these people happens to be one of the references that you've listed. I can then click on their stuff and I can just kind of go down the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. and get a little creepy and research you more than I should. <laughs> but it gives employers that, that visibility. So very similar to LinkedIn, except yeah. instead of saying, hey, I worked on Terraform templates to stand up network infrastructure, I can actually go see some of the templates that you've worked with and I can see what you've been doing. I can tell how you're writing your your files and stuff right i can also see interesting stuff um just i used to do this when i had to to, to give interviews when i was an interviewer at github um, i would check to see if you had a github account which oddly enough it's not a requirement for hiring but if you did i would come look at things like your your contribution graph Right. Uh, just because I have 1100 contributions in a year, like what are they? Are they contributions to documentation? Right. If you're telling me that you're really good at Ansible playbooks and you have zero Ansible contributions in your GitHub, I'm probably going to have different questions for you when we talk. Whereas if you tell me that you've used Ansible for two or three years and I come to your GitHub account and I can see that your contributions are in the form of ansible related things then we don't have to dig as deep into that topic in the interview right. because you've already answered most of the questions that i have um and now i can just maybe focus on you a little bit so you can use this so much to your advantage by by just kind of getting through some of the technical hoopla 
that yeah. goes on in interviews by by giving it to your interviewers up front. But and isn't that, isn't that one of the strange things about GitHub, Matt? Is because everybody thinks of it as just some sort of you know version control system. When in actuality, if you start looking at things like here's like what Matt has, you know, this becomes like really an online resume of my work, what I've done, what is out there. Or like here's a here's a, a Lola's. Um, uh, you know, just you can dig in, see what she's been doing, what she's been working on. It's like it really adds some heft to your resume, to the hiring process, and can be something that, and this is just me personally, I think can really set you apart. Yeah. See, like this is a, this is a great example. I'm glad this this got posted. Like, I see this. I see there's 44 repos. I see that you are engaging in a community, even though your account seems to be new-ish, which is okay. And I can very quickly look at, at what you've done. And what I see is a ton of stuff from, from Try Hack Me. So what that tells me is like, you're an active learner and you can do things in a self-guided manner, right? So now we get to talk about, like I, if maybe I didn't know anything about Try Hack Me and I was interviewing you, I could go to Try Hack Me and pull up things that match this just to see what tasks you did so now I can have that conversation with you. So this shows so much about you and your personality um, by just doing these. And right, like this is a write-up and, and this is a write-up. So I, <laughs> it looks like you've done the write-ups, which is great. Or you're starting the write-ups. Um, I don't want to dig too much in here and expose you, but they're, they're public for a reason, right? Um, mm -hmm. So no, that's great. Tons of markdown is huge. It shows that you're taking notes. I've, I've learned so much about you from just looking at how you keep organized. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't had to ask you a single question. Um, so it's, it's super cool to be able to do that. Um, and I can also see where you work, right? So there's so many things that we can tie in. I can see what organizations you're a part of, right? Maybe Try Hack Me has a GitHub organization. I don't, I don't remember if they do. It's been a long time since I used their platform. But like, I know like when I was self-teaching myself how to program, there were a couple like bootcamp kind of course things that I entered and they all had GitHub orgs. So if you go look at like my org membership, I think one of them is like LearnCo when I was learning Swift and that's on there. So there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do uh, or that I can get about you and learn about you without ever having talked to you, exactly. which is so cool. And I can just see what your network is. And I can also see like who you, like the things you like, you know, like what have you starred? I'm very curious, you know, like I can see so much about who you are. So I can see that you're plugged in with, with certain things in this security domain. And that's super, super helpful for me. So as much as LinkedIn is a great hiring tool, I don't think we need cats anymore. I don't know about you guys, but I think we're done with them. As much as LinkedIn is a great hiring tool from a recruiter's perspective, GitHub becomes a really big insightful tool from the interviewer's perspective, uh, especially like once you get into that, I'm going to meet with the team kind of level of things. Like I don't want to have a conversation with somebody about you know, tell me a time when you wrote a Terraform script or whatever, like that's boring. Like show me one that you've written yeah. um, or I've already seen enough of them. So like, let's talk about, you know, what you found challenging in one of them, or let's talk about like why you did that weird thing, because I want to know how you think. And, and maybe you solved a problem that I didn't know existed. And, and we can just talk like people a whole lot easier. If I've already seen your work, I don't have to do the whole coding challenge here's leak code 2.0 for you so very cool super beneficial i encourage you to everybody that's posting their github handles uh there should hopefully there's more right there's i think i think i think uh lola was the last one that we got in the uh chat that's cool though but um, yeah. yeah follow but, each but, other yeah absolutely yeah um and again if you haven't done this do it get started it's it's one of those things, y'all, I would rather if I was doing, you know, mentoring advice to you about careers and stuff like that, get ahead of the curve on this one, because um, this is becoming very much a standard in major organizations, AWS, uh, Microsoft, Google, any big place like that. Um, it's, it's pretty common to go, okay, does this person have a GitHub page? Let's go look. Or better yet, on your resume, 
or maybe on your LinkedIn profile, you've got your URL sitting there. So we can just go out and just take a look at it. It can be, yep. it can make a big difference in terms of your uh, marketability. Uh, so again, take a moment sometime, make it a little bit, put a little bit of effort into it. It's worth it. It really is worth it. And I'm going to piggyback right. on this corporate jargon 101 uh, <laughs> to drive home and uh, or highlight another feature. Okay. So we have the, the user account name, and then we have the repo name. And what we learned yesterday that is that if it's the same, if the repo name is that of our GitHub handle, it's a special repo, right? And it gives us that public profile. There's another special repo. There's like another secret repo that exists. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, let me show it to you if it loads. So <laughs> where, oh, where are you? Should be easy to find. Should be in repos, right? Exactly. And it's also similar to my name. And you'll see this. Hey. It's my handle.github.io. This is a special repo that allows me to deploy static web pages using GitHub. So yesterday I showed you that really ugly slideshow that was all built with Markdown. That was, uh, that was all hosted on GitHub. And to this point, all of this code is hosted on GitHub. And I use this to demo like how like you could use GitHub to set up your portfolio, right? I, I know I mentioned I mentor a lot of like web dev kids. So I, I throw this in here because I try to teach them GitHub. And then I say, hey, like, you know, you're learning web development, create your, pro, your portfolio now and, and just deploy it out on GitHub. Don't worry about how to deploy to AWS. Don't worry about how to use Heroku. Don't just put it in GitHub and let GitHub deploy it. So what's really cool is there's this feature called pages and GitHub pages is really good at deploying static. That's the key here, static web pages, nothing server side. So if you're running a PHP server, you're running go as you should be, you're running a Node.js express server. It's not going to work. It has to all be client side static web pages, but GitHub can deploy it. And what's cool is it can deploy it in a couple different ways. What you saw yesterday was Markdown. Those slides, those were all Markdown files. Not a, not a single bit of JavaScript, not a single bit of HTML or anything like that. In this case, it's HTML, it's JavaScript, it's a little bit of CSS, and it gets all deployed out on, on GitHub pages. It's really easy to enable. Um, and there's a reason why I use this, this repo name and we'll get to that. It's really easy to enable. If you go into the settings and you come down to pages, you'll see, here you go. GitHub pages is designed to host your personal organization or project pages from a GitHub repository. But what you'll notice is my URL. Some of you guys are freaking out because it's HTTP and not HTTPS, but that's okay uh, for this. You'll notice that my URL is not a GitHub URL. It's a domain that I own. So you might have caught that back here with this C name record that exists. And as long as I just set up a little text file called C name, GitHub understands how to go look at the domains that I have registered. There's like a little setup thing for it. And I can change the domain. So it would be github.com slash Matt Davis 0351.github.io. It would be a really jumbled, crazy URL, and that's okay too. Uh, it still works. But if you want to tie in your own to make something professional like a portfolio, you absolutely can. Um, so this is typically used for a couple of things, like hosting that portfolio or a personal site or things like documentation and slideshows. So it's very simple. You, you come down here and you pick a source on like where you want it deployed from. And then you pick whether you want it to de be deployed from the root folder or a docs folder and you hit save. That's all you have to do. And it will, it will publish this. And now when I go to it, I have a statically deployed nothing website at the moment to just show that there is, you know, all these little bubbles that are moving. I don't know how well they're rendering. Like that's just JavaScript running on the back end. So it does run JavaScript in, the, in your browser. It does do all the fancy CSS hover stuff that you could want. 
Um, you could get really, really fancy and do this in like React if you really wanted to. You just can't make any server side calls, right? So to the point of I am interviewing you or I'm an employer, if I notice that you have that really special repository, .github.io, your name, .github.io, I'm gonna go take a look at this page. And once I have this set up, I can do this for any repo. So if I come back in here and we're gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna create a brand new repo to show you how fast it is. It does support SSL. Yes, you can enforce HTTPS. It's in this, it's in the setting. Um, I just didn't go through that trouble because I didn't let, that was one extra thing that I didn't want to burden on somebody that's never written a line of HTML. I'll post up the page uh, for Brian right there in the uh, chat. Cool. Thank you. Yep. So Good I'll question, show Brian. you how fast it is to enable this. And I have very frequently used this for documentation uh, along the way. Um, so at a readme. So if I'm documenting my project or uh, I've done, I've, like I've created a lot of manuals, like training manuals for things and deployed them out through GitHub pages. There's a thing called Doxify.js. I'll put that in chat in case you're interested. Doxify.js is really easy and fast to set up as GitHub pages. And it gives you, I'll, I can show it to you here, actually. Doxify um, uses their own thing to do their docs. Right, so this is what it looks like. You hit get started and you have this really nice document page with a table of contents, code snippets. And what's cool is every one of these pages is marked down. So you can write this exact same documentation for your project or your scripts or whatever you're doing using something like Doxify and you can deploy it right alongside the code. Yep. Um, so here's the new repo that I created. Sorry to jump around a little there. Here's the new repo. It doesn't have anything deployed out. I'm gonna to go to settings. I'm gonna click on pages. You'll see it's it's not enabled. I'm gonna say do it from the main branch root folder. And now I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna say choose a theme because I don't wanna write any code. It's just not what I'm after. And I'm gonna go ahead and I can browse the themes. They look mm -hmm. a little like, this one looks a little like this. Um, let's see what this one is. This one's kind of boring. We don't want that one. Oh, Merlot's a good one, man. No, no, no. Chardonnay's better. I don't, I don't know. I'm a wine drinker. Uh, so here we go. Um, this, no, I don't like any of these. Okay, cool. This one's a little more documentation-like, right? Yep. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit select. It's going to update a new markdown full or file in the root of my repo called index. So index MD, not HTML, not JS, not mm -hmm. whatever. MD, Markdown, our friend, right? If we look at it, this is what it looks like. It just looks like normal Markdown if it renders through GitHub. We can commit that. Um, oh, it's, it wants to take it off of there. Okay. It has decided that it wants to... By default, GitHub has said you should deploy this from this GH Pages branch. And I'll, we'll talk about branches in a minute, trust me. Um, this is so that you can keep your code a little bit separate. How dare you? This is so you can keep your code a little bit separate from the documentation that's deployed out. You'll notice on this branch, there is no index MD, but on this branch, there is. Um, so we have to change our settings and we're going to say, don't deploy. Oh, it did it for us. How about that? Um, so it's, it's being published right now. It says it's ready. It might be ready. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but what you'll notice is it automatically put in my domain name and then it routed to what's in this repo. So this is because I have that other special repo over here set up. If I didn't have this, I like if I deleted this repo, I get some jumbled mess of a URL, which is totally just fine. If I don't intend to point anybody to it, because I can always get this link from the settings. But like if I wanted to show off that this is my portfolio, or if I wanted to use this as like an interview piece, I, I don't want you to have to 
you know, click on randomly generated link names. So um, we'll go ahead and click it and look that fast. We have our site deployed out. It's static. If we want to edit it, it's, it's really easy. It couldn't be easier to edit. You guys have already learned a little about Markdown. So if we come into here and we edit this, instead of saying, welcome to GitHub pages, uh, we're going to say GitHub or everyone. That's the only change we're going to make. We'll commit that and it's going to go ahead and, and deploy that out. And I'm showing you this because there's a very weird thing that happens with pages. And if, if you don't know it, you're going to think it's broken half the time. So it still loaded this. That's weird, right? GitHub pages leverages your browser's cache and it will store its initial state forever. And you're never going to be able to get this thing to reload, not the way you expect it to. Um, what we end up doing is we open up the inspector on a page and then you should be able to oh can you not do it on firefox on chrome you can uh right click this and it'll say like hard reload and yeah. that's like the best way to get that cache all cleared out i don't use firefox typically so i have no clue what i'm doing over here basically but, for you for for for, for y'all just to anybody you, you, you want to clear your cache do a hard reload yeah. on it and, and it'll pick it up Exactly. If you're on Chrome, it's really simple. Open up the inspector, right click this, and then hit like, um, do it's, I think it says perform a hard reload and it will clear the cache. There you go, Baron. Yep. Control, control shift R. There we go. Thank you. What up? I'm not a Firefox user. I don't know if that works on Chrome or whatever, but you see, so once the cache is cleared, it updates. So why is that important? It's, it kind of is. Like if I am building, documentation that maybe I'm pointing developers to let's let's pretend for a minute that I'm developing um, a, a development kit like a library or module for Python or a package for NPM or for node and I want my developers to know how to use it I could also be writing the markdown documentation off to the side and I can host the docs for my package right alongside the package all from the same repo um, Maybe I am doing job postings. I don't know that I would put that out here, but again, like training manuals, things that I want people to see because here's the kicker. This is public a hundred percent of the time, um, unless you're like on enterprise. So let me backtrack a little bit. If you're on enterprise and you're doing super internal stuff, you can have private pages for me and you on regular user accounts, even in organization accounts, um, the pages part is public, even if the repo is private. So that's cool too, though, because I can have a private repository that nobody can see, but pages is public and they can see what I've deployed out publicly. So this is a, a really simple, easy way to get clean, crisp, good looking docs up and running right alongside your project um, with zero effort or host a portfolio or or something. So this is another thing that I, I kind of look for. If I happen to see that special repo, which this one is not right, I, I will go look for that. And what's cool is it just kind of gets your whole URL. So, so at this point, you basically what we basically have is like a free static hosting website that we have complete control over. It's not being, you know, it's not where you've got to worry about, you know, a social media type thing, you own this. And the other thing I hope you all noticed was, that it really just, ought, well, other than the fact that we didn't do DNS, we didn't have to do a CNAME entry into a DNS system. We just created a file. Also, because Matt set his, his you know, base page, that, that IO page, now you'll notice how Curly Fiesta is now like hierarchically up under it. So without us even having to do any thinking, we're just automatically getting a hierarchy of uh, files, pages, projects that just start getting built out and it was easy to do it was simple i mean this morning matt is for example i was sitting there fighting my freaking s3 bucket static pages and it's just it, it drives me nuts as much as i know about aws it still drives me nuts because i keep thinking something's going to happen i'm going to get a huge charge because people are going to start pulling stuff out of the bucket it goes out of region it starts blowing up i've got to work the dns whereas i hope everybody saw right here that was that was it didn't take any brain work that's just easy.
And it's, Pat, what you do, Pat's got a question. Uh, please repeat the format of the special repo. Yep, sure thing. I will show it to you again. And that really only applies mm. if you want to do a custom domain, right? So keep that in mind too. Yep. It is this. So it's your username dot github dot io and that will allow you so that'll be like your default root route so let's let's think of uh http routing a little bit the root route will always point towards this repo your username dot github dot io to brooks's point if you deploy pages from another repo it becomes a route so if i deployed pages from oranges it would be Matt Davis 0351.github.io slash oranges. This is what the URL becomes. If, if I remember right, it's been a long time because I've had DNS set up forever on it. Um, I think it goes with this as your URL by default, github.io. Yeah, it does. So that still doesn't look bad. Maybe you don't want to go, like you're a student or something, I don't know, and you don't want to go buy a domain, or maybe you have no idea how to buy a domain, or or whatever, that's not a barrier to entry, right? Not Whereas like, if I wanted to deploy my web project portfolio thing somewhere, I have to figure out where to deploy it, how to deploy it. I don't know any of that, all right? I'm learning how to code for the first time, or maybe I just need docs. I don't wanna go through all of those hoops just for some documentation on something. Well, this URL is not a, bad thing to have you can just make it a little more custom and then each repo that you deploy pages becomes a, a route so it's kind of cool uh, by the way y'all you'll notice that that when uh matt brought that up for us that page those formatting that was using jekyll j-a-j-e-k-y-l-l -L. so that gives you some yep. really cool formatting but that's not the only one if uh like i'm a big fan of hugo h-u-g-o with hugo i could do the same thing and with just literally just a few commands on my personal laptop spin up a new site then when I'm all done, I just push it up to the repo, boom, it's up and running. And it's so simple. And when we start talking about GitFlow here in just a bit, you'll see why when we start talking about GitFlow and updating web pages, it just gets simple when you start doing stuff like this. Yep. So uh, fun fact, <laughs> inside info. Here you go. Inside info alerts. Uh, cool. Breaking news. GitHub uh, originally was built on Ruby on Rails. Um, so that's, there's still a lot of features that are Ruby on the back end, which is why Jekyll in core, like is something that we can use so easily, right? So right. Jekyll is <clears throat> a Ruby ecosystem thing. So you can use Jekyll, um, and then it's a browser, so you can use things JavaScript. So Doxify is another super good advantage or like library thing to use. I've always used the Doxify one over Jekyll uh, just because that's where I'm more comfortable. Uh, but I've worked with teams that use the Jekyll one all the time. There was a couple others. I forget them off the top of my head that I used. And then honestly, if you don't want to use any fancy stuff because maybe right. you just want to do it, like here is just an index HTML. This is the exact lorem ipsum that you guys saw on that portfolio. Uh, you can just create the static website like here's the css for it like it's not like i did anything magical right it's just a little bit of of web stuff exactly but if you're not a developer if you don't write code if you want to stay away from that and you still need nice looking stuff jekyll doxify hugo other libraries exist for you exactly you know and going back to y'all to what we said you know this is not just for developers this is for everyone so if you're just putting together a collection of documents about your company, say your hiring process or something like that, and you set up a repo, you can do this just as easily there, create a nice web page. And then when people start saying, well, I need to go look at it and see what's out there, you don't even have to send them to the GitHub repo where they might be initially a little uh, concerned because they don't exactly. think like they've got the skills to understand GitHub, send them to the pretty page. Exactly. Yep. And you'll notice this is private, but we could still see the page. You guys can't see the repo. You can't make edits on the repo, but you could see the page. So you could have sensitive stuff in the repo and then have not sensitive publicly publishable stuff on the exactly. GitHub pages. So exactly. you can totally do that and it's, it's just fine. Um, 
interesting things to think about. Another cool feature that I feel like was going to get overlooked if we didn't take a little bit of a time on it. Okay, questions, comments, concerns, going once, going twice. A little bonus material, everybody. Just a little bonus material. Yeah. Who's asleep? Raise your hand if you're sleeping. Oh, All right. Man. Yes. We're going to jump <laughs> in now into collaborating within a repository. <laughs> um, I encourage you to follow along. Yep. If you follow along, though, I will preface this by saying, choose a different repo name. Um, and the reason for that is the repository that we're about to create and work within is going to be the one that you get to take with you. So if you already have a repository named hot dog flavored water, and all of a sudden you try to take my hot dog flavored water, it's not going to work because you already have something with that name. So name it something completely different from, from what I'm going to name it um, if you want to follow along, which I encourage, right? This is another way to build that contribution graph. It's another way to network using GitHub as a social tool rather than strictly a code management tool. Um, hopefully that for everybody piece is really starting to hit home. So I know this, this might be a little boring at this point because you've seen me create four or five different repositories, uh, but repetition's key, so we're going to create a new repository. And GitHub and my internet is being a tad bit slow right now, so it's it'll load when it loads. I am, ooh, we could talk about templates. We'll get to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this repository is going to be called GitHub for everyone. Weird, very creative name. Whoever came up with that is a genius. Man. And I'm just going to add a description uh, because we didn't before, and I want to show you where it shows up. Um, so I'm going to say this is a repo to hold class files and notes for students or attendees, rather spelling everything wrong attendees to take with them after they give me 12 hours of their lives that's okay. fair cool i'm gonna make it public and i'm gonna say add a read me why because we always add a read me this is what we do okay and i'm not gonna add a get ignore i'm not gonna add a license uh at this point into i guess we could let's add a license i don't actually know because i don't know what INE's license structure is so <laughs> we'll skip that i was gonna throw mit at it but whatever yeah, just skip it man <laughs> um we don't want this cool fine cool create repository boom 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 hey see where the description populated what up it's also over here in the about section yeah, you're not going to see that pull request badge thing there. That is a GitHub app that I have installed on my account. Um, remember yesterday I showed you guys the... Good question, Lola. It's a wonderful question. Yeah, it is. I showed you guys the GitHub Marketplace. Um, I think it's called pull request badge, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's right here. So this app is what I have. See, edit my plan. I'm already... I have it there. Um, so this is installed on my account, which is why I see that option. You're not going to see that unless you have it installed on yours. Look how expensive it is, though. Oh, my. Woo. Pages is really expensive, too. Super duper expensive. It's uh, also free. So still no catch yet. Um, or not much of a catch, at least. All right, so we have GitHub for everyone. And now we're gonna start talking really about the collaboration behind this. Uh, and to do that, Brooks and I are gonna behave as if we're working on a project. The real joke there is that Brooks and I are gonna behave, uh, but we're gonna behave like we're working on a project um, to make this repo something better than, than this readme. And the, the task that we have that we're gonna solve today is we're going to build a contributing document. So there's this special document for GitHub. 
it's not special in any sense other than what it's named and where it lives. It lives in a folder that's called dot GitHub. This is a hidden folder. So it's dot GitHub. You'll see us create it. So don't stress about writing it down. And inside of there, it's called contributing.md. And like readme's all capitalized, we write it in all capital letters. It's just standard practice for this. Um, the contributing MD is a guide. It's a set of rules and recommendations that change for every single project out there. And they basically inform people who want to contribute how to do so. So let's take a quick look to see if we can find one really quick. We'll go back to my, my handy dandy pandas repo. I just and this is a fairly standard practice across the ecosystem, isn't it? It is. So the problem is, is some people place it in the root of their repo. Yeah, like we have the readme, we have the license, which is in the root of the repo. And others place it in this GitHub folder. And both are correct, right? So it's just up to you to, to figure it out. If you were to look at the docs, they would say you're both correct. I've always found it easier for things that involve configuration of the repo to be in a .github folder. Like templates. Remember we talked about the issue templates that Panda has, Pandas has like bug reports and, and enhancements and features. We showed you that when we were talking about issues yesterday. All those templates are right here. So it's a configuration for the repo. So therefore we put it in .github. One sec. Sorry about that. It's allergy season here and I am suffering, suffering. Uh, so here we have it right here, contributing MD. So let's go ahead and take a look at, at that. <laughs> so there's a simple, it says contributing to pandas. A detailed overview on how to contribute can be found in the contributing guide. Let's see where they put that. They have that deployed out to their website. So theirs was very simple. They just linked to their website where they have a, a much bigger, more robust thing. Now, is this a GitHub Pages site or not? That's the trick. We'll never know. And it very well could be. But we will never, ever know if this is de deployed with GitHub Pages. And that's okay. Now, you don't have to link out to a website at all. Uh, let's see if we can get to the VS code repo, here's extensions. Let's see if they have one. We check the root. Oop, that was fast. Nothing in the root. So we check the dot GitHub folder. Lo and behold, it's almost as if people set this up as, as a part of the community. So let's take a look. Boom. If you wanna contribute a new sample, see the sample guideline. Theirs didn't go anywhere special. Theirs actually linked to a, a file in the same folder. Watch, if we just go back one, it's right here. Sample guideline next to contributing MD. They could have just put this as one file. So maybe after you learn what you're going to learn today, you can uh, suggest that over to Microsoft and contribute back to VS Code extension samples. But here's just their guide on how to do this. And it's simply just helping you contribute to them in a way that they know how to understand. It's, it's their guide on speaking their language so that you can effectively help them. Mm -hmm. And cool. these, this is super important for pretty much every single project that has ever existed that expects or welcomes contributions. So if you're working within a repository and it doesn't have to be code, okay? It can be HR stuff. It can be mm -hmm. security stuff. It could be whatever you want. It doesn't have to be code. But if at any point you're saying, hey, I know I want to collaborate with people at some point, one of the first things you should add to this repository is a contributing guide, so, right? Like, let's figure out what that looks like. The other thing to note about that or another thing to note about that is it's not permanent you're allowed to change your mind 
you're allowed to make those changes and to update that file as your project grows and evolves. That's the cool thing about this. None of it is completely set in stone uh, until ever. And yep. which also means you can go back on your decisions as well. And we'll show you how to see that history a little bit as we build some. So, so to get- I, Absolutely. I mean, what y'all are hearing, you know, this is the best practice. And that's, again, one of the reasons why I was excited to have Matt come and teach this thing was because that's the way you do it correctly. You know, you create your repo, you create your readme.md, you can create or right there, drop that contributing.md, set your rules for collaboration. That way you're really doing it right. It's not like, oh, we just have a thing. No, you're structurally building this sucker correctly to set it up for your community, whether you're doing, like, like Matt said, you're doing code, you're doing documentation, you're doing hiring process. Like how do we, you know, we need to formalize how we hire people. That's your first couple of steps to really doing it right. Absolutely. So collaborating only matters if there's more than one person, right? Mm -hmm. Well, right now, I need to know how many people have access to this repo. So we're gonna find that out. I find that out by going to the settings and clicking the collaborators tab. And we log in and we can see who has access. I have zero collaborators. The repository is public so you guys can all see it, but I have zero collaborators. This has been a problem that I've faced a lot in life. Uh, and it's probably why I teach is I just don't have very many friends. And so oh. I force all of you guys to listen to me and that's why we're here. Uh, but in this case, I'm lucky enough that Brooks is at work too, and he's paid to be my friend today. So he's going to be my friend. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add Brooks is a, a collaborator to my repository. And don't feel too sad. I genuinely do have friends. That massive bowling league you're on. Yeah, man. We lost last night, though. Oh. It was bad. So we got Brooks. And his, his wonderful face. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to add him to the repository. And whenever he accepts that invite, which he's looking out for, so you'll have to bear with us as GitHub like updates its stuff. It might be a little slow, so feel free to ask questions. And, and, and quite literally, y'all, even though I'm not set up to show you my screen, what I'm looking at over here, if you could scroll to the top real quick, Matt, so I can show them. The, uh, you see the little bell up there icon with a little blue dot? That's what I'm looking for because that's where it's going to show up. It's going to be a notification. And so yep. I look over here and I can see I've got a notification from Matt. I just simply click on it. It's so easy. I'm like, I'm just clicking here. There's no code happening. And I can either accept or decline. In this case, I'll choose accept. He also got an email too. That's the other thing you're not seeing. Oh, that's true. So that's true. He, he didn't have to necessarily check GitHub, the notifications. Um, that is the first place like I always check for stuff because I'm really used to being on the platform and I ignore my email. Yep. But if you're somebody that doesn't ignore your email, you would have also seen an email that you got an invite to this repository. And another place you can see it, and I've seen this a lot when I was out, you know, traveling all over the country, uh, is integration via Slack. You would see it pop there too. You would see yes. it quite a bit. But anyway, I'll just to let y'all know what's happened. So what I did was I got the invitation, clicked on it, choose accept. As soon as you choose accept, what it'll do is it'll navigate you right to that repo. So for now, for me on my screen, I'm looking at our GitHub for everyone repo inside Matt's account. So it just took me right, right to exactly where Matt's showing you that. So again, yep. super easy to add people. Just say, hey, open it up. And they're there. So easy. Yep. So now he's a collaborator, right? Pretty cool. He sees he's on this page. This is where it landed him. Um, so back over in our settings from our view as the owner of the repo, we see that he's a collaborator. And I can, I can list my collaborators if I really want. It's there. Now, what does this mean? It means he can do almost everything. He can't delete this repo, I'm pretty certain. But he can do <laughs> most of the management. I don't think you can set up things like branch protections and stuff like that. I think that has to be done yeah. on yep. me, but yep. outside of that, he can do quite a bit. Uh, let's see if there's you kind of scope it for y'all. Like right now, what you're seeing there in his ribbon bar and Matt's ribbon bar for uh, code issue, pull requests and all that. I have all of that except settings. Yeah, so exactly. Perfect. So <laughs> Here is where I can set some of the stuff he can do under these moderation options. So like 
I can limit things to existing users when it comes to interactions with uh, this as, as it goes on. So we're not going to change any of these. That's not the scope of, of what we have going on. The point is we now have Brooks with me in this repository and we are ready to begin contributing. So let's do the first thing that we need to do and that's create our contributing document, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, how would we go about doing that? Well, the first thing is to collaborate, right? Weird. We're going to collaborate before we work. Now, yesterday, we talked about how to have conversation on GitHub. And we pointed out two locations to do that. The first location being discussions. The second location being issues. So if we look here, we don't have discussions enabled on this repository. So Brooks and I are going to start by saying, hey, let's create an issue. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to create an issue. And I'm going to say the title of the issue is going to be plan the contributing.md <coughs> file. Now, you know, here, I'm, I'm not, go ahead and type that up, dude. So I, I am not, I, I hate to, to, to get up on a soapbox here, but notice the thing that we did here. It would have been really easy. Matter of fact, it's open right now. I can do new file, create contributing MD, and I can push it up into the repo. That's not how we do it. We start by having a discussion, like what are we going to do? And we use issues to track it and keep also keep this in mind, y'all, when you're thinking about this, when it comes down to things that you're doing at work and you want to sort of make sure it's very clear to whoever may be looking in to say, okay, what are y'all doing? Issues conversations is the way to do that. And with the issues, they can say, oh, they're working on the contributing dot markdown. I know it sounds like that's almost like a, so what Brooks, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. That's the visibility into your work that you can use so that you don't have to get emails, Slack messages, anything like that. They can just go and see what you're working on. So before you start click clacking around and creating files, create an issue. And then that way you can see what's going on there. And then, and I don't think we're going to do this for this, Matt. We're going to, I don't think we're going to do a project board, but if there was a project board, these we'll put issues, up a project board. all right, so we'll do a project board. They could go look in the project and see where things are going on again, without slowing you down, without having you to stop what you're doing and interact with a person, like with a project manager, it can all just be seen here. Exactly. So I have this issue. I gave it a title. Now, look, there are a couple other best practice things. When we're talking about commit messages and titles for things, these things matter. I want to be able at quick glance to understand what exactly it is I'm looking at, what exactly the change was. Um, so, for example, when you updated your profile readme last night, if you just hit commit, the message that was that came with that commit probably said something like update readme.md. That's descriptive. Okay, cool. You updated the readme.md. But it doesn't really help when 400 commits say update readme.md and you need to find the bit. one that broke stuff. Yeah, so Matt being much loves more those messages, by the way, y'all. He <laughs> loves them. Grinds my gears, breaks it's his my heart, favorite. makes me run around in circles. Can't stand it. Uh, so good commit messages matter. In the case of an issue, good titles matter because there is no commit message. So this is very direct. We're going to plan the Everybody hang on. Something just went wrong. Lost, yeah, Matt says we lost the audio. Can you still hear me? I'm now? muted. I'm back. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Z it was oh, uh, Patrick. <laughs> hey, hey, careful. This is online now. <laughs> um, yeah, Those of okay. you in the future that are watching it, today is February uh, 24th. Look it up. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, we got the screen sharing back. We did. Does everybody see it okay? You see it, Lola? I'm going to just take two seconds to repopulate my oh, pain. Whatever, here. Lola. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody. Cool. Awesome. Wow. What a fun time that was. So technology mm -hmm. is wonderful, uh, which is why we need super solid, direct titles for things so that we know what 
we were working on when things broke. Okay. Yep. So in the case of an issue, this is this is really helpful. Now, it's if I want to know what this issue is going to look like, I can hit preview. Okay, no problem. And you'll notice I threw some emojis in. Why? Well, culture. That's why. It is about the fact that we need to convey as much intent is possible and we also have to read with positive intent this type of stuff shouldn't be burdening work it should all be lightweight enjoyable stuff that we're working on so in this case i threw a couple emojis this is what it's going to look like when it renders i also since brooks is a collaborator i can at mention him and if you remember yesterday on the, this this watch thing if he has his mentions turned on he's going to get an alert in his email. He's also going to get an alert up in the notifications panel that, hey, Brooks, I at mentioned you. It also means that in two weeks, when Brooks hasn't responded to this issue, he can't say he didn't know. Did not know. Did not right? Know. He can't say it because I said, hey, I, I mentioned you directly. So once I submit this, he's going to get a ping. It's going to be a good time. There's another thing I think I'm going to set up before I submit this issue, and I'm going to add a label to it because there happens to be a default label of documentation, but I also want another label and this label doesn't exist yet. So I'm actually going to type it in right here. And this is going to be um, external contribution. And so I'm going to make this label because I want to give people the opportunity if they create issues in the repository later to add this label to say, hey, like I would like to use this as an external contribution. And the Notice idea here is, is that as you're looking through your issues, these tags, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm an AWS engineer and I scream tags all day long. You tag everything. This gives us, when we get into issues, the ability to quickly find things. Like I don't know if you remember seeing it from yesterday, Matt will show us in a second. But that's the point of tagging so we can see categories quickly of what the issues are about. Exactly. And since this didn't exist, we get a button that says create new label. So if I just create that, it's going to pop up. I can give it a description. I can randomly generate the color. Um, let's pick something fun. That's not fun, but it'll work. Uh, and this is what the labels are going to look like. I don't have a project board set up. And I don't have it an assignee set up because, well, we don't have anybody to assign this task to yet. Um, however, it's the two of us, so we could kind of narrow that down if we really wanted to. But I'm going to hit submit. And now Brooks got a ping that says you've been at mentioned and we have an issue in the repository. And here's that view that Brooks was just talking about. We can quickly see, hey, this is what the, the title of the issue is. It's open. It's a documentation thing and it matters for external contribution. Click into that real quick, Matt, please. And that right there on my side, y'all, again, going back up to the bell, clicking on the bell, I get the notification that I've been, there's, you know, something has popped up, I click on it. And without having to go, oh, how do I get all of these issues? And rah, no, I just clicked on it. And boom, I'm sitting right there where Matt's at. So I'm right into the issue. I see what's going on, makes it super easy to collaborate. Exactly. I'll be able to show it to you from from this end. Um, although mine is messy. So I have to uh, have to work around that. Um, Cool. So we have this here. He got a ping. He knows that I'm ready to have a conversation with him. So it starts. And we'll wait for his reply. He's going to reply in some way, shape or form. And once he does, uh, or while he's doing that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to quickly set up a project board. So here's another great thing about this. This is asynchronous, right? I don't have to be blocked waiting on Brooks to answer me before I can do something. I'm off over here doing the next part of this while he's addressing what I sent over to him. So I'm gonna call this project planning because I'm nice and, and basic. I am uh, not gonna make this automated. I'm gonna create a project. I'm gonna add a column called needs triage. 
I'm going to create another one called in progress. And you can name these whatever you want. And I'm going to call this one done. Now, the reality of it is, if this wasn't a boot camp, I might have 15 columns up here, right? I might have like a ready for review column. I might have a backlog column. I might have uh, a blocked column. I might have uh, some other tier of triage column. You never know. It, every project is different. But for demo's sake, we don't, we don't need anything super crazy. So while we wait on him, as we still wait on him, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add this to the project. Oh, so look at that. It just popped right up there, didn't that? See that? Without even doing anything. I'm going to hit project planning. It's going to add, and it's a waiting triage, which means I can then drop it in the column. So I'm going to say, hey, needs triage. And here's Brooks. He commented, awful. It's trash. Okay. If I come over here and I refresh my notifications, here it is right here. I have a mention in this repository. Uh, it doesn't say who mentioned, but I can see who is a part of the repository. And if I just click on that, it takes me right to the mention of I'm trash because Brooks is a nice guy. So <laughs> Awful uh, here we are on that. Awful idea. Um, we've added this to triage. So I'm simply going to say this. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to respond to him with uh this because haha that's funny and i'm gonna say at brooks great i've added this to the project board um after break let's triage it there we go and by the way y'all this is this is happening very chattish between he and i between what i'm seeing in my browser and what he what y'all are seeing in his browser right now without me mucking around or doing anything i just it's updating, updating, updating. And so it becomes, you know, it's it's a great way to communicate. And it's really, the thing about this as a tool is it's transparent. It just gets out of our way and lets us talk. And you'll see in the project board, since I added that to the issue, it's it's already in the need triage category and it's waiting for us uh, for yep. when we get back from our super wonderful break. for a few of you have and that's implementing a git flow strategy for your projects and in this section we are going to talk about branch strategy what branches are um and just some of the ways that you can pull this off now go back to the very first day very first 30 minutes we we set some expectations and i set this magical expectation that says i can't solve your problems i have no idea what magical recipe you need to solve your project's problems, which also means I don't know what branch strategy is right for you. I'm gonna show you a very basic branch strategy to teach you the concept of branches and show you the benefit of branches. Um, it's probably not enough for a giant web application it's going to be way more than enough for some documentation stuff. And it's probably going to fall somewhere in the middle of, if you're working on a small like personal project or a project with four or five people, it's probably enough. Um, so let me go ahead and move some stuff out of my way really quick so I can get a super uber fancy drawing tablet. And I would say this, y'all, this is, this is the thing that gets people trying to understand branching. And all that sort of stuff. So this is something to really just let it go right into your brain here. So the way we're going to go about this is I'm going to draw some pictures for you. Plot twist. I am an instructor, not an artist. Matter of fact, I'm a bad instructor when it comes to being an artist. I don't even do stick figures well. Here we so go. So what we're going to do is I'm going to diagram <laughs> this out for you. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't end up being like crazy cryptic and, and horribly written uh the keyboard has taken away my ability to do handwriting um so and then i'll come back into the repo and we'll show you how we apply that concept using github okay so hopefully that makes sense um so we have our our fancy little screen here and hopefully these are thick enough i've never used this program so we'll see let's say we have 
this wonderful file. And this is file A, right? I'm super fancy on this. So this is file A. And file A lives on a branch. And that branch is called main. Okay? Main is the, the branch that we're used to seeing, right? We come up here. It says we're on branch main, man. Read me is right here. A is a whole lot easier to write than read me, though. So bear with me. All right? We have file A. We have a couple things that we need to do. And in our current case, we're trying to create file B. And the way Brooks is saying is he's going to create file B. B as in boy. Thank Oh, Here we yeah. Go. File ET is what Brooks is going to create. Apparently. And he's saying that, hey, I, I just saved that file or commit. We're going to say C for commit. We'll put com. Right? I commit that file directly to main. That's right. So now that file is living right next to file A. This program really hates quick Bs. Uh, it's, it's living right next to, to file A. Now, in a documentation project, is this a problem? Not really. There's nothing that can break in this scenario. If there was automation attached to main, like mm -hmm. spinning up new environments or changing and altering resources, then this is a bad idea because it could break. If there was software like... Uh, or, or an app, a web app like GitHub deployed off of main, this is a terrible idea. And you should be strung up by your feet uh, for 25 minutes at a minimum screaming, I will not commit to main over and over and over again until you never commit to main again. Um, terrible idea, don't do it. The bigger issue is this is a bad habit. And we all have gotten into it because if you have limited GitHub experience, you've worked on your namespace a lot. And if you commit to main, and if you break your own projects, you probably don't care. But when we're talking about collaboration, this is a really big, 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 big issue. And if you do this, you are not in any way, shape or form actually benefiting from using GitHub. So this idea, of committing directly to main is bad. Oh, Don't do it bad. ever. But it's so easy, Matt. Okay. So listen, we're gonna we're gonna start a little campfire. We're gonna grab some candles. Oh. We're gonna stand around the campfire, and we're all gonna chant. I will not commit to main. I will not commit to main. Okay, please don't do it. But I want to talk about my feelings about committing to main. This is not a safe space when we commit to main. Okay. <laughs> now, don't be don't be silly, right? What is main? Well, main is a friendly name given to the default branch. So in some ways, actually, in some ways, could we almost say that's release? No. No, never. It's main. Oh, see, I knew they're very good. Tell why why not? What we'll is get the, there. What, what do we, There's a what strategy are we talking about? in play. Okay. Right? So main is, is often <coughs> what's called the default branch. It doesn't have to be. You can name your default branch whatever you want to name it, but it is what you've probably heard in DevOps space, trunk. Okay? The default branch is trunk, right? In DevOps, we say that all the time. Commit to trunk, commit to trunk, whatever. Main is just a friendly name for that. So anytime you're doing the Brook Seahorn commit method, yeah. to the default branch or to trunk or to main, and in some cases, cats, you should scold yourself because you're wrong. Okay. And I'm not going to tell you you're wrong often. And I said, I can't give you a recipe. But if you do this, the recipe is you're wrong. Stop doing it. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad that. We agree. Creates. All right. So let's talk about the right way to do this. Here's my branch. 
It's lovely. This is Maine. Okay. Maine has a file on it. Doesn't matter. It has tons of files. It has 100 files. It has 4,000 files. It has zero files. Don't really care. It has stuff on it. Okay. If I want to make a change to Maine, notice how I didn't say in the last example that changes to Maine are bad because they're not. Commits to Maine are bad. Right? Changes to main need to happen. We need to edit files. We need to make changes. We need to add stuff, remove stuff, fix bugs, create better documentation. These are things we need to do. It's called work. Crap. They got us again, dude. We're working. I know, right? Um, dang. So it's called work. It has to happen. It didn't say you can't change main. It said you're not allowed to commit to main. And honestly, GitHub blocks this from happening happening it's called branch protection and i know that's spelled all kinds of weird here uh, but protection it's called branch protection and it stops you it prevents you it does not allow you to commit to main if it's configured here is the problem with branch protection it's an enterprise feature mm. or a paid org feature. Okay. Remember the catch? What's the catch? This is one of them. Okay. Unless the repo is public. Okay. We can enable a limited set of branch protections on public repositories, even if we're not an org and all that good stuff. But it is limited. So we can stop commits from main and we can even force reviews and other things. So let's look at a real strategy. I have main. And at the same point in time, here's a point in time, Genesis for our repository. I create another branch. Okay. This is going to be called dev, right? Are we working with me or features or whatever. Dev works. All of our changes are going to take place here. Um, main is going to be like the, the tell all source of truth. The I shouldn't change unless I know the world is golden and peachy for me. Dev, however, is where work happens. Okay. Now, dev has everything that main has at the time the branch was created. So let's take a look at this. We have a readme, correct? We have no branches other than main. If I click here, I look at main. I also see that it's that fancy word, the default branch. Everybody's tracking a hope. If I create a new branch called dev, it's created from main. Now we're on dev. Well, it has a readme. Well, guess what main has? A readme. And these files are in sync. So essentially, what is dev? Well, from a GitHub for everybody point of view, it's just a copy. Oh my God, this program hates Man. circles. Did you test drive this thing? This thing is just not one. No, to I found a web one for Linux and it, it is what oh, it is. Oh, that's right. Because yeah, I'm also you're on pumping my external stylus in through a VM. So I just think it's a little bit. Yeah, laggy. yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So it's essentially a copy of main from that point in time when the branch was created. Okay. We can think about it like that. So now if I want to work on, we'll call it a feature. Here's a third branch. Like our contributing MD file. We're just going to name this C. I need to create a branch off of dev to do that. So that's exactly what I am going to do. So I have dev selected. Watch what happens if I try to do this from main. 
I'm going to say this is contrib md file. Notice how I named my branch very deliberately. This branch is going to be us working on the contributors and our contribution md, right? It's a very deliberate name. But look down here. It says create the branch from main. That's not exactly what I just said we were going to do, right? Nope, not at all. Shucks. How do we fix that? Well, we delete it. We switch to the dev branch. And now we type the same thing. Contrib md file, whatever. From dev. So now this has changed. So we are going to branch from dev if I click this button. Boom. Well, it looks like these are the same. This branch is up to date with main. Uh, that's interesting. If we click on, on dev, it's up to date with main. Fine. It's not really easy for us to tell where this branch came from. When we look at this in, in these views, right? We can't see so much that this got branched from dev. So yeah, I was going to say, like, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, like right now, just me looking at it, just let me dump any knowledge I have about GitHub. Does everybody notice that? It's really tough to figure out where we are right now. Yep. All we have is this branch. So, what do we do about it? Well, we make it very clear what our branch strategy is for projects. And this is, there's no way to, to find that information quickly and easily on GitHub. So it's a matter of discipline and it's a matter of understanding what your team's branch strategy is. Document it. That's the best thing I could say is document it somewhere. So here we are at this point in time. We've created a branch for a feature, which in our case is the contributors MD. What we are gonna do is we are going to add stuff, text, right? We're gonna build that file. And when we are ready, we are going to open what is called a pull request from the feature branch into the dev branch. Does everybody now, get that, that feature branch, dev branch? If you're not familiar with GitHub and you start to get a little paranoid when you start hearing people go a million miles an hour talking about, well, there's a feature branch that we're working on right now, and you hear those sorts of terms, it ain't no big thing. That's all it is. It's just another branch. Don't let stuff like that freak you out when you hear it. That's what it is. Isn't it simple? It's really, it's just, and like Matt said, this is about discipline. This is about making sure you're following a process. And when you do that, as you'll see in a moment, just how easy it is, it keeps things really clean. So we are going to open a pull request from feature to dev, right? Because remember, main is like, our gold standard mm -hmm. we only ever merge into main <clears throat> once we know that dev is stable like all like we're, we're stable with our changes we've ran our tests or whatever now i'm kind of mixing the hey this is documentation with hey this is a developer practice too right so like ci and, and deploying out and monitoring health for the first day or two before saying everything is fine happens probably off of dev for you it doesn't it's going to happen off of a release branch but i'll show you that um so we're going to open a pull request and pull request is simply a request that you pull my changes from the feature into the branch that i want them in this is where collaboration on work begins in this pull request okay is this the part, the kind of Matt, where I'm kind of saying, hey, I want to have a conversation about some changes I'd like to make? Yep, that's one of the things that's going to happen here. And it's also mm -hmm. going to be where you actually make the changes, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about changes. We'll both implement changes. The whole team will jump on the project and work on it. It's often not one person writing a document. It's often not one person working on source code or a feature. And this is where we can do that together. Okay, so to finish this flow for you, before I show you how this works, when we are ready and we have merged that into dev, 
and dev has decided so we're merged back into dev right here and and the development branch has gone through its tests and it has decided that everything is fine and our team agrees that we're going to have a release we are going to create a release branch from dev which contains a copy of everything from main and everything from the feature branch at this point in time. And we will release this out. Once we do our monitoring and all of our health checks and everything, and we've decided that the release is stable, then release does a double merge back to dev and back to main so that now these are equal. And wow. this branch is deleted because the feature has been rolled in. That is a very basic, oh, and then release is deleted. You don't need it anymore. You're already deployed. So then you rinse and repeat. I copy to the feature or to the dev branch. I create my feature branch. I merge into the dev branch. I merge into release and then release pops into main and dev and goes away. So let, let, let me go, let me back it up just a second, Matt, to make sure I'm right. So we've got a main branch. We got a dev branch. We could have feature branches. We could actually have a lot of feature branches out there, couldn't we? You could have an unlimited number of branches because guess what they cost, Brooks? A um, hundred and free. A hundred and free dollars. Exactly, exactly right. So when I'm doing this and I'm coming off main, let's say like we're just talking about documentation. So right now we've got our readme file up there in main. We're going to go into dev and we're going to add this contributing markdown file. And let's say it's got eight or nine sections in it. Could each of those sections be looked at as a feature? You could. Um, I would argue that something like that is really small and mm -hmm. you're creating mm -hmm. more work than you need to, to have each section be a feature. Mm -hmm. What, what is better to have happen is each section be a commit, which is an ah. individual save point to that file, which we'll talk okay. about as we do it. Yes. Um, where the file itself is the feature. Now, that being said, features should be deliberate, right? A login button is a feature. The entire login form is probably a feature, but the entire login page is probably bigger than a feature, right? You you're probably have a base page kind of template that you're going to slap a form on top of. Maybe, I don't know what your project looks like, but features should be small and deliberate and self-encapsulating to the point where if you needed to remove the feature, does everything else break? Think about it like that. Because what you can always do is roll back. That's the advantage of branches. It's a little outside of the scope of welcome to GitHub for everybody, but features shouldn't change 400 files. Features shouldn't change six files, most likely. Features should focus on just their feature. So if yep. I'm thinking about it from a developer point of view, I might have a config file that changes. I might have a test file that changes, and I might have a source code file that changes for a feature, maybe two or three source code files that change. Right, yep. a couple of JavaScript files, the tests for it, and uh, configuration if I need to. Right, yep. exactly. That's, that's probably it. That's a feature. Okay, it's not you know the front end or the back end. Let's update the API and build the login screen. Right, but, it, it's not that. It's small, deliberate changes, um, and then to a file, we'll talk about commits because that that better goes yep. into where you're after. In fact, y'all, there's Matt's doing something here, and I hope you're catching it. He's really setting us up for like the pro level DevOps situation. Those features that Matt's talking about, those are where? Those are items in the backlog. Yep. Those are <laughs> items in the backlog. How do we make sure that we're being good developers as we write code? One of the most important things you can do is modularization, okay? It's the sort of thing where I can make a change to one thing and I don't break the world. And that's exactly what Matt just taught us. That feature right there that you see on the screen, that's one little modular piece tied to a backlog item, okay? <laughs> Going right back to your backlog that allows all this stuff to roll together. So you can see that what's, what's, and this is one of the things that Matt was teaching me about this that I kind of grin about quite a bit. It's almost like if you implement this correctly, it helps to reinforce proper programming etiquette 
design, paradigm, it, whatever word you want to do. Let's just call it the right way, okay? That's what helps enforce this is following the sort of branching strategy he's showing us here. Exactly. Um, fun fact, GitHub Pro, uh, Insider Pro Tip, that release branch thing I showed you here, GitHub never, ever deploys from main. There are a Ooh. bunch of other branches that deployed. Main is, oh shoot, we need to recover our platform because something really, 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 really bad happened. Ooh. Now, hold on. Let's talk for, let's talk for a second here because that's really interesting. So then main becomes like a, a restoration point. Like if everything blows up, like if we have to scrape down to nothing, we've got to start over. That's what main's for. Our pushing though is coming from these release branches where we're pushing back to dev, but we're, but we're also pushing to main, right? So that main's up to date, but then the actual push to the world, that is whatever feature I just pushed the iPhone iOS app, that's coming out of that branch right there. Is that right? Yep. So we, wow. we wow. deploy from release and we monitor and we make sure it's stable and main is always <coughs> stable. Okay. Now, hold on, hold on. Stop right there. Everybody, goodness gracious. What just went by you was a truck. If you didn't catch it. When we talk about the best performing DevOps organizations in the world, one of the things they have absolutely on their side is their mean time to recovery. It's called MTTR. Matt just showed you one of the tricks to it right there. You deploy from the feature branch. You keep an eye on what's going on. When the world freaking blows up, guess what do we do? What do we do, Matt? Got to roll it back, man. And then what have we got to roll it back from? Main. Wow. So that's, that's from kind of a developer point of view. Now, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to delete some branches, okay? Because we're going to pull this away from developer and DevOps space back to GitHub for everybody. And this is too much for what we're trying to do, okay? So to do that in GitHub, you there's this little branch icon next to the, the dropdown for the branch selection. And you can click on that branch and then you have trash cans over here. So I'm going to delete this and I'm gonna delete this. So now I'm down to one branch. But what's interesting about this is if I click the, if I go back into the branches and I click the all branches tab, oh, they removed it. You used to be able to see all the unused or the all the old branches for history. Oh, darn it. They did I change know. that, didn't Oh, they? well, skip that. Forget I said that, rewind. <laughs> darn all it. Right. So let's talk about something that makes sense for not <laughs> developers. Now, look, that's what I just covered is one branch strategy for maybe code. The truth of the matter is your, your strategy is probably much, much more involved than that, right? It's probably main and then a dev branch from which we pull. Fee Actually, I'll draw it a little different. I'll draw it a little different. Some of you guys are going to benefit from this. So this is still the dev example. Okay. We have our main branch. And from that. We have a development branch and somewhere along the line, we develop a feature and then we merge that back in. We might develop another feature and merge that back in. We might develop another feature and merge that back in. And now we're ready for release. So we pump to the release branch and maybe that release goes to a test environment. So maybe we pump a second branch out to prod or whatever it might be, right? And then we decide which one to merge back into main and back into dev, whatever it might be. You might have A, B testing scenarios and stuff. And those branches are going to come off of development prior to hitting release. Like maybe you, you hit staging and then from staging, you go to release. I don't know what your strategy is. The point being in all of these scenarios, we still haven't merged or committed to main, right? That's, that's the important piece. So let's drive this back to the non-dev. We still like you. You're still included. The everyone part. We have our main branch. Also known as our stable branch. Stable right? Shouldn't change. But we don't need this extra later 
of branches for what we're doing, especially on the documentation front. So we are going to just have feature branches. So if I'm going to work on a contributing MD, I'm going to create a feature branch. I'm going to make my changes to my file. And when I am ready and I have approvals, I'm going to open the pull request from the feature branch back into main. For your personal projects, for your small time work, for your non super technical stuff, this is the bare minimum scenario. No commits to main ever. Only pull request merges. Ever. So would you recommend, uh, Matt, ever. For all of us that are doing this, even when we're just mucking around, just do this, just branch, update. I mean, it, it, we're going to end up, we're going to end up approving our own feature, uh, our own uh, feature and pull request. But isn't this just like the way to do it? And it's just the yes. right habit to have. And because it's it's this, right? This is the reason. I made a change to this file. So this file <laughs> now lives here on main. Maybe in this file, I committed a password. Whoops. We need that to go away. We can just recover this branch back into its spot and delete the history and do some other magic and we can make that go away again this is stable it allows us to react to bad things happening so even so you're not immune in a small project to accidentally uploading a password you're not immune to putting your credit card number on github you're not immune to misclicking you're not um, like none of that stuff. You're human, right? So you're going to get caught up. Most of you, there might be a weird lizard person or something. That's okay. What a high five. Um, but most of us are human and mistakes are going to happen. You are doing yourself a favor by creating the lifeline of a stable main branch and protecting that at all costs. Cool. Okay. Let's go take a look. As a matter of fact, in our settings down in branches and we'll see what we can get with a pro account on a public repo okay look at this branch protection rules to disable force pushing protect branches from being deleted like our development branch and require status checks before merging what this means is if brooks or somebody was trying to tr or even me the owner was trying to merge a pull request back into main with failing tests or without approval, it would be blocked and it would not be able to happen. So you can prevent this from happening on accident and you should. So let's do that. Let's add a rule. Branch name. Um, we're going to say main because that's the name of the branch that we want to protect. Require a pull request before merging. When enabled, all commits must be, named, must be made on a non-protected branch and submitted via pull request before they can be merged into a branch. Done. Now, guess what? You can't commit to main. Not going to happen. Never going to be allowed. It's just not going to happen. So you just made it easy on yourself. The next time you try to accidentally do it, GitHub's going to tell you fat chance and you're going to be just fine. So required approvals. This is a fun thing. If I don't check this, I can merge without somebody giving me a thumbs up. Okay. So that means uh, let's just enable this and I'll show you what that looks like. We'll start with one thing. So we'll come back to code. Um, if I try to make an edit to this, and I come down here, it shouldn't let me. I might because I'm like super admin. It lets me, of course. How dare you? I knew we weren't going to get away with everything. Why didn't you? Oh, because it's coming from a branch. Sorry. Yep. 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 Uh, require side commits. It's not here. There is a way to prevent it. And I forget exactly what it is 
Um, you can absolutely lock this down somehow. It's in there, I promise. Yeah. You might have to dig in the docs, but you can absolutely lock this down. Um, you can do things like requiring conversations, sign commit. Man. Dude, it's there somewhere. We'll have to look that up, everybody, on our next one. We'll find it for you. Yeah, I know it's I know it's a thing. And it also could be uh not in enterprise. Like that might be one of the features I don't get not being an enterprise. Oh yeah, yeah, so that's true. That's possible. So let's take a look at it though. I'm gonna do a different edit because that's silly. Let's look at where we're at. I'm gonna create a new branch. And what's cool is like I can create one on the fly here. It's a very bad name. And now we're at that pull request phase where it's saying open a pull request. And it's asking to take our branch, our compare branch, the one that we just made our changes on, our feature branch, and move it into main, the base branch. We would use a title and we would put a good commit message, which we will when we demo this real time. <laughs> That's terrible. It is. It is. And see, now it's, it's doing stuff. I could go and set up my continuous integration right here. I can set up my approvals or whatever, you'll see that I don't have any requested reviewers or anything like that. And now when I merge that, I can delete the branch because I don't need it. And my changes have made it into main. That, that little piece was deleted. And I can see the history that, hey, like I merged the pull request number two, which shows me the files that were changed. And we'll get into that in a minute into main and that's what happened at this point in history and we're going to dive really deep into this here in a moment so if i'm going a little quick don't don't fret we'll get, we'll get there yeah, we're definitely going to come back to that because that's that's a really cool thing right there that's a, a super yeah, don't worry, critical we'll come back to it so um that was a relatively worthless branch protection for our situation so let's go ahead and edit this again Wait, what was that back there? Default brand. Oh, okay, cool, fine. We're going to make this a little bit more blocking. So we're going to say required approvals. So this means somebody has to physically approve the pull request or else it will not let us merge. Required number of approvals before merging. We're going to say one. And, and on enterprise, you're allowed to make it to where uh, you can't be your own approval, okay? But since this isn't a personal namespace, that's kind of silly. So if we did the same situation, uh, I'm going to make an edit. Not, not up there, down here. I'm going to create a branch. And I'm going to open the pull request. Notice how it automatically goes to opening a pull request. This is a conversation that, that comes up a lot is, well, when do I open a pull request for a branch? Well, in this case, GitHub is suggesting that on the very first change, you open the pull request. And there's a reason for that. And we'll show you as we demo. But now you'll see this. Review required. You need at least one approval with somebody that has right access to the repository, so a collaborator. And merging is blocked. If I try this, it warns me because I'm the owner and I'm in um, personal namespace that I have to very deliberately use my administrator powers to do this without an approval. And it's actually going to tell everybody that I did that, right? So it's going to call me out for doing this. And that's okay sometimes, but I can't accidentally merge without that approval. Now. I'm gonna hit cancel quickly. And if I were to add Brooks as a reviewer, guess what just happened? This updated to pending reviewer and Brooks just got a notification that yes, says you've been requested for review. And to, to do that, it's a little bit tricky. And he's gonna go into this files change tab and there's gonna be a review changes button and he's gonna to have to hit approve and then submit review essentially in order for it to approve. And it's a really, we'll get, we'll show you that four or five more times, but it's really in depth and, and difficult to find at times.
So once that review comes in, this will unblock itself. Okay. So that is how we can protect main branches and enforce this branch strategy idea. And we did it in this format. So this is enough for small things. I wouldn't build an application this way. Like if I was working on like my personal portfolio, I would do it like this. That's fine. If I was working on um, INE.com or whatever, like I probably would uh, have a much better, more robust brand strategy than that, right? Because there's customers involved. It's not just me and my personal portfolio. So we're still seeing here. So you got the eyes. Does everybody see the eyes? Little. He's looking at it. He's taking emoji. a look. I'm looking at it right now. So while he's poking around at that, if we go back into these, these protection rules, we'll just take another look at these. There are some cool things like um, requiring that those any continuous integration you set up passes, but this is another good one. Required or review from code owners. Code owners is like the contributing MD. It's a very special file that just is a list of usernames. And it says like these people like own the code here. So it's somebody from that list would have to approve the project. Now that's really helpful if you're doing intra team or inter team community like collaboration. If we were going to have the production team uh, open pull requests into our instructor project, that we're probably not going to allow them to approve their own pull requests. And it's not that we don't like them. It's just, we know where our direction with the project we're working on is, and they're a collaborator, not an owner. So we would set ourselves up as, you know, somebody on our team would need to approve their pull request, even though we fully welcome it a hundred percent of the time. So I'm reviewing over here. Everything looks good to me. And I've got three options, y'all. I can do a comment, approve, or request changes. Yep. Now you can request see right changes there. will force me to make a change, right? Mm -hmm. It'll block merging until I make the change. Comment will just have a conversation with me and approve says everything looks good to me. Go ahead and, and merge that. And it'll unlock my ability to merge. So what I'm going to do right over here is I'm going to put an LGIMO looks good in my opinion. I've chose approve and I'm going to hit submit review. And you'll see this here, uh, they, uh, it seems like they've just moved the interface. So sorry if this seems crazy. As I mentioned, this is constantly being updated. Um, I cannot click approve on my own review. It says pull request authors can't approve their own pull request. So there's, there's always UI changes with, with GitHub, which is a good thing, right? So it looks good in my opinion. And you'll see I have an approval. I can see who approved it. Right. And so what you might want to do is if you're working in a bigger team, require two approvals. That's what we always did at GitHub. You had to have two approvals and you could see who approved it. So now when I merge this and it breaks something, blood's on Brooke's hands, not mine. Mm, mm, mm. Very interesting. And there we go. So I can delete the branch because the files were, were merged into main and there's our change. And I'm seeing everything that just happened over here on my side as well, y'all. As I'm sitting on this, as he merged, as the branch disappeared, I see that update automatically. So if you're in a managerial role, if you're just trying to watch the project, as those things are clicked in, you can see real time exactly what's going on. Right. So we, are, what we're going to do before our next break, really quick, is we are going to start our work. So we had our team meeting. We agreed Brooks and I are going to take this in progress. So what I am going to do is I am going to take our Git flow, which means create a branch, edit a file, and open a pull request to stage us and get us ready to contribute on the work. And it, this is going to take, it's going to be this fast. I'm going to do it a little different. I'm going to let GitHub create the branch for me. Now, if I had this on my computer, I would need to use Git and I can say like Git branch create or whatever the command is off the, or what I forget off the top of my head. I think it's Git uh, use, branch use, dash B, use, whatever. Use GH at Goober. <laughs> I don't use GH because I automate a lot of my Git prop or my Git uh, commands yeah, and pipelines. True. And yeah. GH is a, a GitHub tool that wraps. So it's not always yeah. available. Yeah. For, um, for those of you who are wondering what, what the nerds here were going on about, from the command line, you can use git, G-I-T. 
but uh, GitHub also has their own command, uh, command line tool set called GH that uh, I kind of like it. It's pretty cool. It's their CLI. Yep. Um, and, and there you go, like, you know, GH issue list, like list all the issues for the branch that we're sitting on right now. There's also an, another one. Um, if you're interested in alternative tools, um, it's called Git Flow. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. I think this is it. Yeah, they have a tool that like does the auto branching and stuff like when you do stuff. So Git Flow is a, is a tool that you can use. But these are alternative tools. I don't use them. I use Git because I automate a lot of stuff. And yep. you could with this. Uh, by the way, for those of you keeping score, the GitHub CLI is written in Go. Uh, oh, so God. Oh, that's that. it. We so, have to take a break. So we're gonna let um we're gonna let GitHub create the branch for me, and I can do that really easily by getting my keyboard back in place. And what I can do is I've been editing the README. I'm actually gonna add a new file. So I'm gonna add a file. I'm gonna create a new file. And remember where we said this one was gonna live in .github, and then I'm gonna type slash, and it's named contributing.md. Guide for contributions. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to make this small change. This is what it's going to look like before our break. I'm going to come into this and I have two choices commit directly to main. And again, through advanced security features and in organizations and teams, this will be disabled or create a new branch. And in mm -hmm. here, I can rename it to add contrib MD. If I do this, GitHub now created that branch for me automatically. I didn't have to do any magic. It did it for me. And now it opened a pull request. And I'm going to say this, P or add contributing MD to the project, right? I titled the pull request for what it is. Um, this PR creates and adds a dot github slash contributing md file to the repo mm -hmm. now useful body information i when i reference this in six months i'm going to know exactly what the purpose of this pull request is very deliberate just like building application features everything we do from titles is very deliberate now what I didn't do that was deliberate is my first commit wasn't deliberate and it was disgusting. And I'll show you that as we go forward after break. And we are back everyone. Hey, hope you had a great little break there. Grab some coffee, whatever else you need as we move on in. So catch us back up. Where are we at right now, Matt? All right, at this point, we've had our team meeting. We decided that this is the task that we're gonna work on. This adding a, a contributing MD file. We have created a new branch to do that work so that we can protect main, which now has a .github folder, right? So if we look at main, you'll see there's no .github folder because these are not in sync anymore. The changes are happening over here on the contributing MD branch. And inside of there, we created a contributing MD file and we opened a pull request that says, I would like to merge that branch into main. And what Brooks and I are going to do on this or within this pull request is no longer have the discussion about the work. We are actually going to proceed with the work. But the first thing we're going to do before we do that is we're gonna link this pull request with the issue, okay? And just like down here, we have assignees. Well, we know Brooks and myself are working on this. So let's add ourselves as assignees. Um, we have no reviewers, but we need at least one review. So I opened the pull request. And as we learned, I can't be my own reviewer. So when we're ready for a review, we'll add that. We're going to add a label. Again, this is documentation. It's about external contributions. Let's go ahead and not add it to the project board. Rather, 
let's link it to the issue that is on the project board. So you'll see it comes down here. We could filter that issue if we just said one, which is where the issue numbers come in handy. We also only have one issue, so it shows up. And by linking that, if we, we see where it's at, it will also close the issue when we're done with the work. So we don't have oh. to go manually close that issue. So everything gets cleaned up automatically. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Absolutely. And you could take it a step further to automate the deletion of the branch once the merge is successful. Don't um, we get an option for that when we do this though? I think we do. Yeah, I think you can do a merge and delete, but you can yeah. force that at the org in, in uh, Enterprise. Okay. So we, we link that to the issue. Let's go look at our project board again, because this is where it gets pretty cool. Again, seat of a project manager or team member needing to view work in progress. Our card has changed a little bit. We now have this drop down that says linked pull request. So we can see the actual work that we are attempting to do, the discussion about what we were going to build. And then we can very quickly and easily see the work as it happens, as it is attached to this card. So from a visibility standpoint, I think we're looking really good. We could also see, hey, there's a review required on this. Um, it's open right now. We can tell because of the colors, which you'll get used to as you use the platform. Um, right away, we know that it's not just a card that's in work in progress. There's actual work taking place. We see who's working on it too, which is pretty good. So let's jump over back to our pull request. And now we can do some work. Um, if I want to see the file that has been changed, which is really beneficial, there's this files change tab. So I'm gonna click on that and it shows me something very important here. And this is gonna be more important as you have old files that you're working on. With new files, it's almost always green on the right side because you've done nothing but add things. With old files, if you remove things on this left-hand side, it'll be red. Uh, and on the right-hand side, it'll be green. And let me grab a URL really quick and I'll show you this. I'm gonna use this repo here as an example of some good and bad practices. Um, here we go. So here is an example. A dependency was updated in this file. And so the old version of the file was actions core was 1.2.0. And the new version of the file is actions core is 1.2.6. And that is the commit or the saved text to the file, okay? We'll come back to this, this repo. Um, I can see this on a, on a lot of things. Uh, if we click here, no, it doesn't want to show us the diff. The reason it's not showing the diff there is because that file is huge and it doesn't show us the diff on, it tries to keep it small. So here we go. This was just in addition. There was no deletion, just an addition up here, but a deletion down here. Okay. So we can see exactly what has changed from the past to the current thing that we want to save which is also called a commit. So every time we quote unquote save something, or as you saw when you edited things for the first time, like when you come in here and you edit, it says commit. That is exactly what you're doing. You are creating a hash value that points to a period in time of what is now different and forever until the end of time, we will be able to reference these changes all for the low, low price of 100% free. Okay, so super awesome. We can see what changed. So this is great. Need to hand a, a document to the legal department because somebody said that you're asking them to do tasks that weren't in the job description and you can prove that it was. Well, here's the point in time where you can prove that it was. Or maybe somebody suggests a change to the job description, like fixing 20 years of AWS to two years of AWS. You could see what got changed in that file by viewing a commit. And viewing a commit is really easy 
every time we do something, we get this little value over here that's called commit. That's the, the hash for the commit. If you just click into that, you will view the details of the commit. The other thing is you'll view the title of the commit. Commits, like you saw over here, right? This commit message, which it says create readme MD, right? Which would be wrong. If we update this, we're not creating the readme MD or we're not creating it. We're, we're updating the readme MD, right? So we might wanna change that to update, but even then that's a bad commit message. So what you're seeing here, and I'll show you how I got here from the code tab. There's this thing over here, right under the green box right here that says how many commits a repository has. If I just click on that, I end up in this space. Each one of these bold links is a commit message. So the commit message was adding Docker file name option. Somebody made a commit. This is a public contribution where they added some stuff to, to make this project better from their branch. And uh, I thought we could see that, but I guess not. Now, this is the part right here, Matt, where you and I were going on about yesterday about 10,000 line file. It's a document. It could be anything from code to, hey, this is going to be the new rules for our homeowners association. And it's got tons of lines in it. That's how you can use in GitHub super quick. Okay, what changed? Yep, exactly. You can just go see the commits. And if we scroll down enough, we're going to realize that um, there's this person that sometimes breaks good habits. You'll notice that since this was a personal project for me, I kind of slacked off on my commit messages. I said update main.js, update main.js, update main.js. But something clearly wasn't working because I have all these commits that say update main.js. So which one is the right one or which one is the problem? And this is why having good commit messages matters. Because if I was hunting for the problem, I would need to click into every single one of these wow. just to, to find out which one is the update main.js commit mm -hmm. that I actually care to look at. And if I would have just been more deliberate, for example, on this one, if I would have said commit message, change the core dot set valued value to not parse string literals or something, right? I could have given myself a much better Easter egg to come back to two years later as I look at this code again. I have no idea what update I made to J uh, main JS as I stand here in front of you today in front of my webcam creep uh so as, as i stand here I, I have no idea what update that is but <laughs> if i click on this bump actions core from one two to one two six and in this file specifically i don't even need to click that i know exactly what happened add docker file name option is getting better i don't know to what file or to where whereas add tag input to docker gpr action that is a really good commit message. I don't have to click into that. I know what that person did. We can click into it anyway, just yeah. to show you yeah. what they did, right? Notice how the line number, it might be hard to see because of dark mode, but the <laughs> line number starts at 12. It didn't show us lines one through 11 and it stops at 19. We don't know how many more lines are in this file. We kind of do, because we see other changes. There's over 70 lines in this file and we only see a small subset of them around the change that happened to right. Brooks's point, okay? Do not be surprised y'all in big organizations that use GitHub all the time to find situations where uh, there are like junior engineers, like folks that are fresh out of college, they go to do something like this, they put a bad message in there and the approver, their boss just declines it right there. Says, nope, forget oh, yeah. it. Just will absolutely trash it down. And honestly, um, I would suggest doing that yourselves. Like it sounds yeah. mean, yeah. but you're doing your team a favor by not allowing bad practices to exist. So honestly, like typically if you're co contributing on any of my personal projects and stuff like that, if you have bad commit messages, I reject you. If you have bad pull request bodies, like 
if I click into the pull request that you've submitted and it looks like this, I'm like, this is okay because it's very deliberate. But if, if it doesn't look good, like I'm going to deny it. What I want to see is something that I can go back to. So when we look at Panda's pull request, like this pull request is, is okay. There could be much more detail about it. So take the initial upfront investment build good commit messages, build good titles, supply good pull request and issue bodies. And it will save you hours, if not days later, uh, fixing stuff. Actually, I just saw something really cool. So we're going to click back into one. Here are all those checks. Remember, we looked at our branch protection rules and we said, hey, require checks to pass. These are all sorts of tests for their continuous integration that Pandas has built in. And all of these have to pass or else they cannot merge this pull request. So this looks daunting and it is genuinely it is. Uh, but if you have a production ready system, you're going to have these tests. And it's just, this is why we don't commit right to main because what if one of these tests failed, but we committed to main and main deployed everything out because we're reckless and we're doing what Brooks is doing. Then we have a bigger problem. Damn. If we just make sure CI passes on this branch, then we can go back into main. Exactly. So uh, yeah, that was a kind of an interesting thing. Same thing, this is, a, this is a contribution to pandas. I can click into the files changed and we see just what changed in this file. If I wanna see the whole file because I'm just absolutely crazy, I can do that by clicking this three little dots appear and hitting view file oops with one mouse button not both of them and now it's just taken me to that whole file from where it was committed and you'll see this file is 147 lines long but again to brooks's point we're only seeing the five or six lines that were affected the by ones the that change. matter right exactly <laughs> and, and by the way for those of you who are like learning python and stuff like that I hope you're seeing the idea, you know, that within GitHub, being able to set up branches and do things like that and fork things over, you can learn a lot of really good coding practices from yep. other people's repos. That's a super solid point, right? Like, let's say I, I use pandas because I know they have a big code base and they're public. So let's say I wanted to, to know about um, Python testing or something. I could mm -hmm. search through here and, and try to find where they keep their tests. It's probably in pandas testing and i could say oh like let's look at what the hypothesis pi is or whatever and i could see how python for a real big project is written another really cool use case for this is if you're a devops engineer and you want to know how to set up github actions and stuff click into the dot github folder <laughs> find the workflows folder and these are all things that are configured for workflows so a lot of these are part of the CI. See, this one says CI for the commit message. This is CI for the commit message, which is showing up right here. So if we looked at, uh, let's find one that does something simple. Let's try this code checks. Here we could see exactly what they did to write some automation using GitHub Actions. And we're breezing through this because we're going to jump into it a little later. But yep. if you needed to know how to do this, you could very quickly look up into their files. And not you only even that, you can, could, you can take it a step further. What's that? Actually click into the actions tab and find an, an executed run and look at the log output of their run and mm -hmm. really click into it to find out what happened in the pandas environment. See that, that right there is awesome, y'all. That is awesome. You can literally dive right in to their commits to see what happened. The point of it being, you poke around in this a little bit and you're in an organization that's not using GitHub or maybe you're trying to get them to use GitHub. You're trying to figure out an action. Well, somebody may have already written it. Go check out Panda, see what they did. Grab the code. Good coders are lazy coders. Cool, so let's digress. Let's get back to work, Brooks. We've diverted quite enough. Yep, we um, got to do this now. We need to start editing this file. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click files changed from the uh, from the the pull requests. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to do something really snazzy. So simmer down here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and 
come over to view and I can edit it right from this pull request. So we're gonna edit. I must be on a branch. How am I not on a branch? Okay, so we can edit it. And I'm gonna say um, to contribute, please visit this link. HTTPS colon slash slash nowhere.com. That's probably real. So nowhere.xyz, which is also probably real. Um, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna make a good commit message, added the link to actual contribution uh, site um, in the contributing.md. Uh-oh, you gotta have limited characters. You can add it into this, this mm -hmm. bigger description if you want. Um, so we're just gonna trim it down. We're going to commit it directly to the branch we've created, not to main. And we're not going to create a new branch because that's not our branch strategy. We're going to commit these changes and bam. Now, if we go back to the pull request, we see that, hey, recently I've done this. I've, I've, I've added this commit here. Um, so if Brooks <coughs> wanted to know what Matt just added, he could just click this right within the pull request. And just like before, he's going to see that this block was added. So here's the thing. I made a typo. So from Brooks's point of view, he could go in and check it and check it out. So what I can say is uh, I could say something like this. Hey, Brooks, um, I added what I think is the proper line. Can you take a look? Okay. Right. What's going to happen? He's going to get notified, right? He's going to go in there and he's going to click the files change tab and he's going to notice that there is a typo and he has a couple options. If he just clicks the, this blue box, this blue plus sign, he can write a comment that says, Hey man, uh, you got a typo here. You might want to fix it. And when he does that, it'll show up. And we'll give him a second to get there. Cool. Yeah. So now what's really sweet is that pull request just updated. And look, it put his, his response kind of in a thread of, of what we're talking about. So he's saying, whoa, like you messed up here. He's showing me the line where, where the problem was. Um, and I could respond back to him and I could be like, are you sure? Like, I think maybe you're a little bit crazy or I could, I think it'll work here. Yeah. There's this, there's this little icon right here. That's like a plus minus on a page and it's a suggestion and it's really cool. Watch what happens. Um, I can change that. And if I hit comment, now this little drop down box comes up to actually commit that live. And I can say, hey, um, is the above better? If it is, go ahead and commit those changes. And if I comment that, now we're having a conversation about this one specific block of text that we're talking about. So Brooks just got notified. He's gonna go in, he's just gonna click that drop down and hit commit changes. Now, hopefully Brooks has been paying attention and he puts a good commit message, right? And we always care about that. So we'll see how I do. We'll see how I do. We'll see. <laughs> Whoops, hang on. It doesn't sound good. No, it's not going good. It's not going well <laughs> at all over here. It's going pretty bad. Yeah, but the thing is, is that, you know, at this point, I'm looking at this, I can see all the conversations that are going on. I can still, even at this point, um, you know, pop back messages. Yep. And I get this view changes button so I can see what, yes. what Brooks changed. It also shows up here. You can see that we're having this whole thing. Um, so he went with looking good. That's fine. This is a very organic interaction. So, hey, he says looks good. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say um, fix typo <coughs> Pardon me. in our online four, right? Better commit message. I hit commit. 
this changes and our conversation goes away, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. You'll notice it says show resolve. It just gets folded up so we can always view what we talked about in the history, but it collapses it just to make it a little better. Since we've resolved what Brooke says comment was about, it just folds it up for us. So we can come back to files change. It folded it up up here and we have this good to go. All right. Enough of your nonsense. I'm approving this thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm turns approving. Out, turns out. Um, hey, Brooks. Oh. Turns out um, our manager, he who has no name, uh, decided that you, well, that's a markdown specifically, specifically should add out some real steps to contribute. Um, can you make that happen by Friday, Feb 900 or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna comment on that. So what have we done? We just built kind of chain of custody of responsibility here right? Hey, like this came down from this person um, that they request you to do this thing. So now when Brooks doesn't do that thing, we have proof that Brooks dropped the ball, which is fine. People get busy. But when Brooks does this thing three days early, we have proof that Brooks is an overachiever. So when it comes time for his performance review at the end of the year, he can look at all the pull requests he, he's worked on he can look at his entire contribution graph he can look at all the things he's done and he has the direct history of his last year of work completely at his fingertips he doesn't have to think about it as he writes that review um but if i remember right brooks is going uh he's got a flight he's gonna go speak at a conference yeah i am i gotta go i, I can't i can't be here i gotta go get on a plane and um there's a problem though dude i I'm going to, I'm not paying for Wi-Fi on the plane. I ain't doing it. Why? I ain't doing it. Use your I, miles. I, dude, the miles are for flying, yo, for getting in the front. <laughs> it's not for Wi-Fi. So why would I want to spend those? Don't I have a way of getting this stuff local? Oh, that, man, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I do think so. I, I'm pretty certain that we can grab all of this stuff right off of GitHub onto our local computer so that we can work on it offline. Uh, is that something that would solve your problem? I think it would. But now how do I do this? And by the way, okay, let me turn off all. I am not, I am manager. I do not work at the command line. I want none of this Narnie. Yeah. So there are two ways you can do this. The current scenario is that Brooks has direct access to this repository. He <coughs> is a contributor, right? We know that if you've been following along, you have Brooks as a contributor too, right? None of you added him? Okay. Uh, so if you've been following along, Brooks is a contributor, which means he has right access to this repo. This is very important. He has right access to this repo. Since he has right access to this repo, he can do what's cloning, what's called cloning the repo down to his computer. Now, if he doesn't have Git installed, he can also just download a zip file of this repository and open it up, okay? So I happen to have Git installed. So I'm gonna copy this, this URL. I can just click that button there and copy it. And from my terminal or from VS Code, I can use Git to uh, download that. So, so just fast. like that. So easy. Um, I have now have a copy of this entire repo to include all of its branches down here on my computer. And if I want to change branches, um, now muscle memory will kick in and I don't need to know what the command is. Come on, terminal. Thank you. Uh, what did we call the branch? It is uh, add-contrib-md. Right. So if I switch to that branch, here is the file that we're working on. So 
I'm offline now. This is local on my file system. Now, this is a little bit beyond the scope, but the point is that we wanted to highlight that if you need a local copy, you're going to do what's called cloning because Brooks has direct write access to the repository. Now, if any one of you right now goes to this repository, you can see it. It's public. I don't think you're allowed to clone it because you're not writers. You shouldn't be allowed to clone it without write permissions. So how do you get a copy of it? And I can verify that really quick. Let's go back to our favorite repo ever, Pandas. <laughs> I can download it, but I can't push to it, right? So if I use clone, I can clone it, but I can't push to it because I don't have write access. So if I need to write changes to something that I don't have access to, that's when I fork it, right? I have read permissions so I can download it. I don't have write permissions, so I can't push changes to it. If I fork it though, as I showed the other day, pandas ends up in my namespace and I can push all of my changes there. Now, the crazy thing is when I open a pull request, I can go from my namespace to the pandas namespace so I can still contribute. Um, so it's really important to know when to clone and when to fork. Brooks has direct access to the repository and he has write access to the repository so he can clone it. You guys have read access to the repository, which means you can clone it, but you can't make a change. So if you would like to make a change, you need to fork it and make the change on your version of this and request pull requests back to my namespace. So this is how you're going to get your notes. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, you're going to fork this repo. That way you can make changes for yourself. I don't expect anybody here to make a contribution back to this this repository, but if you fork it, you can change it and you never have to, to push a change back to this namespace. You can keep all of your changes in yours. This is, we hear all the time of, of people extending open source software or modifying open source software to their own needs. They're forking the project and then building on it from there. And you can totally keep that in your namespace. So that's how you're going to get your notes is you're going to fork this repo and then you can change whatever you want to change in it. And it'll only, only you will be able to see it unless you open a pull request back. But since Brooks has right access, he does not need to fork it. He just clones it down and he can then use Git or the GitHub command line tool or some other tool to push his changes directly back to this pull request. So Great job, Brooks. I hope your trip was great. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys did a good job updating this document. Um, you want to pop on in and give us an approval so that we can finish up work for the week? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you'll notice that real quick, what I did was, and, and I'm going to be, I'll be honest with you, I did it all from the command line. It took about two seconds to clone, update, push back. Just oh, yeah, that look, fast. he updated right here. Oh, I don't even know what he changed. Let's go, go look. look. That's I'm simple. Helpful. I'm helpful. Yep. Boom. Right there. And we can, we can be silly. Yes, you are. That's right. I am. A We're going to add that manager. as a comment. And there we go. I am a and helpful manager. We'll resolve that because we don't need that to actually be a conversation. It doesn't go away. It just folds <clears throat> up. That's right. all. Now notice everybody also what I did there too. I did this from the command line. And all I did was get clone the URL that Matt showed you. But my push back went to that branch. I didn't push back on main. I stayed right where I needed to be because, again, get checkout, then put in the name of the branch. Don't know the name of the branch? GitHub.com, open it up. What is that branch? Ah, that's what it's called. I'm a bit lucky. I use a weird terminal uh, called Warp, and Warp is meant for DevOps. And so it actually would list for me uh, the branches that are available and then show me the branch I'm sitting on. If you want to check it out, it's web, it's uh, warp.dev. 
I don't believe it's open yet. I was just, in, uh, I, I got access to a beta, but it just shows you how easy it is to work with something like that and how quick you can do it. So boom, I pushed it in there. Yep. And if you're on a terminal and you're using Git just itself and you don't have any other fancy features, you can use this command and it will, uh, it'll show you the branches you have. And my terminal is configured to uh, highlight the one I'm on, but that's a little advanced. It's not entirely what we're after, but you can, you can absolutely do that. The cool thing is he didn't use the web. Um, now, if he was on the airplane without Wi-Fi, he can't push. He can't push until he gets internet back, but he can write changes. He can make his commits or whatever. Wait, say that again, dude. That was a big deal right there. So I updated my, I updated the file, right? Everybody mm -hmm. hear that? I updated the file. I did a, and it's just a bad hat. I do get add dot just to make sure anything I've done is in there. It's, 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 it's really sloppy. I should be more specific, but then I do a git space commit space dash M space. And then in double quotes, a good message that makes sense. Like updated contributing with helpful information, hit enter. Now at that point, hands off, I'm still in the air, hands off. I can keep working. I can make another change and I can do a, another get add dot, get commit dash M, put another message in. Then when all this is done, when I hit the ground, when I get wherever I'm going, I've got my internet back, get push enter. Everything goes up. Yep. Everything goes up. Yep. And obviously, you, you know, if you imagine that scenario on a big enough scale with a big enough team you can say well what happens if we change the same line who wins Ooh. um and it, it's called a merge conflict and this isn't a git class so that's a, a class for a different day but you would have to manage what's called a merge conflict and that's not unique to github that's just unique to version control mm -hmm. so once we get that approval we'll uh get a merge going on cool there it is we got an approval. We know it's Brooks. Ha ha. It's on him now. Because you I'm can see I put absolutely nothing in the commit message other than just, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, it doesn't have the branch delete on merge. So ah, uh, darn it. Fine. Okay. Again, we can put a good commit message and we should, but honestly, the default one is pretty, pretty good. We're merging the pull request. That's exactly what we're doing. Hmm. So confirm it. We delete the branch. There we go. What? Do you remember what happens when we merge a pull request, though? What happens when we merge a pull? Oh, I thought we linked our issue to it. <gasps> Where did the issue go, Matt? It's closed. Hey. The pull request closed that. So well, the only manual thing we have to do, which you can fix on your own using automation, is we can now move this in. It's our Monday meeting. We brought our team in. We're doing our, day, our weekly daily stand-up, whatever it is. And we said, hey, Brooks and I, we knocked that out last week. We're done. Let's grab the next thing out of the backlog and move this gravy train forward. That's nice. Yo, that's and that really, is uh, that is nice. That is your basic Git flow. It's simply create an issue. Issue Communicate first. about the work in that issue. When you're ready to start the work, create a branch. Branch. The project board is optional. Create a branch. Make one change to open the pull request right away. And then work together to do the work in the pull request and merge that branch back into whatever branch you need to based on your strategy. Merge back in. Delete the branch. Delete. Rinse, repeat indefinitely. And now if we come here, we can, I think, that branch might show up. Nope. Oh, they changed that. It used to be so good. So we can now look at all the commits we've ever made mm -hmm. and we can see who did them and what, what happened and, and all of that. Oh, there was a, a merged pull request here. That's great. This is what happened. We can see those commit messages right here on, uh, on the repo code tab and our branch is gone. Everything is fine. And we are Very cool. hundred percent good to go. Does that make sense to everybody? Let me just get a, a quick um, hello, hi, or something in the uh, chat. Just let me know if that makes sense to everybody. If there was anything that didn't make sense, now's the time to say something because that is the core of kicking butt with GitHub right there. Ah, Benjamin asked, Matthew, can we fork your repo and do a simple pull request just to play around maybe till tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
uh, let me let me make you a different repo so that this one doesn't have a bunch of pull requests because this one will just probably forever be used for this boot camp. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So uh, that way it doesn't get like we don't think something's broken. So for all of you who want to participate in the playground oh mess that we're about to make, um, let us know hit there in the chat that you want to be part of it. And then if you y'all you'll need a, a, a GitHub account to do this, let us know and then Matt can add you in. No, I'm not even going to add them. You guys can fork and just go from your own namespace. <gasps> what? Oh, oh, Patrick says me, me, me. Crap. Oh, I messed up. Okay, cool. There we go. So, um, so you're going to let them, you want them to, you want them to clone or do you want them to fork on this one? If they clone it, they can't write back to it. So they can't open a pull request. They can't make any changes, anything like that. If okay. you fork this, you can then do that. So the link is in chat feel free to use this repo. So this is what I suggest, okay? Let's let's do this the right way. Go to this repo, open an issue here in my namespace because this is how I would contribute to a public project. I would go to pandas, I would open an issue in pandas or I would find an issue in pandas that said contribution welcome. And I would document what I am going to do. And this is this is helpful because I can say, hey, I see this issue, I'll take it, I'll work on it. I got it so that 50 people don't work on it. So go to this repo, create an issue. Tell me what you're gonna do. Tell me what you're gonna add. You can add a file, you can add a little yep. bit about you, whatever it might be. And then um, from there, you're gonna open a pull request uh, in your own namespace, or you're gonna fork it, sorry. You'll, you'll open an issue, you'll fork it, You'll open a pull request in your own namespace, and then you'll send that pull request back to um, my namespace and have it set to close the issue that you opened. You can figure uh, that but, out. I know that sounds crazy, y'all. Like it, it's a lot. But and 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 uh, actually, uh, hang on, hang on, Matt. Hold on, I have to unempty this, or else they can't fork it. There you go. Yeah, hang on, dude. I'm gonna I'm gonna create. Yes, there's an absolute reason to create a branch on your own namespace. And the reason for that is what if you mess up while you're making the change? If, if you were making that change to, to main in your namespace on the fork, you would then have to delete that and go fork again to undo the problems that you introduce. So still practice good branching strategy. Um, I know it's super, super, super tempting to just be lazy about it, especially on projects that don't matter. But the moment that you build it into muscle memory, it doesn't even feel like it's extra work. Um, like, for example, here's our GitHub for everyone. I'll, I'll do it here because I think I can scale this a little better. Okay, so here's our GitHub for everyone. Um, uh, repo that's local to me. So this is like what my my local workflow might look like. Uh, I'm going to check out main, right? So because I want to create a branch from main. So I'm going to do git checkout. And since I'm going to create a branch, I have to use a, a special switch. And I'm going to say, um, look at how fast I am. Right? Bingo. So now I'm there. I can simply come into a file that exists, which the readme exists on this branch. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to come into here. I'm going to save that. I'll come back to my, my terminal. And I can say git add readme. I'm going to specify what I want to add. I'm not going to add everything. And I'm going to say git commit. And this is where I'm going to put a good message added jumbled mess to read me oops wrong set of quotes oh you'll never get out of it <laughs> yeah it has its moments all right we'll hit those quotes and now i'm going to get push and this is the point where i'm sending it back up but nothing happened because i didn't do some some magic linking and this is like get information which is why i didn't cover it that is very common, y'all. When you do a git push and you see that message, even people who with experience with it, they just go ahead and do git push. They get the error. That way they get the right command because it'll spit it back to you. Copy, paste, go. Yep. And in just that amount of minutes, 
I now have that branch up here with the change ready for a pull request, which I could open and do. It's it's not a Matt, not a problem. Could you, could you do one thing for us before we go to break? And uh, yep. if you want to wait till after, you know, just let me know. I've just created a public repo. If I send it over to you, can you show everyone kind of the process they're going to go through to fork and do all that sort of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll send it up in the chat right now. So what that is, everybody, that's just a quick. Uh, uh, All right. So this is public what, repo I created. This is what forking is going to look like for you. Notice how it says Brooks Seahorn repo for Matt. I don't see the settings tab. I probably am not a collaborator. Watch what happens. I'm going to clone it. This is why you have to fork. Uh, let me close this. Let me come into here. I'm going to clone it. Gotcha, Everything Baron. seems like it's fine, right? I, I just, I, I have the repo. It's right here. It says repo for Matt. I have the readme. It says repo for Matt. Everything is normal, right? We're, we're all good. Um, so I'm going to make my change because I'm fancy and I'm going to pull a Brooks and I'm going to commit to main. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go through my steps. I'm going to do super bad stuff by adding a period. Yeah. I'm going to put a really bad commit message and I'm going to push it. Permission Boom. to push is denied because I'm not a collaborator. I don't have right access. So cloning didn't do me anything of value. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to delete that. I'm going to come back over to the repo. I'm going to click on fork. Does everybody see that? You just go to the repo, hit the fork button. That's all you do to get, get going with this. From fork, I'm going to say where I want to fork it to. In this case, my personal account. And notice, now it says my name, repo for Matt, but it has this added piece of information that tells me who the parent repository is. This tells me what the parent is. And I can see how out of sync with Brooks's repository I am. So this is the one that I want to clone. So forking doesn't get you out of cloning. It just gets you into a different namespace so that you can write and have right access to things. Are they in that namespace right there in the browser map where, for example, instead of coming out into a uh... Visual Studio, like if they just wanted to use the editor right there, they would yep. be in the same yep. situation. They're, they're in the, your own account's namespace at this point. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to use the terminal at all. Um, the only reason I am is just simply to show you the uh, that error message has gone away. That's right. a really good way to see it because you can't see it online the same way. Oh, come oh on. that's right. Okay. Right. So now it said I wrote it, but I wrote it to this because I my Git is authenticated to my namespace. Right. So if I come back here, we refresh it. Here I am on main in my namespace. And now it says that I am ahead of Brooks. Like I have made a change. So mm -hmm. if I come in here to pull requests and say, so I see this go to pull request, new pull request. Yep. And now things change. I not only get a branch, I get a repository. So head means what's first. So I want to go from my namespace on the main branch, because that's the only branch I have, to Brooks's namespace with the main branch, because that's the way I'm going to do it. Hit that drop down real quick for base repository under my name, Matt. Does everybody see you can even push it back to himself if you wanted to? Yeah. So if you were so, going from a feature branch back to main here before you went all the way back, you could do that. You've got complete control right there, y'all, on what you and how you're going to work this. Exactly. And when you fork, like you can get branches too. So like you, if you could get like the pandas dev branch um, so that you wouldn't commit to main for them or whatever. But this is how you would keep it in your own namespace. If I just wanted to make a change for me, see, now it's just strictly in my namespace. But if I want to change that and I want to send it back to Brooks, like you guys are asking me, I, I need to specify Brooks's namespace. So I'm going to create this pull request. All of this is really bad. 
And now <laughs> you'll see where it redirected me. It redirected me to Brooks's namespace. It showed me the pull request there. Since his repository is public, I can see the pull request. And when I look into the pull request, we'll see that it's coming from me over to him. So that, that should show you how to, to go about it. Use a effective waffle. Feel free to fork it. Feel free to, to make some changes, push those changes back, open pull requests, at mention me, whatever. Um, if I see them, I'll, uh, I'll respond to them and I'll merge them in and we'll see what we can come up with. But this one is going to be your notes. So I would, I would wait to go crazy yeah uh, on this one yeah so absolutely there with that with the uh the url that we put up there not the one not the one that i did the one before that the effective waffle project jump in there uh fork it off make some updates get it back into yours and then push the request back over Welcome back. I see there's a effective fork, a waffle fork. We're getting there. That's incredible. What are um, they doing? What are they doing? Let's see this. They're sticking forks in the waffles, man. Fork in the waffle. All right. So that's great. It is super easy if you know what you're doing. That the only what you're doing parts the trick, right? Um, so, so simple. I think we're gonna get into the fun part, Brooks. What do you think? I do been waiting for it dude yeah so i'm gonna try to go slow i'm gonna try to go real slow but don't go so slow it's boring there are a lot of moving parts and confusing pieces that are going to come up with actions okay so what i need from you if you want to become an actions guru is to ask your actions questions. Let me know if I confuse yep. you. Let me know if I went too fast. All right, ready? Get your actions automation ready. Go. Okay, done. Get yeah. All right. Fingers on keyboards. Ready. Get ready with your questions. So the first first things first. Okay. GitHub Actions exists in all of these repositories. Okay. It is a repository feature. It's not an account feature. It's a repository feature. It's up here on these little tabs. You can disable them if you go to the settings and you come down to actions. I think, yep, here you can say general and you can disable actions, all right? So if you're scared that you're gonna get charged for billing in your private repos or whatever it might be, maybe you just don't want actions to exist or maybe you don't trust uh, external community written actions you can you can force them to be local and all of this will hopefully become uncloudy uh you can adjust these settings on a per repo basis or you can enforce them at an organization basis okay repo feature so that means in a repo we have code issues pull requests projects wiki oh yeah we skipped actions it's right here click actions come with me on a journey if you do not have any GitHub Actions configured in a repository, you are greeted with this super helpful screen that says, get started with GitHub Actions. Simple workflow. Let's see, let's click configure. Oh, that's scary. That's super duper scary. This is an entire file. This whole UI just got crazy. Let's hit back. That's too much. We're going to slow down. Whew, that's a lot. Actions is a feature that allows us to automate things. Now, developers, their ears perk up. DevOps engineers, your ears perk up. I can do my CI. I can do my CD. I can provision my infrastructure. I can exactly. do, do updates. I can roll back. I can yeah, 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 yeah. Non-developers go, oh, shucks. I got to learn to write code. No. You don't. Not really. Not really. Not really. Oh, I can't use this feature. I don't write code. No, not really. Let's nope. take a look at some of the things we can do with actions. First and foremost, there's some things that can help us with deploying. If we happen to have a Node.js app, we can deploy it to Azure. 
We can deploy stuff to ECS. We can deploy stuff to GKE. We can do OpenShift. We can do this stuff. Security folks, don't get too excited, but we can do like code scanning and stuff. CI folks, developers, again, like we're gonna test some, some stuff with Python and then publish a package. We're gonna do Java stuff for some reason still. Um, automation folks, non-developers, guess what? This stuff is super helpful for community management. Mm -hmm. What if I just wanna say thanks for your pull request? Here's a greeting. This one just simply greets users who are first time contributors to a pull request. Stale. This one says, hey, you have an issue in your repository that's been open for more than the window of time that I think is acceptable. We're gonna mark it as stale. And if you don't do anything with it, we're gonna close it in a week. These are just tasks that help us do stuff. It's really cool. How do you find more? Well, we go back over to our favorite place, the GitHub Marketplace. Mm -hmm. The GitHub Marketplace, we can, over here under types, we can just click actions. And here you go. Here's a bunch. Verified actions are key, okay? Because actions are community-driven. There's verified maintainers and publishers, and there is you and me, okay? And I'm not verified, but it doesn't mean I write bad actions. Um, we can look at any of these, right? First interactions, download build artifacts, set up stuff, uh, get diff suggestions. It'll take the current git changes and apply them as GitHub code review suggestions. Never used it, don't know what it does, but we could probably configure it up. Um, all sorts of stuff, but there's uh, a lot of pages. Guru, code guru reviewer, that's a big one, y'all. And there's it's a just lot right of there pages. to be, yeah, there's a lot of stuff, absolutely. So you can search. Okay. Mm. You can also look at categories. Learning. Interesting. What does that say? Uh, let's see. Eh, nothing. Some people might just have their, their learning projects here. What about localization? If you're, <coughs> excuse me, if, if you're writing documents or something and you need to translate them into non-English stuff, here's an action that'll help with that. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not just for code and it's not just for developers. It's for anything that you just don't want to do manually. And we're going to dive into the theory behind this and how it works today. And we'll try to set up one of these smaller, easier ones. And uh, then we'll, we'll dive into it a lot more tomorrow. So let me get my favorite sketch pad back. Hey. I know you guys are loving the sketch pad. It's like top quality software let's see all right couple problems okay we have actions right and we have actions same word different use case capital a means the feature Little a means a unit of work, okay? It means a task. So actions, capital A, is this entire system that's the feature. Actions, lowercase a, that's kind of what we mean to when we mean when we're talking about this. So it gets confusing because we might say use GitHub Actions to do this task. And you're like, um... Am I supposed to find an action that does this? Or am I supposed to use the feature? Or do I use the feature to find an action? Or who oh, gets crazy. So you kind of got to use some context. What we like to do is call this specifically GitHub actions and this actions. That's how we kind of delimit that. I will screw that up. Just normally, I'm going to say the word action. <coughs> if I confuse you, tell me to slow down. Second to that, okay, we have workflows. Which 
like Git flow, that was our workflow, right? Create an issue, create a branch, add it to a project board, do a pull request, do the work, have a glass of champagne, do a happy dance, go home. Oh crap, it's broken, right? That's our workflow. It's typically a, any IT shop's workflow. Last time I checked, it's Saturday, come back to work. Workflows are your process for getting stuff done. Workflow files wow. are your recipes for telling GitHub actions what actions to execute. Do you see how all of a sudden they need to hire somebody to work on names over there at GitHub? I will screw this up. I'm going to say, edit your workflows. Do something with your workflows. Workflow this, workflow that. Got to pick out the context. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be challenging, okay? Sorry for that. I didn't name this stuff, but this is problem number one, okay? Workflow files live in dot github slash workflows just to make it more confusing okay so all workflow files need to be in this folder or else they don't work i could take a workflow file and i can put it anywhere in the repository and it will not execute unless i put it right here in this folder very important okay also a good thing it means if you needed to share some stuff around you could just have a repo of workflow files that didn't execute and then people could pick and choose the workflow files because right now there's not a good way to share workflows but there's a great way to share actions <sighs> it's maturing give it time it's really cool but there are some hurdles okay so how does this work very simply there's a trigger trigger warning get it i know you don't get it it's okay there's a trigger what is that trigger well it could be a push it could be a watch it could be a pull request okay the mm. point is there are a lot of them. So if we went to events that trigger workflows and we looked at the GitHub documentation for this, every one of these things in this, this list can be used as a trigger. And this is where it gets interesting. Some of them like a uh, repository dispatch means you can create your own trigger so you can expand this okay we're not we'll get back there just needed you to know that there's a trigger so that's the point right there matt where if like i can decide where i want this thing to happen it could be on a fork it could be on a push it could be on a, a pull request whatever it is i can pick out this is where i want this thing to happen it's not necessarily the where it's the when Ah, okay. yes, so, the win. Better. I forgot to add this slide for production. So here you go. Here's a slide. Intro to GitHub Actions. We're about to do some automation, man. Okay. All right. It's not necessarily the where, it's the win. So a trigger happens, but then what? Well, then a workflow begins to run right? A workflow begins to run, uh, which is technically uh, reading a workflow file. Okay, so a workflow file begins to execute. That workflow file builds a virtual machine in Azure. Do you need to configure that virtual machine? Negative ghostwriter. You don't have to do anything. You just have to say, do I want Linux? Do I want Windows? Or do I want Mac? That's it. And it builds it in Azure. Within that virtual machine, 
it takes the steps from the workflow file and executes them, right? Uh, greet user, cool. Probably makes an API request in the virtual machine, triggers the API, the API writes back to your repo. Um, test code, okay? Virtual machine configures your, your node environment and runs your CI CD. Uh, downloads your Docker container and does it from within there, whatever. It does the steps. The steps can be one of two things. Step item number one is simply called a run step. I think it's runs. It might be run. I forget yeah. off the top of my head. We'll have to look at it. I think it's runs. It's a run step. A run step is a terminal, right? So bash. Okay. So if my step is a run step, it is no different than me coming over to my terminal and going echo hello world, right? Hello world, run step. That's exactly what, a, what I just did is a run step, right? So what are some common run steps? Uh, NPM install, right? Let's get our dependencies installed. Common run step. Um, get commit, common run step, okay? What's important to understand is that these are not reusable. I can't share this run step with Brooks. It's just written into my file, which is okay. But it means every time I wanna run echo hello world, I need to, to create a step and run echo hello world, okay? The second thing that a step can do is run an action, which uses the keyword, uses it uses an action right an action is still the same thing as a run step it's a unit of work an action can still be hello world but an action is bigger than that okay and i, I this is so much i hope i'm going slow enough an action is self-contained and it becomes shareable, All right? This is an action. An action is made up of a YAML file, some source code, and maybe a Docker file. Okay, question marks. It also lives in its own repository. Whereas a run step, we're just calling a command on the virtual machine in Azure, right? So if Windows doesn't have NPM installed on it, plot twist it does for this scenario, uh, then it doesn't work. So if I fire up a Mac instance and I tried to run, I don't know, PowerShell, it's not gonna work. If I want to run PowerShell, I need a Windows instance, okay? So conversely, if I fire up Linux and I try to run Microsoft Word, which would never work in this scenario, it's not gonna do that. So it's limited to the tool set and the operating system where action is programmatically built. It's self-contained. It lives in its own repo. It has everything it needs to execute in the source code. It has everything it needs in its configuration file to include allowing the users to supply inputs to the action to change its behavior. And if it's not JavaScript, if it's not JavaScript or TypeScript, same thing, if it's not JavaScript, it needs a Docker file. So GitHub Actions, the feature, speaks JavaScript. So if you're writing an action that is JavaScript, you do not need a Docker file. You can still include one. It's faster if you don't, 
because when the action is executed, it will not need to build or pull uh, an image. It can just execute it raw. If you're a DevOps and a container freak, you could argue it's probably more stable if you do because you're providing the environment for it. So there is a trade-off. If you want to use a language other than JavaScript or TypeScript, you have no choice but to include a Docker file because GitHub Actions does not speak Go. It does not speak Python. It does not speak whatever crappy Rust language you're writing your GitHub Actions in. Okay? Whatever. <laughs> so you have to have a Docker file. It also needs a repo, and this makes it easy to share because when we use an action in a workflow file, we are going to reference it by repository name. And that is going to basically get clone the repository at runtime and execute the source code based on the configuration YAML, which might include a Docker file. Okay. Whew. Lots of crazy moving parts, people. Crazy. There are some caveats to this repo. If it's private, your action's worthless. You can't share it if it's private, right? We need visibility. So it has to be public. There's also a best practice. And I will show you what that looks like. Um, if I come back to my namespace, my repositories, and I search actions. Okay. Actions is a repo that I have built. And in it, I was working way back when, two years ago, doing some uh, proof of concept stuff around how to teach actions. Um, I built a repo full of different actions. So this is a mono repo. It contains a, an action that prints a dad joke to the terminal. It creates an action that packages uh, Docker containers and uploads them to the GitHub package registry, not the Docker hub, right? So um, issue makers would create issues. If you did a thing like I could create an issue using an action into a repo. Uh, so these were things that I worked on, but this is not the way to do it. If I wanted to reference the issue maker, I would reference Matt Davis slash actions slash issue maker. The problem with this is releases. If I make an update to dad jokes and I tag that as a release, it also changes the release tag for all of the other actions right here in this repository. So if we go back to what we talked about with branch strategy and like features being small and deliberate, your repositories for actions need to also be small and deliberate. Let's go back and take a look at something like Amazon or Red Hat. You'll see Red Hat has Red Hat actions, Red Hat actions, Red Hat actions, Red Hat actions. They have at least four actions. So if we come over to their repo or their namespace rather, Red Hat actions is the namespace and all of their actions are in their own repo. So even Red Hat doesn't have a mono repo for their actions. This is what an action looks like. Here is, so this is unnecessary stuff. This is stuff for them. This is their dependencies, uh, which I th you think you have to include your package lock. Um, I forget, it's been a minute. The action.yaml required the readme not required, the change log not required, the git ignore not required, the TS config not required, the ES lint not required. Their source code, a hundred percent required. Their TS config is in here just because they they probably use actions to build. Um, their source code, which is required, and there's not a Docker file because it follows the rule of being TypeScript. And since it's TypeScript, actions speaks TypeScript. So if we were to look down into their documentation, it shows us how to use this in a workflow, okay? So let's take a simple, small look. We have jobs, 
jobs execute. So this is the name of a job. Mm -hmm. and it executes steps. Remember, we just talked about steps can be actions or they can be run commands. In this case, it is an action. Notice how it's referenced by like a, a URI. P pretend that github.com slash is before Red Hat. You have github.com slash Red Hat action slash OC login at a release tag. Could be at a branch, could be at a commit. It, however you want to do it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it says with, these are variables. I'll show you where these come from. So same thing. So one step is an action. Step number two is an action because it uses another action. Step number three is another action in this job. Okay. So this one didn't mix them up. That's okay. You can mix run steps with actions. You can mix and match it all. I'll try to find you an example of that. But which one are we looking at? We are looking at chart verifier. Where was that in their example? Chart verifier was the last block. Yep. You'll see this with, well, how do I know what variables I can pass into this? Uh, quite honestly, they supplied it in their documentation, but it, let's say I didn't supply the documentation. I can look at that action.yaml. The action.yaml tells me inputs, which are user supplied variables with these names. They tell me what they do, right? And there's three fields, a description, if it's required or not, and what the default value is. For every one of these, this is as big as it can get. It also sets some outputs, which we'll, we're not going to dive super into outputs. That's like highly advanced dev stuff. Um, and this is GitHub for everybody. But the most important thing is it says what executes it. So it says that inside of the VM, we're going to use node 12 to run the file in the dist folder named index.js. That's it. So that means when the trigger starts this workflow file, if we use this demo right here, when it gets to this step, this Ubuntu machine, this Linux virtual machine that's running on Azure, will call the command node 12, and it will pass it this index.js file and execute it. That's all. It's, I know it's a lot, but it's not more than that. That's the upside. It's, it's as simple as, as that. Yeah. Um, so we can look at another example. Let's find something that is maybe localization. Where's that translator? There it is. Okay. Nope. Yeah, yep. this, this is it. Translates the content. We have a job. We have it running on a Linux virtual machine. <clears throat> It's going to use this issue, or sorry, this action. And it has a couple parameters that you can pass it. That's it. If we went ahead and we looked at this, we would see that here's an action.yaml file. If we scroll down enough, it uses node 12 on that Linux machine to execute the index.js file. Very simple. Um, and that's that's what happens. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a Docker one, to be honest, to show you, but yeah. that's okay. Uh, I bet you if we do a continuous integration one, let's do, let's do an Ansible limp because we got some DevOps peeps in here. This is verified and maintained by Ansible. So Ansible created this action. Um, I'll get to secrets in a second. I'll answer that question. Yep, good question. Um, this was created by Ansible. You'll see here we have one job called build running on Linux. The first step uses this action checkout, which is the same thing as running a git checkout or a git clone, it clones the repo into the virtual machine so that you can access the source code. Then it runs this linter. And there's a bunch of documentation. These are all comments, so don't let it scare you. 
right? And and that's that's that. That one's pretty simple. So that one still doesn't even use a, a run step. My point is you can mix run steps. Um, so quite simply, if we came into that, let's see. Here, they use a Docker file. That's what I was hoping to see. So we have an action.yaml. It tells us all the inputs we can have. Uh, it, they went overboard. You don't need to do all that. <laughs> and then it says it runs using Docker, and it's going to build the image from the Docker file. So it runs a Docker build rather than a Docker pull and builds the, doc the, the Docker file and then executes the Docker file. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. also included an entry point script. You don't have to do that. You can do that. It depends on how your Docker file is set up, right? And for them, that is their source code. There is no other source code mm -hmm. in here. They use this script as their source code, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's source code, there's a Docker file, and there's an action.yaml file. A minimum is source code in an action.yaml action file if it's JavaScript. Whew. Yep. Okay, let That's me get to lot. this question. That's a if lot. I do pass secrets as a variable to an action. It may do bad things with it, right? It's public, but I need to inspect the action source code. Absolutely. Do not blindly pass secrets into actions you know nothing about. Don't that do is it. one of the reasons and one of the, the main motivators behind GitHub creating this verified creator thing is they vet these actions ahead of time to ensure that nothing malicious is happening with those secrets, okay? It's very uh, scary in that case. Um, the other thing is, just like we talked about authentication with GitHub, is don't use over permissive secrets, right? Make sure your secrets are, are sensible to be using inside of a workflow, but you're absolutely correct. Nothing stops Steve or Billy Bob or, or Mary and Jane or whoever from building an action that requests that you put in your AWS access key and its secret key. And then they just deploy crypto miners to AWS. And I bring that up because that's a real scenario. Fun fact number 439, when GitHub Actions was first released to the public, there was a major problem with crypto miners setting up workflows to spin up mining machines on Azure and mine crypto on GitHub's dime. And uh, truth of the matter is there's still no fix for it. What they implemented was uh, limits in how long workflows can run. And depending on your tier, like you get different, like, longevity behind how long a workflow runs before it times out and stuff like that but that's the only thing they could do to prevent that type of thing from happening so um it does have its downfalls and because of that you need to be cautious so let's set up we got 15 minutes let's try to set up mm -hmm. a really quick workflow what yeah, you let's think let's do one real quick so i'm going to come into configure and i know this is going to be scary i am going to remove this trigger and i am going to include this one called workflow dispatch this is a manual trigger it, it creates a button for me that i can click that says run my workflow i'm going to rename it to say hi to the boot camp okay and the jobs it's going to run I'm just going to clean this up a little bit because it's a little messy with all the comments. The job is going to be greet. It's going to run on Ubuntu. And it's going to have, ah, here we go. Look, uses and then run. See, they mixed and matched. You'll see run is simply an echo. So we're going to do this. And we'll take this one. Oh, we'll take this one out. Yep. And we'll take this one out. And I am going to break the rule. Okay. Oh, I'm going to name it. it. Oh, yeah. Change that. Bootcamp.yaml. I'm going to commit this directly to main. Please don't shoot me. Okay. We're no here. Message. Yeah. All right. Notice how it put it in dot GitHub slash mm -hmm. workflows. So now it's here. So if I come over to the actions tab, it's changed on me. It looks different now. 
It's not the same. I have all my workflows. They're all populated right here. So I can find the one that I just named. <laughs> Excuse me. And now I see all the times it has ever executed. And it hasn't yet. And this run workflow button exists because that's the trigger I told it to have. I don't have to use that. I could use the trigger of every time a push happens. I can use the trigger of every Monday at 4 p.m. I can do all sorts of stuff to trigger these. In this case, we're just going to run it. So we're going to run the workflow. It requested the run. We got to wait a second while our environment gets built. Mm -hmm. It's running right now. This is all real time. Yellow dot means it's going. Mm -hmm. It's queued right now. If we click into this, I don't think we're going to be fast enough to nope, catch it. Get there. It's already yep. done. We can click into that. We can see the jobs that ran. If I click a job, I can see the steps that ran for that job. There are two steps that will always run. The first one is set up a job and the last one is complete a job and you do not have to configure these. They will always run. This is our actual step and it says, hello world. That's it. It ran echo hello world. Pretty boring, not, not great, but we <laughs> just triggered that automation. And if we look at this again, that's all it was supposed to do. Let's use a secret. Let's show why secrets are dangerous. What do you think? Yep, let's do it. Let's do okay. it. So <clears throat> we are going to remove hello world and we are going to use <clears throat> some syntax here. Um, and we're going to say secrets dot uh, person. Okay. Mm -hmm. And secrets dot person is nothing right now. Okay. It doesn't exist. And I'm GitHub start... knows what that means, right? When I do that dollar curly curly it knows something's up right yes that's uh actions workflow syntax for mm -hmm. expressions okay so it's actually there's a bunch of different contexts and without getting too too technical on it there's a bunch of contexts that github actions exists in there's the github context which has metadata about the repository, like what branch triggered it? What was the event that triggered it? What commit message triggered it? What is the SHA for this thing and the SHA for that thing? Who triggered it? The actor. So it's metadata about GitHub. There's also a context called secrets, which is the secrets of a repository, which I've not showed you yet. So I need to call that context and then I need to call that property in that context. And this just evaluates that and turns it into a string. Okay. So if I go into settings, matter of fact, before we do that, let's run it first. See, I have a successful run. I'm going to run it again. I'm betting it blows up. I'm betting it's not going to blow up. And this is something that you have Damn, to be careful on, of. Up. Let's try to watch it. Let's see if we can get in there quick enough. See, quick, quick, real quick, time. Quick. So if you had really long jobs, you could watch where the job was along the way. Um, it, wait, it, oh, shoot, it's green. What? Everything's yep. fine. You know why? Because it worked. It just didn't do Anything. what we wanted it to. Yep. Echo ran successfully, but... It didn't print what we needed it to print. That's because we didn't have a secret for it to print. And I also think I need some quotes. There's the other piece behind that. Oh no, it, it just didn't didn't couldn't print anything, right? Exactly. It didn't, we didn't it, give it anything it, to print. Basically, it echo did exactly. Ran. We it did exactly what we told it to do. Go get this thing called secrets person, and print it. So it went and looked for empty. secrets person. It's not there. There was nothing. So it printed exactly what we told it to. So. In that respect, y'all, when you're messing around with secrets, if you mess this part up, like if it's on an echo and you keep going, what's going on? It's it's just, it's not going to blow up on you. It's going to say it's not there. Yep. Well, it's not even going to say it's not there. It's just going to say this. And the reason is simply <clears throat> because the echo command returned an exit code of zero, right? So it, it returned and said, I was successful. Mm -hmm. GitHub Actions doesn't know if it <clears throat> did what you wanted it to do. Yeah. It just knows the echo didn't break. So let's fix it. We go into settings, we scroll down to secrets, Ooh. we click on actions, and now we can add a new repository secret. 
we're going to call it person. And I'm going to give it a value of GitHub bootcamp. So here's the thing. Just like your personal access token, this is the only time we will ever see this. When I click add secret for you security folks, it will encrypt this before it sends it back to GitHub. The encryption happens before it gets transmitted across the wire. Okay. So, um, and it's going to go away and then we're never going to see it again. We're never going to be able to, we can add, I think we can edit it, but we can't ever see this value. This is the only time we'll ever see the value and it got encrypted and it's gone now. Does that, does the repos, Matt, I hate to say this, man, because everybody, please excuse me because I'm about to throw him a, a question he may not be able to answer. Do you know if this thing has any compliance standards that it meets like GDPR or anything like that, that we could talk about as far as storing secrets? I have no idea, but knowing who some of the clients are, I'm going to say it, it has to. <laughs> okay. Yep. That's, that's what I figured. That's what I figured. So I just want to just let and you all know. I don't know that. how much I'm allowed to elaborate on that. Oh, um, that's fine, dude. No, if they've okay. got letters of attestation out there, they'll do it. So anyway, I, I, what I wanted to say on that was this, if you're using this for like a production project, let's say you're doing like credit card uh, processing. So you got to, oh, you've got to follow the PCI DSS rule set and regulations. You check the GitHub information about what they're uh they're clear to use okay yeah. it's the same thing with place like aws azure gcp they have all those letters of attestation showing you what they are uh, what sort of workloads they can handle check this as well and you know just to scope that back into perspective a little bit too like remember github deploys github from github that means all the stuff that github manages like actions secrets processing payments all this they use their they use repo secrets to deploy github right so like github dog foods their own stuff so if i hit update like i can update it but i can never see that value again it's never going to show up again okay but now inside of the runner or inside of actions i could trigger another runner and i'm, I'm sure there's going to be a follow-up question of well how does github actions know the secret then right mm -hmm. and it's the context the context is able to pass that over to GitHub Actions. It passes it encrypted. And, and then once it gets to the Actions runner, the actual VM is called the runner. Once it gets there, it, it decrypts it. And here in the logs, it masks it. So you'll never see it, right? We echoed the secret. You'll never see it. So doing it like that, not super helpful because Echo worked and it echoed the mask value of that secret. You will right. never, ever see it. But it's something to be aware of that if this was JavaScript, for example, and I read in a secret environment variable or something, and then I told JavaScript to print it, I could get away with that, right? The way the runner is configured, it's not going to do that. That doesn't mean developers can't screw up and, and show yeah. this stuff. So if I really wanted to close this out, one, one last thing, if I really wanted to, to present to you guys, hello bootcamp, I could configure an environment variable in here and I could do it at any level, but for right now, I'll just put it here and I'm gonna call this person and that's gonna be GitHub bootcamp. And then down here, I could call env dot person mm -hmm. oops not save wrong one commit commit to mainline yeah that's right i know i know we're reckless today so and happy i'm so it's happy only to see trunk based no it's only in the aspect of time well i mean trunk is could be your dev, your dev that, that, that's a point of contention between matt and i because there's metrics out there right now that say some of the best devops organizations are using something called trunk based development that'd be good homework for y'all look up trunk based development and see what it is yeah and their dev branch might be their trunk right like who yeah say what trunk is so um boom we come in here uh oh sorry wrong wrong button and there we go yep. get a boot camp right so We've seen how we can pass some environment variables and configure them quickly. We've seen secrets quickly. Uh, tomorrow, we're gonna take this to the next step, right? We're gonna, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. I'll pull it up. Just let's build some excitement. Let's get you going. What you gonna do, what you gonna do Matt? 
I'm going to spill the beans. Uh, some workflows we're going to take a look at tomorrow is automatically checking the links in your documentation to make sure they're still valid. Like think about how much time is wasted wow. maintaining documentation. Wow. We can automate that. We are going to put a small application in this repo and set up a CI pipeline for it where we're going to run tests. Then we're going to um, create a Docker image from that application all automatically. Um, I'll show you how to deploy that to ECS, but we're not going to tie that connection in. Um, and then I'm going to give you a little homework or actually it's going to be like part of a workshop thing, where we're going to use actions to dynamically update our profile readme's, which is going to be pretty cool too. Yep. So we got uh, a couple of cool things. And then the last one is going to be scheduling a weekly sync for your team. Instead of you coming in here every Monday and opening an issue, we're going to set up GitHub actions to on Monday before work starts, open an issue for your daily or weekly standup, right? So we're going to show automation as it applies to everybody as much as we can, because there is no limit. So that's kind of all tomorrow is going to be is just pure action awesomeness. And uh, cool. that's have, it. Have, have y'all got any questions before we break for the day? Y'all still here? Yeah, it looks like there's one right here. Uh, oh, no, I already answered that one. Yep, you already answered Benjamin. Matter of fact, uh, on, on that last thing, y'all, that's how I do automation for infrastructure builds with AWS. The, uh, the way that I write to the, uh, if you may not know anything about AWS, in order to be able to write in there, you have to have something, if you're going to do it programmatically, is something called a secret, uh, an access key and a secret access key, and they're just strings of text. So what you do is, is that, like, if you're using Terraform, you use actions like this to write, there's, a, there's the Terraform module right there, as a matter of fact, you would store those secret key and secret, uh, pardon me, access key and secret access key inside uh, the uh, secrets right there, and then just call it dynamically. Nobody's going to see what it is. Nobody can see what it is, but it's going to allow you to quickly throw out um, infrastructure into your environment. Yep. Here's an example, which we'll cover a little more in, deep, in depth tomorrow, but that hits on that. Yep. They set up some environment variables <coughs> and nothing stops you from coming into this and saying, uh, oof, not that, don't do that. That's garbage. Wow. wow secrets dot aws region right like you could set up mm -hmm. a secret called that pass that secret as an environment variable and then call that environment variable somewhere else they have it right here so there's a ton of realistic reasons and things to store in the secret or in in the github secrets and you can mix and match um However, it might be the problem with doing it like this, though, is pumping it into an environment variable is if you're printing stuff to the terminal, yep. you might leak it. Right. So it's better to call it directly to ensure that it stays masked. And also so, on top of that, if you do something like that, let's say like with the configuration of what region you're going to use inside AWS, because you just can't echo it back out, you're kind of in a pickle. You're almost down to the point of let's just create a goofy bucket and figure out where it goes. Yeah, so, you, you're going to get some logging, though. So whatever the AWS errors are, you're going to see it here. So it should be pretty clear where you screwed up. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get it in the, in the errors. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this shows you much more than just Echo. Like, here's an example. This is set up. It gives us information about the, the um, operating system. It reads this secret that's always present to figure out the permissions that this virtual machine has. Um, same with like completing the job, like, okay, bad example, but if we were to come back to, uh, 20 bucks, if you can guess where I'm going to go, pandas, <laughs> if we came back to pandas and we looked at their actions, look, they got some running right now. This is kind of fun. Oh, um, wow. let's see, look, boom, this is where they're currently at on their checks. And, and you can see they, they actually have a couple errors, right? So these are errors that are showing up. Um, if they come into to this benchmark, let's see. Like we can see the individual steps. We can see the output. Oh, oh, see, we're getting, so it, like, let's say the AWS CLI returns a JSON object that gives you good information. You're gonna be able to see that here in the logs. 
So you're going to be able to figure it out, hopefully, from, from that. Um, so yeah, same like checkout is going to be, it initializes a Git repository. It really runs Git init. And then like, these are the actual Git commands that you would see in the terminal. So there's a lot of ways to figure out where you made the mistake, but that's advanced actions. And this is GitHub for everyone. So any last minute questions before we wrap for the day? No. Nope. All right. I will leave you Everybody with one good? last thing. If you want to look at a cool um, actions marketplace thing for my DevOps people, uh oh oh yeah we don't want to do that so uh i knew a guy my mentor as a matter of fact was was going to get uh for an interview at packet um which is a bare metal cloud provider and i was talking to him about actions and i spent some time inter interacting with packets api and building up um workflows that would provision infrastructure using their api in GitHub Actions workflow. So if you just search for packet on the marketplace, just to kind of get an idea on what some of the things you could do are, um, you'll come to some of my repositories that show a custom build. See, here's secrets packet API key. It's there. I would need that repo secret in my repo, but you can you can come in and, and take a look at all the different things you could do and, and fire this all up um, and play with it. So you can just get a better infrastructure idea, I guess. Um, if you look at something like this as well. So pretty simple. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. And welcome to day three of the INE GitHub for Everyone Bootcamp. Um, glad y'all can make it. Glad you're here. Um, before we get started, there was actually something uh, Matt, Adam, and I were talking about just before we got started. Um, or got uh, online that we were talking about that we just wanted to talk about briefly. First of all, uh, biggest thing, thank you all. Thank you so much for showing up, for being part of this boot camp. This is the first time we run this particular uh, boot camp. We've sort of been exploring uh, what we could do with it, doing some things that are a bit unusual and really doing our best to hold back our personalities. So I hope you don't mind. We got a little strange in places, but just trying to make things better. Second of all, don't think for a second that it has not occurred to us that if we could have done this boot camp in person someplace, all of us in a room, it would have been hysterical. So um, I, I think more than that is just really showed us how much, you know, we appreciate y'all showing up and how much fun and how, you know, to have you interacting with us. And third of all, and this is a, a big favor from Matt, Adam, and I. Um, about our second break, I'll send you out a link or Adam will send out a link in the chat where you can go and uh, let us know how we did. You can rate the class. There's a, some uh, fields in the form where you can do some free text. Give us some ideas, maybe something you liked, maybe something you dis didn't like, and uh, we will go through those. So anything that you can give us on that, please, we will be looking at those. We will seriously look at any of your considerations or recommendations as ways of making this boot camp even better. So with that said, again, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're here today. Hey, Matt, what are we doing today? Uh, it's Friday, Brooks. We're not doing anything. What are you up yes, to? Yes, even better. How about a big cup of shut up then? I like this. <laughs> uh, today, we are going to take a look at, at actions. We're going to go uh, a whole lot deeper um, into the, the action side of things. We're going to set up a couple of different workflows, um, and we're going to play around with, with some pipelines um, as, as it goes to applying these to a GitHub project. Um, cool. So this is like the A to B, A to Z type approach then? To a degree, uh, for us, in the, the limited environment that we do have, it's going to be the A to C approach. Uh, there's still a whole lot more to come after this. There's some stopping points for us, uh, largely in the sense of like we're not deploying to a cloud provider. Right. Um, we're not pushing things in places that we might usually, if it's a, a production project. Um, we're just right. solidifying some concepts that... You can then expand upon to get to Z. Um, you'll have everything you need to know to go mm -hmm. from A to Z. We're cool. just going to stop at C because, again, this is GitHub for everyone and not GitHub for DevOps engineers or developers or cloud practitioners or whatever, right? So right. It, there's a fine balance that we must find. Cool. And the flip side of that, it's, it's Friday, and we all know the rule, right? Like, no deploying stuff on a Friday. Oh, come on, man. That that goes right in there with uh be sure to back everything up. <laughs> <laughs>
you should also uh restore your backups on friday and you know just don't don't have a weekend that's that's kind of what we're after so we're advice not gonna from, advice from pop up y'all backups are for punters don't do it <laughs> <laughs> all right so that's where we're gonna go so you guys probably have the waffles repository you you stuck a fork in the waffles repository that is the repository that I'm really hoping you follow along in, okay? Yeah. Brooks and I, we're going to work in the GitHub for everyone repo because we need to get your notes set up. If you were to fork this today, you're like, man, Matt's a liar. And I'm not. I just did what Brooks told me. Uh, right. So the truth of the matter is we don't have anything in there for you right now. And we need to put stuff in there so you have notes. Um, so we're going to be working here. You can work in waffles. And uh, then we'll... Uh, you know, we'll let you fork this one and you'll be good to go. Looks like we got a comment here. Patrick's Super got a good point. Sessions. Yeah. Yep. I, I think that that is probably something that is going to be worked on. I know we've talked about it within our team a little bit on, yep. on being more targeted. So that's something you can keep an eye out on the INE platform for. Um, I'm not sure if there's like a newsletter or something that can get sent out around that type of thing, but uh, you know, INE Live is a thing where big announcements typically come out. So if you tune in INE Live, you might pick up one of those uh, those announcements that yes. a, a targeted class exists. So, yeah, the good news is it's GitHub Actions. For as complicated as it is to figure out what to call stuff, it's actually really simple to uh, to pick up. Like once you build a couple of small pipeline things or small automation pieces, you kind of understand how it all fits together and it's got a low learning curve. Um, so getting to those more advanced scenarios is, is quite simple once you get the, the basics into it. Um, the problem with GitHub Actions, and I'll, I'll say this, and it hurts my heart to say it because I love GitHub Actions, but I'll say it, is it's young. It's like this iteration of actions is like two, maybe three years old at this point. There was a, so this, what we're working with is called Actions V2, Insider Info. It's called yes. Actions V2. Actions V1 existed for a while and it was a lot different. This V2 of actions has only been around for like three years. And it is changing as fast as the GitHub website, if not faster it's one of the most developed features at github uh and i feel like every time i go to get back involved with actions i have to relearn something because they've added a new feature um for example like composite steps wasn't something that existed when i was becoming an expert on it and now that exists um the ability to share workflows didn't exist and now you can set up like template workflows within organizations to make them a little bit more shareable, even though they're not as shareable as they should be. Um, so I would expect next year probably for that to change, right? So mm -hmm. Actions is is still really, really young and it's going to change a lot. So if, if it's something you're interested in, it's the downfall is you got to stay plugged in or else it'll move past you way faster than you're ready for. Um, that being said, if you're like feeling the burden of like having to learn a new pipeline tool, I'll give you another pro tip insider info thing here. Hey, here we go, folks. If, if you come from like the Azure pipelines world, there's a really big similarity without saying things too directly here there's a giant similarity between mm -hmm. azure pipelines and github actions so if you got some pipelines experience actions should be something that comes second nature it's almost gonna feel like it's azure pipeline it'll probably feel really close to azure pipelines so if you're stepping in what i'm putting down and you got that experience you should pick yep. this up quickly also, you know, on that, uh, give you all some other insider information, you know, like Matt mentioned to us on day one, there's other products out there that exist that do kind of a GitHub ish type thing. Uh, one I'm very familiar with is the one inside AWS called Code Commit. Um, I'll be absolutely honest with you going out to so many companies and talking about AWS. I typically see GitHub. That's going to be one of their main pipelines. That's how it they is. do stuff. Unless they're really into the whole, um, you know, they're going to use something like Travis 
or um, some of the other systems, they're going to use Jenkins, where they've just really got an investment in it, you're typically going to see this right here and nothing that's like specific to a particular uh, provider. I'm so glad you said that, Brooks, that triggered something in my head. Um, I don't know how released this thing is yet. But in the docs for actions, you'll find a bunch of guides of going from Travis or from Jenkins or from Circle mm -hmm. into actions that'll help you like convert existing things if you find that this is better for you. I know a lot of organizations are trying to, to bail on Jenkins just because it's extra overhead to deal with. Um, but there was a team, uh, there is a team most likely still at GitHub that was working on a tool to automate the migration of those Jenkins, Travis, Circle pipelines into wow. Actions workflows. And I think they were targeting pretty much enterprise customers. Um, it was a really cool tool. Uh, I got to hang out with them a little bit, do a little bit of dev work with them. Um, it was a lot of fun. And that tool was becoming really robust uh, when I departed from GitHub. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the near future, there's some sort of public release of something like that to where you could easily just point to your Jenkins server and get GitHub workflows out of it um, man, as that's a conversion a, process. That'd be a big win for some teams, man. I mean, there were some teams I worked with back in the DOD. They would do it today because that thing has become such just like, it's become its own problem. Like, yeah. It was supposed to help, but it's become its own problem. Yeah, it's uh, you got. It's like managing a whole new system, man. Jenkins yeah. is is crazy, yeah. but nonetheless. And if you're another insider info before we jump into it, and then we'll jump into it, I promise. <laughs> if you're wondering, like, if GitHub Actions is mature enough, even though I just said it's really young, if you're wondering about its maturity level, consider this. Microsoft owns the rights to Minecraft. If you don't know what Minecraft is, it's this uber popular video game, hundreds of millions of users, I'm sure. Um, it is a very complex build system that they have going on in the back because Minecraft deploys on every major video game console. It deploys on mobile. It deploys on PC. Um, and all of that, all of that testing and build step stuff is all on GitHub Actions. Microsoft has completely moved um, Minecraft over to, to Actions. So if they're banking on that, that's a pretty good indicator that it can handle the load. Um, I think when we were talking to that team, they said something along the lines of, it's like a hundred in 20 virtual machines at any given time to build Minecraft. It's, it's absolutely crazy. So the, it will scale to what you need it to do, even though it is still a little bit young. Dude, that's ridiculous. 120 to build that thing. Up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was the first major project. That was the, the alpha test essentially for the tool to convert from Jenkins into actions. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. So if you're wondering, can my, can my workload handle it? Ask yourself, is your project as big as Minecraft? <laughs> if the answer is no, the answer is probably yes. Dude, it's so sad that a game that my grandkids play requires more heft than some, you know, enterprise applications, but it really does. It yep. really honestly does. Yep. It's incredible. Um, a couple other things that are uh, built with GitHub Actions. I'm pretty sure the GitHub CLI that we pointed out, I'm pretty sure mm. that's built and deployed via Actions. The GitHub mobile app is built and deployed via GitHub Actions. Um, so that builds across Android and, and iOS, right? So that's, uh, anyway, the point is, it has the flexibility. It is young though. So if you're not plugged in and you don't keep up with it, it can burn you kind of easily, I guess. So Stay plugged in. That's the, the answer. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We, we're going to get off that soapbox. We're going to get started. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of reiteration here um, and drive this, these points home that we've been trying to make. <coughs> we're also going to move really, really fast. Okay. So if you have questions, make sure you, you ask those questions uh, along the way, because we're going to move 
really, really, really fast. And then we're going to do something sort of cool. Yeah. Okay. So first things first, uh, we need to start some work. What's the first thing we need to do if we're going to mm. start discussing work? Mm. Okay. Okay. I'm not even going to answer this one, y'all. Normally it's Matt and I going. So I'm going to look into the chat now. What's the first thing we do? Anybody. Gosh, this is when I wish we were in a room. I know, right? First thing, we're going to go start work. So it's work. So what's the first thing you do? Do you start adding? Raise an issue. Perfect. Cool. Let's Thank do you, that. Benjamin. Love it. We're going to create a new I issue. I like said that too. We're going to raise an issue on you. This issue is going to be configure a GitHub pages app. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is um, let's um make sure we understand pages we will deploy a simple page okay cool all right another piece of work that we're going to do we're going to open another issue right because we're just going to stage all of our work for the day right now we are going to um add a non-static web app um build an app that uses express js to add some numbers cannot deploy to pages now there's a reason why i'm opening all of these in issues right you get to fork the repo you mm -hmm. can also always come back to this repo because you're probably not going to get the issues that come along with it but if you ever come back to the parent repo here even after we close these, you can dig through history and see the things that we did in this uh, this course, right? So second thing is we're going to configure a CI CD pipeline for our server based web app. That sounds serious. Set up testing because Matt can't code, <laughs> set up uh, Docker stuff, or set up auto building Docker image, okay? And then host on GCR, uh, which is the GitHub container registry. So my DevOps folks, um, GitHub has a container <coughs> registry. Uh, you'll see it um, if you ever see if we're over here and you see packages, um, you can have Docker images and or like NPM packages. So Matt, let me right, jump in and ask you a question. And by the way, y'all, this is honest to goodness. This is a question that I'm asking right off the top of my head. Matt and I didn't discuss it beforehand, so I have no idea where this conversation, but let's keep it real tight here. Just take 30 seconds if you would, Matt. When people start putting issues in and the issue they write stinks, like it, yeah. it's, it was awful. Is this still the right place to have the conversations about, hey, the one that we did about add uh, a non-static web app, we need to change what's in the text of that. Yep, I can come. So you could say, hey, like, I don't understand what you mean, right? Ah, That's a so we, fair thing to say. Can okay. you elaborate more? Um, hey, I think there's a template for issues in this project. If you want to add a feature, can you close this issue, open a new one using that template. These are all acceptable conversations. So these are all conversations and they're not only conversations about what the subject is or the issue is, but it's also a conversation about maybe this issue needs to be redefined or touched up or tightened up a little bit more. So yep. yeah, th that was the thing that I was curious about y'all was as we raise issues, persons who maybe aren't familiar with technology, they'll tend to say things that are just a little off base for what we really need to do. And then that's when, you know, step back into the issue and try to get some clarification on what you're talking about. Yep. And let's say that happened in this one. Let's say Brooks was like, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, I can just come in here and I can edit this directly. So sometimes I don't even have to close them. I can edit this and say, um, this is just an example or using GitHub mm -hmm. Actions, okay, right, and I can update that. So nice. it's totally okay to have that conversation. Cool. Hey, Benjamin asked a question. Why should we use GCR uh, GitHub Container Registry uh, instead of Docker Hub? 
couple reasons, and I think we're going to reform the question. I'm not saying you should use GCR instead of Docker Hub. Um, I'm just pointing out that it exists, so we'll start there. Uh, second to that, um, why not use both? Like maybe you need some redundancy. Um, third to that, Docker Hub is, I think it's really limited for private image repositories, if I remember right. I think you get what, like three of them? Yeah, uh, it's about three, exactly. Yeah, whereas GitHub, I can have as many private images as I want. It's one image per repository. Another reason that I think GitHub GCR is good is that my code for the image lives right next to the image. Um, I'll show you. That's a good point. And, and so this is one of the major things I like about GitHub. So same thing for GitHub Actions. Why would I use Actions over Travis? Or why would I use Actions over Jenkins? Well, it's all in the same spot as the code. So we've shifted everything left again, right? So like we're, we're eliminating the number of tools we need to go out and get. So here's packages. These packages are associated with repos. So like here's a repo that has this, this package associated with it. And it, these are the different versions that got rolled um, for it, right? So these are just different ones. So I can just click that and say, okay, well, what's in this package? Oh, all of this is in this package. And here it is right here. And if I click into that, I can get the Docker pull for it or whatever. So the other thing would be, um, I showed you yesterday, secrets management with GitHub Actions, right? So um, to to push a Docker image to the Docker hub with actions is 100% possible. You don't have to use the GitHub package registry. You can still use Docker hub, but what you need to configure if you're gonna do that, I'm sorry, I got an eyelash in my eye, it's killing me. Uh, if you're gonna do that, you need to configure repository secrets with your Docker authentication information, right? Because you have to log into Docker before you do the push. Um, if you're using the GitHub container registry, so maybe you don't want to configure that secret, it's totally fine to configure that secret. Like the secrets are going to be kept okay. But maybe for some reason you have a policy that says you can't. In that case, I don't need to configure external authentication mechanisms to, to upload something to packages of the GitHub container registry. Um, Actions has a very special... Uh, authentication account that exists. It just exists. You can't do anything about it. It's always there. And if you use that, one of the permissions it has is the ability to create packages. Um, so you would never need to put personal, personal access tokens in there, right? You could always use this special token called a GitHub token. And you might be like, well, I don't like the fact that this GitHub token exists. Like that's scary. Like what if somebody compromises the GitHub token? The cool thing about the GitHub token is it's ephemeral. It exists at the, it gets created at the time a workflow run kicks off. It exists for the life of that workflow run and then it gets destroyed and it never exists again. So it's a token that can't be leaked. It, it'll never cause you problems in the long run. So should you use GCR over Docker Hub? Absolutely not. Should you use them in tandem? Probably. It's always good to have redundancy. Um, does that mean we can't push to ECR? Like, no, we could put that on Amazon's container registry. We could put that on Google's container registry. Right. I just, since it was a GitHub for everyone, <laughs> keeping everything on GitHub, that was kind of the goal is yeah. to show you GitHub and not to show you the Docker hub. But I'm definitely not saying use this instead of that. Um, <clears throat> just that here is another option and I, I personally really just like having it all in the same spot. Like I just log into my GitHub account. I can come over to packages. I can say, oh, like I need this. And I can click that and it should give me my, my pull, right? I get all the auto tagging. I get all the, the metadata. I can dig into, I think like what changed if I click these whatever, there's a, a bunch of stuff that comes along with it. I can see the manifest. Um, Docker Hub's a little nicer because I can like 
in it to some degree because I can quickly see like the Docker file for a tag, but like arguably, like I can quickly see the Docker file here too. And it's honestly not that big of a deal, right? So like I can see everything that goes into this specific image because it's all in one spot. So it's how often do you want to bounce between tools? It's up to you. I think it also depends too, wouldn't you say a bit on your target environment too? Because it's kind of cool that you can sit in GitHub and then you can go, okay, we want to go to AWS. We want to go to GCP. We want to go to Azure. So that, you know, you can really say, hey, we are a multi-cloud situation because if we find that for some reason we don't want to host this over there anymore, all of our stuff sits on GitHub so we can always just fire it right back out versus being locked into it. Not that there's any wrong, anything wrong with it. It's just it does seem to breed into the culture, the idea of we're not going to get locked into using just one framework. I don't like the idea of saying we're going to get locked into a vendor because most of the vendors will sort of put into your mind a certain tool chain, their tool chain. Whereas if you own the tool chain, you can say, this is where we want to go today. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. Back to our issues. Great question though. Like yeah. genuinely great question. It just really boils down to personal opinion rather than targeted technical answer. Um, and it's not a, an apples to oranges thing. Unfortunately, we got, um, we're going to do uh, set up a scheduled issue to help with team meetings. Hey, that's cool. Automates a daily or we'll say a weekly stand up issue. Okay. So I think that's probably, that's probably what we have prior to the cool exercise. Okay. So now we have our work, we started our work, okay? So if we were gonna go ahead and begin doing one of these tasks, what do we do now? Let's see if anybody gets that in chat. What do Ooh, we do now? So we've raised our issues, we've got them in there. Pretend we've collaborated and we have agreed. I'm going to pick one of these issues to work on. What do I need to do? It probably rhymes with plant a tree. <laughs> the worst part is like 12 of you stuck around for 12 hours of my ridiculous nature. And that's impressive. Bad humor. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing anything come through, so we're gonna move on anyway. Yeah, uh, we're gonna create a branch, right? That's the next step. Create a branch so that we can start the work. So I'm gonna come back to my code tab. I'm gonna make sure I'm on main, and I'm going to create a branch. And I think the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna schedule that sync. So, um, ooh, not capital. Schedule team sync. That's going to be the name of this branch. It's very targeted with what I'm trying to do. I want to create that from main. And now I'm here. Schedule team sync. Let me tie this back to yesterday, if I can, Matt, to make sure that I understand this correctly. So that issue, is that what we would consider to be a feature? And what we've just done is create a feature branch? Yeah, we could definitely call it that. So let's do that. Let's come into... We're going to schedule our team sync. We're going to add a label. We're going to ah, call that okay. label. Um, doesn't exist. So a feature. <laughs> there we'll you create go. it. Feature. Just like that. We'll give it blue. That's cool. So this is going to be a feature, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not going to add it to a project board or any other fancy schmancy stuff. But to help draw that association, Absolutely. So this is going to be a new feature for our project. Maybe not, we might not use the word feature. So like, cause feature to me in my head applies to an application, right? Like it's a new, right. a new thing. So let's say, oh, you know, maybe we don't like feature. We had that discussion in our team meeting. Let's yep, call it yep. an enhancement. Gotcha. This is an enhancement okay. to our project. It but doesn't we can try to, we can kind of treat it the same way though, right? We, just we can absolutely treat it the same yeah. way. Yep. Yep. So now we have 
a, a branch that if we make mistakes on, that's okay. We'll just delete it. It's not a problem. Um, and whatever was deployed on main, plot twist, nothing. Uh, it's not going to break anything. So we have our branch. Um, this is going to be a really nifty workflow file. Let me get it all copied over here. And then I will talk about it. While he's copying that over there, y'all, please don't, please don't, please don't miss the point here. That is, you know, I'm obviously I'm sitting here. We're all sitting together. I can see what Matt's doing here on my screen just as well. If I was, if I was disconnected, if I was just sitting here, I, I can still see the same thing. I can look in GitHub. I see what the issues he's creating. I can see the branch he's created. All that's right there. It's like the most seamless communication. And it really boils down to pure communication, not all the extra stuff. We've created four issues. We have a branch, just pure. What are we doing? Yeah. And look, your team manager come by and said, what are you working on? Right. Project manager comes by. She says, what are you working on? I'm like, go check the issues clown. Like, I don't have mm -hmm. to tell you this. Like, we don't yeah. have to take an extra 30 minute meeting just for us to update nope. you. You can take a five minute cruise over to the repo to see what's going on. And eventually All you right. will train them to do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah get a clicker you know uh yeah. <laughs> so i have what i needed copied in my clipboard um does anybody remember where i need to place a workflow file by chance this is something i always forget uh but workflow files have to be somewhere really specific or else i can't use them this is a good one y'all can you answer that one where do you put a workflow file inside your repo come on somebody guess i don't care some directory solid choice let's see Very what happens when we do done. some directory so we're going to create a new file mm -hmm. on our branch okay that's the important part the hidden dir <laughs> put it in the so, dot <laughs> okay we'll call it a uh, weekly there you go y'all nice think yep dot yaml I'm going to paste this in and I'll talk about it in a second. I just want to get it. I just want to get it um, in there. Cool. So if I come to actions, hmm, something's wrong. I don't see it. I see the one we did yesterday, but I don't see the one I just added. Mm, mm. Shucks. I think I'm going to get fired, Brooks. So I don't think I, so. I, think I don't it's know. Something else. I don't know where I'm putting files. So here's mm -hmm. the thing. That doesn't work. It's not in that workflows folder, which is why it didn't show up. It has to be in dot GitHub slash workflows, or you cannot use them. Has everybody got but, that dot GitHub workflows? But this makes it shareable. So like you could kind of shareable. You could stage a bunch of these in a repository and say, this is our workflows repository. Go grab the one you need as you need it, and it will never execute. So we're going to move this. Moving files in the UI is a little bit tricky. Yeah, it is. So I'm going to show it to you because it's, it's definitely a major gotcha. You click into the file so that you can read it, and you hit the edit button, which makes Weird. no sense, but that's what we're going to do. And then you can edit the path. And then I can commit it. Um, so let me go ahead and talk a little bit about what's happening before I commit this. And, and we'll walk through what this workflow file is. I'll make it a little bigger for you. Yep. That looks good, man. To do this. Yeah, well, the UI just went horrible. Okay, yeah, so this is a third-party action, okay? We're going to use a community-developed action. You can find this action on the GitHub Marketplace. Um, is that a bad thing? No. Is it scary? Maybe, right? It depends on what your constraints are. Is it going to take you a long time to go read what's in this action to figure it out no ask a developer to do it it'll take them 20 minutes how do i know where this action is well right here under the uses tab on line 20 right here 
this is the namespace and this is the repo name. So if I just copy that and I go to github.com slash that, Here is the repo where that, that action lives. So I can look into it. I could read up on it. I can see how to use it, um, whatever it may be, right? Here's all the information about how to use it. Here's examples. So if you're ever looking at a workflow and you're like, I need to know how things work, that's how you can find that out, okay? So let's talk about this from the top to the bottom. The name just names this, this workflow. We could name it whatever we wanted. If we don't name it, the name is the name of the file. So the name becomes the file name. If we don't name it, I like to name it. I think it's easier to find. The on declaration is the trigger, okay? And we showed you the trigger of uh, a workflow dispatch yesterday events that trigger workflows. I also showed you this massive document of all these triggers over here on the right hand side. Um, yesterday we used a workflow dispatch, which to manually trigger a workflow use this event. I am going to set this one up as a watch event. Uh, a watch event happens whenever um, somebody like adds a star or clicks the watch button on a repo. I'm going to use this event simply because we're not going to wait until next Monday for an issue to be opened. Okay. I'm going to try to show you a couple different events today. Typically you would run this one on a schedule like I have here and it uses the standard cron syntax. So if you just go to like a cron converter, convert Monday at 9 a.m. into cron, um, and you can place it right in here and use a schedule as a trigger, okay? Jobs never changes. It's just a declaration of the jobs that need to exist. A job is a collection of steps. You can have more than one job, which we will a little bit later. This job is called create issue. It has a friendly name. This is just for the UI. You can remove that and it will use this as the name. This is just for the UI to make it easier. For each job, and this is important to know about actions, each job is ephemeral. So each job will create a new virtual machine, which means that jobs do not do very well at talking to one another. So pretend I had a job that was save this file to the hard drive. And then I had job number two that was read this file from a hard drive. Job number two will never ever find that file because it got destroyed when job one finished up. Is there a way to pass data from one job to another? Yes, we're not gonna get into it here, but it is possible. Um, jobs can set outputs and other jobs can read those outputs is the, the short answer. Jobs also run in parallel, meaning job one and job two run at the same time. This can be a problem if job two is dependent on job one. GitHub Actions allows you to create that dependency. You can say de job two depends on job one. So these are things that you can work around that we're not going to dive much deeper into than, than what we just did. Okay, but that's where we're at. So we, we have some, we specify the, the virtual machine operating system we want this to run on. All this action is gonna do is make an API call to GitHub. So I don't care if this is on a Windows machine, a Linux machine or a Mac, it's an HTTP request. It can happen from a mobile phone for all we care. Um, so Ubuntu is the cheapest and fastest option, which this is still free because the repo is public, but Either way, we can limit the permissions that this machine has to the API or this rather this job has to the API 
In this case, I think that's a little outside of the scope. So we'll just delete it and we'll let it have the default permissions and it'll be okay. I hope, we'll see. If not, I have it over here. I didn't test this, so I could be wrong. And it should be because it uses that token. So quick recap, we got a name, we got a trigger, we got some jobs. We got one job that's gonna start a virtual machine on Azure that runs Ubuntu, that job has steps. Steps can have a name. They don't have to have a name. Again, this is just UI. In this case, it uses. Timeout, pause, hold up, wait a minute. Uses. Remember yesterday, uses meant that it uses an action. So that self-contained source code, action.yaml, maybe Docker file. It's not calling a terminal command. It's just an action. So in this case, we're going to specify this action. And I already showed you that this is just a repository, but I didn't talk about this part. So in order to call on an action, to say, I would like to use an action, you need to specify where it lives and a reference to it. In this case, that reference is a specific commit. Remember, every commit gets a SHA. We can look at that over here. Um, if we were to go to commits, I'll zoom out just a little. And uh, we picked this one right here. This one has a commit SHA, it's right here. So I can specify a specific SHA, which is helpful because if the developer of that action makes a change, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect me because I'm pulling it from this state alone and always this. Another thing I can specify when using actions is a release tag. So in this case, for pandas, if I if the, pretend this was an action, I could say at v1.4.1. And you'll see this with some of the checkout actions later. We say at v2. And you're like, wait a minute, v2 is not a big long hash. And you're right. So I can specify a release tag. I can specify a branch and I can specify a commit SHA. So I could say at main. That gets scary though, right? Because main can change. Right. So right. it's highly recommended that you use either a release tag because that is never going to change or a commit SHA. Now, a release tag is just an alias for a commit SHA, just for whatever that's worth. Um, so it just becomes a little more readable. I don't think there was a tag associated with this SHA. I just went with what they recommended on their own README. So we're going to pull from this one. Yeah. So really in this, this is that place, Matt, where um, we're talking about, you know, if, if they're out there creating uh, important workflows that have got to work right, this allows them to lock in a version. So if, if and what Matt's talking about, y'all, is the idea of a developer putting what's called a breaking change. Okay. Suddenly they put a breaking change in and then you don't know why Monday morning, why the thing just didn't work. So what you do is you lock it to a version. So if they do introduce breaking changes and things like that, you'll be in good a, a good situation. Exactly. Cool. So we're going to say, hey, I want to use that action, man. Go out to that GitHub repo, find that commit and grab that code and pull it into our handy dandy fancy Ubuntu machine. Okay. There you go. This action allows me, the user, to specify some, some variables, some parameters, and it happens to be in the form of assignees, labels, and a title. So we don't have Mona Lisa. Uh-oh, Mona Lisa. GitHub fun fact, <laughs> ready? This, this cat, her name is Mona. Oh, wow. That's I will new. get I my Mona that. when we come back. I actually have a Mona, it's really cool. Um, her name is Mona Lisa. So if you ever wondered if uh, GitHub was gender neutral, it's not. It's a, it's a email named Mona Lisa. So it's very cool. Whole history behind Mona. Um, I'll find my Mona on break and I'll bring her back. So we don't have her in our repo. So this is, this is what can trip us up. We don't have a user named Mona Lisa. We don't have a user named Octocat. Plot twist. This is not a cat. It's an octocat. 
in <laughs> another oh GitHub fun fact, I guess, that's just goofy. Um, look, it's actually got tentacles. So it's a cat head on an octopus body, and that's Mona. Um, so it's an octo cat. So if you ever see that, that's actually just a reference to the GitHub mascot. And then Hubot, we don't have either. Hubot is like a just something you can configure kind of like Dependabot. He's really annoying and tells you to merge your pull request. But we do have Brooks Seahorn. That's me. Okay. And we do have me. And this action expects this to be a comma separated list. That's not true for every action. That is just what this very specific action requests that we pass to this value. Secondly, labels. Um, we don't have any of these labels, which might cause this to break. So we're just going to say bug because I know that label exists. And we're going to give it a title. And we're going to call it um, weekly. Weekly team sync. And in here, they let us pass some markdown. So we're just going to leave it because that's fine. Um, we will delete this link, though, because I don't want that to break. Um, and pinned means, is it going to be pinned? That's false. And close previous, that's false, um, which would close last week's when this one opened. Okay. And lastly, we need permissions to interact with the GitHub API. Well, here is that super secret GitHub token. Remember yesterday when we managed secrets, we had the secrets context, we had to go into yep. a repo and add a secret. Well, that's where this GitHub token comes from, but you don't have to configure it. So it's your repository always has one secret. You just can't see it. And it's the GitHub token. And that's what the permissions up here were that we deleted. Those were the permissions that were going to be assigned to the GitHub token. So we could argue that right now our GitHub token is over scoped, but that's okay. The GitHub token is ephemeral. That doesn't worry me as we go forward. So I am passing that in as an environment variable to the virtual machine that this action then references. Is that always going to be the case? No. This is the difficult thing with actions is the creator of this action decided that's how they wanted to read this variable. It could have very easily been passed in as a parameter. Did they do it the wrong way? No. Did they do it the right way? No. That's totally up to how they chose to develop the action, which is why it's really important to go to the repo and read through their readme because they will show you how they're using these things. Mm -hmm. all right so now we've moved it we've talked about what's in it i'm going to commit these changes let's see if we can see it let's go to actions huh socks hmm. still not showing up okay so we've got it in the right place the file looks good right everything looks good yeah. so what are we missing Actions is a little fickle. That's what we're missing. There's another mm -hmm. secret, and that's certain events only apply if they're on a default branch. So since this workflow is on our branch, it's never going to show up until it gets merged into main. So wow, okay. So we've got a feature sitting out there, or feature, or a uh, what? What was the word we used? We got we an say, enhancement. We have an enhancement that's living on a branch. We did our workflow. We created our GitHub. We got our workflow file. We put our YML in there. We've done all this. <laughs> this is on a branch. It doesn't matter. We've got to get back to main. Yeah. How do we do that, Brooks? Mm, magic. It's got to be magic. FM freaking magic. Could you show us? Oh, I, I think it's that green button. Exactly. GitHub is already saying, hey, like you have some things that aren't the same. You're two commits ahead of main. You want to go ahead and start collaborating on that work now? And the answer is yes. So yes. we're going to create a pull request. And in here, we're going to say merge <coughs> team sync workflow 
into main um, so that it runs. This PR does dot, 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 right? Explanation, something, something good, right? We're going to create that pull request. I think we're going to run into a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Merging is blocked, right? You remember why? We set up branch protections. We said we need a review if we want to merge. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to request a review. Once we get that review, it's going to come through and we'll be able to merge. So we've requested a review from Brooks. He's going to go in and approve, and then we'll be able to merge this sucker in. And on my we... side, I literally just did a refresh on my screen. I'm sitting right now under my uh, in my inbox, which is just in the top right. It's that little bell up there. I saw a blue dot. I clicked it. Boom. I click it. I can drop right in, see what's going on. I can uh, comment on it. L-G-I-M-O. I can do a comment on it if I want to. You see the comment there? Yep. Did you Look. click the approve button? That's funny. I don't have an approve button. And y'all, this is not me making stuff up here. For some reason, I don't have an approve button. Yeah, it's, it's so hard to see. And I'm glad you're running into that problem because this is something that <laughs> I've missed a million times, which is mm -hmm. the only reason I know where it's at. You got to go to the files change tab then you get a review button and then you can hit approve. Does everybody see that? Back it up, Matt, back it up. Let them see it. Show me, go take it back up. So you see there, this is what I saw basically y'all. I did not see, like if I scroll down, There's I didn't nothing. see like the approve button. And that's the thing that's going to burn you. You're going to be in a situation. They're going to say, go ahead and approve it. And then you're going to be going, where is that button? And you're not going to want to say anything because you feel like you should know where it is. In this case, that's where it is. Look at the menu. You have a number one there. Obviously, something's up. Go click on it. Yeah. So the, the mindset behind this is if we gave you an approve button here, how many people would just click approve to get that notification to go away? Or how many people would just click approve just so they can move on? This forces you to actually see the change. Whether or not you read through it is up to you, but at least you see the change. And now you can click review. So I'm going to go ahead and hit, I'll go ahead and move it out. That's kind of the, the idea behind it. Cool. Quick approval. As you can see, though, Brooks clearly didn't read through that and he just approved it anyway. So it's not like it prevents it from happening, yeah. but it's just really important to know that it's really hard to find this. And that's the worst thing about a pull request. Okay. And again, listen to what Matt told us about that. The point was, is that I could just do, you know, LGIMO and send it. And by the way, that's what happens a lot. All the time. There's a lot of software developers out there, yo, they're going to front like they, you know, know everything about everything. When they go to read the code, they don't have a clue what's going on. They'll kind of send an LGIMO, boop, and it'll send it on down the line. What GitHub is making us do is go, at least go look at it, at least look and see what changed. And so that's actually a really smart way of, of kind of forcing the right behavior. So whoever thought of that, it, uh, good on you, GitHub. Cool. We got our approval. Thanks for that, Brooks. We're going to merge in. Boom. Confirm merge. Do we need our branch anymore? Uh, I don't think so. I think we can Never. get rid of it. Nope. Gone forever. Not coming back. There has to be. I'm going to get hung up on this because I'm. There used to be a way to restore branches. So I, I don't know. Wait, whoa, whoa. why there. would I do that? Whoa, back up. Why would I restore a branch? I could think of a, a couple of reasons. One, I accidentally deleted it. Two, maybe I clicked close the pull request button and it got yep. auto deleted. And oh, I need to wait. reopen all of that. <laughs> Is LGIMO a sub brand of the Korean electronics company. No, this looks good in my opinion. You might also <laughs> see LGTM, which is looks good to me. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. Or as I like to say, let's get this money. But uh, yeah, LGTM, LGIMO looks good in my opinion. Looks good to me. So now we're at main. Cool. GitHub. It's in the workflows folder. So let's go back to our actions tab. Now it showed up. How there it is. That? How about that? We'll take a look at it. Notice how 
The one yesterday has a button to run it. The one today does not. Different trigger, right? Yep. Watch event. So let's go ahead. And I am going to change this. I don't think unwatching uh, mm -hmm. triggers it. So we'll refresh it just to see. And then I'll rewatch it. And that should trigger. Okay, they may move this to just stars. So I'll star. Again, changes. So it looks like watch events now only apply to stars. It used to be you didn't have these choices with watch. You just could watch or unwatch. So I think that prevents it from understanding the trigger. But the trigger was I starred this repository. That's it. Watch. I can unstar it and uh, I can start again and we should get another run. I don't know if that's going to cause conflict because we just created two of these, right? So every time somebody stars it, it's going to run. Now, this is horrible, right? Like yeah. if you had a super popular project and you were triggering weekly team syncs every time somebody starred your repo, that's not a good trigger, which is why a schedule works better for this. However, to demo it for you, I changed it to right. a star. Um right. There are plenty of things you might want to do when somebody stars the repo, like say hi, for example. Mm -hmm. So if we come over to our issues, check this out. We got these two issues that were just added. Brooks and Matt are both assigned to them. And if we click into them, they have this body and they were created by GitHub Actions. So that's so freaking cool and powerful. Like if you have a weekly standup or a weekly team sync where you're kind of talking about the same stuff over and over or like the format is the same over mm -hmm. and over mm -hmm. and somebody on the team is going in there and building a document every week so that you guys can do that. You should do them a favor and not let them do that oh to my themselves. Gosh. Matt, that is such gold advice right there because y'all think about scrum standups, our daily scrum standups, where we're going to keep it. Well, what we should do really be doing less than five minutes. Let's say it's supposed to be less than 15 minutes. Everybody stands up. What'd you do yesterday? What are you doing today? What problems are stopping you from getting your job done? One, two, three. Boom. This thing's ready to go. Every morning, the team's got it. You just type it in, type it in, type it in. Done. Yep. And it's super flexible, right? So like, Let's show you how flexible it is. All of a sudden, we decide that the team standup is no longer, oh, uh, you know what we should have done? We should have linked this issue so that it closed because now uh, I have to go in and close it. That's okay. We'll close it. Boom. And what would it take to link it? Yep, we'll do it this time. So let's say yep. all of a sudden, our team decided this is no longer the agenda. We want to change it. Well, how easy it is, is it to change this automation? We're going to hit new issue, update the weekly sync issue body. Did everybody get that? He didn't just jump in to changing the thing. We started an issue. This is so important because, again, not only does it let you uh, uh, track what you're doing, but it's also a way of communicating out and up what's the team up to? What are we working on? Exactly. So I have my issue. I'm going to come back to this one and I'm just going to close these two out. Mm -hmm. um, can I close multiple ones? Well, I no. thought you, dude, I thought you could. Can you not? So many things change. This is the only, like, <laughs> I also only ever really use GitHub from like a terminal. <laughs> So. Sorry, honest, honest to goodness, y'all, we're not goofing here to set you up for another learning. Like, seriously, like, as you we, as you use GitHub sometimes from moment to moment, just like using AWS up, oh, there was a change. It changes. Yeah. Okay. So we have an issue. We're going to go ahead and we're going to create a branch to update mm -hmm. sync issue. We're going to create that from main. Same workflow, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to come into there, grab that workflow, grab the weekly sync hit the edit button and let's just remove these two items. And let's say we don't want this. Great. We'll commit that. We'll put a good commit message. Yep. Uh, more if you need it. Yep. We're going to commit that to our branch. We're going to hit commit. Done. 
Come back to the code tab, open the pull request. And this is where we can link it to the issue. Yep. So update weekly sync issue body. Uh, super detailed reason to make a change. Over here, we then grab linked issues. Uh, so it says, huh, you can use the closing keyword. So let's say closing, uh, or it, I think it's closes. Closes, it's closes, yeah. Number, and, and now I that. can come up Does everybody see that? That is cool. 12. That is cool. Just that keyword throws it right up there. So you're like, oh, what was the number? Don't sweat it. Type closes on a new line, boom, drop down. Yep, anytime you hit that, that number key, you can reference anything. So we have issues, we have pull requests. Yep. Whatever it might be closes will link these watch so i'm gonna hit create pull request and here it is linked right here it's linked to this issue which is super cool um we're gonna do a quick review from brooks yep i just got the pop-up over here so that took maybe five six seconds to make it its way over we can see who's responsible we can blame him when it gets broken review me it's been reviewed give me a second man Grammarly oh, you know what speaking of this is a cool time to actually talk about this here's a diff right this is a change now we can see what what i changed really quickly this got removed in favor of an, a blank line and this got removed in favor of nothing so that's what he got to see so when so when y'all when y'all get hit with somebody over your shoulder saying okay what what did they change there's your spot. That's where you go to and say, this is what they moved. This is what they put in. And you can say it with, you know, it's for those of you who maybe are, are, are new to your career, there is nothing finer than to be in a meeting or to be asked a question. You go, bam, with the information. Nothing beats that. Yep. Okay. So what's cool is, oh, here's the revert button. They have. Oh, wow. Okay. It's so changed. Oh, it's so different. So we merge this and you'll see this issue over here has turned purple, which means it's closed. So I can, I'm going to delete this branch. I'm going to come back into our issues and we'll see that that issue auto closed for me. So mm -hmm. just by typing closes in an issue number, I automated the cleanup of this repository. That is not an actions thing. That is just a regular thing. You can do it on any file. I now have the update. So we'll come to actions. Notice how like this didn't run because I didn't click this button. So like when I start this, it has a different trigger. So it's like smart enough to not run the same thing over and over. I'll start this again. We should get a new run very quickly. There it is. Shouldn't take more than a second here. This number will change. If we really want to know, like we can click into it. It's done already. Um, this is where those friendly names come into play is here in this UI. And there we go. We got a weekly team sync. It was assigned to Brooks and I. If we click into it, it now has a different body. So it was that easy to edit our workflow to give our team a new agenda. And then it's still automated 100%. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. But that can go for so many things, man. So many things can be automated with that way. Just get the thing done. I mean, like... If you're doing this, it, it literally, I, I don't know if you agree with me and Matt are on this or not, but it's almost like if there's this thing you're doing constantly over and over and over again, and you can see it inside this interface, you could probably automate it. Always automate it. That's my thing. So I know I just broke a lot of rules and I committed this domain, but what I wanted to do, <laughs> oh, actually, I don't even want to do that. I want to make sure you, you guys have this schedule in case you take uh, and fork this repo. But I want to remove that star thing because I'm going to use it on other workflows. So I needed to, to hurt the trigger on this so that it won't work for us. So I'm just going to verify that that happened. So now there's no trigger. If I come into actions, it probably, yeah, it probably yep. throws an error. Yep. Yeah, it's going to say, if I click into that, it should give me, right? It can't be shown 
next run, there's no jobs, has no clue what it's doing because of uh, there's no trigger. So but that's okay. That's what we want. So yeah. that brings us to our first break. When we get back, we're going to dive into uh, setting up probably the CICD. We'll do the pages thing last. I want to yeah. get to the CICD part uh, and we'll show you something that's more for developers because this was definitely more for any team member that might use GitHub. So exactly. All right. So let's take 10 minutes, y'all. All right. We are back. I was, I was about to say, I was literally about to do it. And then I was going to say, all I got from AWS was a stupid t-shirt. <laughs> all we got from INE was these backdrops, you know? So, <laughs> well, hey man, these backdrops are pretty sweet, man. <laughs> We're looking good. All right. So that's not true, by the way. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. It's not. This, the, the rig. As we both clearly are wearing INE shirts. Um, anyway. But, and also the rig, all this stuff that y'all can't see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's a cool little thing. I think, honestly, <laughs> side tangent for those of you that care or maybe have kids and want a cute plushie, I think GitHub operates a store because um, that's where I got this. I, I think it's open to the public. Uh, so I think there's a GitHub swag store somewhere. So if you want like stickers and plushies and silly stuff, you could probably go buy one. Just saying. Oh man, they sure do. It's uh, the githubshop.com. The GitHub shop? I think so, yeah. Oh, it's a scary. You are a brave man. Oh, see, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Look it up. I know, that's a, that's a scary yeah. search. You didn't know where that was going to go. I had Cookie no clue. cutters. Yeah. So here's an entire store if you want to GitHub stuff. Okay. But whatever. I got a bunch of the coffee cups. Too. Oh, man. $10 for uh, 50 stickers. That's not bad. Yeah, the stickers are really good quality stickers, just for the record. Um, anyway, back to it. Um, Let's jump into our next workflow. I kind of lied to you. My bad. Blame Brooks. It's his fault. Um, I was oh, thanks, the thanks for the URL, Matt. Matt B. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close this issue just because um, keeping our issues tidy so I know where to go in, in today. There's one more thing that I want to do before we jump into the, to the DevOps developer side of thing. And that is... Um, set up auto link checking uh look through our docs to make sure links work this is a really cool thing that you can do if you're managing documentation or whatever mm -hmm. this is this could get a label as an enhancement you don't have to use labels but you can yep yep um so for that we're going to need a branch add link checker And notice another thing about my branch names, like not only are they deliberate, but they kind of say like what their purpose is, like update this thing or add this thing or create this thing. Like same with commit messages. It shouldn't be like, I am going to do this thing or pull request titles. It's I did this thing. So um, not updating readme.md it's update because that's what you are trying to do you are trying to update it you're not in the process of updating it as weird as it is it's kind of like a internal best practice kind of thing a lot of projects are really um strict about that so we're gonna go ahead and create our new file it needs to be in that special spot github workflows and we're gonna call this a link checker yaml let me just copy the workflow. No paste, please. Okay. So this is going to check markdown links. Um, and I'll zoom in so we can read this a little better. Um, we gave it a friendly name. It should be very familiar at this point. This one's interesting, right? We're going to use a new trigger. This is on push. Now, we haven't been using the terminal, so push might seem weird to you. But every time we click this commit new file button, that is a push event. Um, if you're from a terminal and you type in git push, 
quite literally, that is a push event and that will trigger this. So what's cool about this is we say on push, we want you to run this job, which is only one. It's going to run on an Ubuntu machine. It's going to have two steps. Here's a step mm. and here's a step. And what's interesting about this is this is out of date. Uh, so this uses this actions at checkout. And this is a special action. Anytime you see this actions, anything, that is a GitHub maintained action. Okay. Master is not a branch name that we use anymore, right? That used to be um, main, but master has turned into main. Uh, and this is just showing that you could reference a branch name. I happen to know that um, actions checkout is currently version two. So we're going to check that to V2. But I know that. How do you? Let's find out. How would we do that, man? That's a great question. We're going to go to github.com slash paste in actions checkout. Look, it's just a repo. It's not magic. It's just a repo. And I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to look for the releases. Hey. And I can see I can use all the way up to version 2.4.0. Version 2 is going to reference one SHA. And if I scroll down in here, I can uh, read the docs on how to set this thing up. And they tell me everything I might want to know for options. They give me some scenarios, whatever it might be. And here you go. Simple as that. Okay. That's how I find that. So we're going to go V2. Um, then we're going to use this repository, which same thing. This is a community action. Whoever this person is created this action. And... The only way I know to use version one is because I went to this repository and I looked at the releases to see where things were. The only way I know what options I can path right here or pass right here is because I went to this repository and I looked at the documentation and I knew how to configure it. So what this is going to do is it's going to spin up a VM. It's going to run a git clone. So just like you guys cloned or saw me clone a repo yesterday, that's what checkout does. So all of the code in this repository is now gonna end up in this virtual machine. That didn't happen for our issues one because we didn't do anything with the code. We interacted with GitHub. We didn't need to look at any of the files in the repository. So they never got moved into that virtual machine. But in this case, we want to look through files to see if the links in them still work. So we need them and this is how we get them. So this is going to basically clone them into this machine. And now we can do stuff with this action against those files. And in this case, um, we've set a couple options for visibility. We've said any file inside of the path docs slash markdown files, that is a markdown file, any file inside of docs slash markdown files will be checked by this action to see if the links are valid. Every a, time a push in the repository happens. And that's at the root of that repository, right, Matt? So right there yes. at the root Relative of the repository, to the root. there's a docs directory, and we're going to look inside there for markdown files. Technically, it's going to look like this. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's looking for the markdown files, but it's going to, we're going to traverse that to a depth of two, looking right. for our, our markdown files to process. Gotcha. Yep. And in this case, we don't have any, and that's okay. But anytime a push happens, now this is like, oh, man, do we really... Do we really want to check our markdown links when we make a push to a JavaScript file? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I so I wrote in here a little note that schedule makes more sense. Um, if you just like scheduling your weekly standup issue, maybe you schedule a weekly maintenance workflow that checks your markdown files every week. Mm -hmm. This is just to show you that I can force a workflow to run on a push. That's all. And then uh, I will delete the trigger um, at the end of the day. Actually, 
Yeah, that's fine. We'll do that. We and, also you know, don't have any markdown files, so I don't expect a miracle to happen. Yeah, you know, and and Yalta, really, I, I, I'm going to kind of punch you here with the idea of what Matt's is teaching us. Um, there are a lot of corporations that just recently went through some major, major, major work to look at their documentation, and what they were trying to find was offensive terms and uh, in, and the and inclusive language. Different companies had different names for it. It was a big deal. I know that at uh, AWS, I was a big proponent for it because there was a lot of stuff. And you know, it, it's y'all. It's it's not anybody doing anything evil, anything wrong. They just don't know. They don't know that's an offensive term. They didn't know. Oh, there was an opportunity to include some inclusive language. The thing that Matt and and what a lot of them actually did was they just created basically text parsers in Python. This text through uh, parse through all the text. The thing that Matt just showed us here. That is an awesome way as it comes in the door to make sure those checks are made instead of waiting until you're downstream to go, okay, we need to check this. So really open your mind up to some possibilities there. As this stuff is being created, you can check it right there automatically to make sure that you're in a good space. Not to mention, it's, it's just points for you. It's just points for you saying, no, that whole thing has been automated. We've got that. Excellent point. We got a question in chat. You can't check a private repo with this thing, right? As it cannot clone it. Wrong. Uh, I understand where your confusion is, though. Um, That's a good a question. repo that contains the workflow files. So for this one, GitHub for everybody has the workflow files. If this were private, it still works. The actions checkout action will still work because the, the checkout repo is public. So it's the repo of the action, it's visibility that matters. If you had an action that was in a private repo, you could not pull that into other repos. I could set my current repository private and use all the public stuff I want. So public or private things can consume public things. Public things cannot consume private things. I hope that clears it up a little bit for you. I totally understand where that confusion would, would come in. Now, there are other things that like you can build local actions to like there's a you can write all that source code directly into a private repo if you never wanted it to reach out. So on this take, like, let's say I have a, a repo that isn't allowed to consume anything public, well, I can write all the source code for the actions in that repo and call them from the repo, but I will always be able to get actions check out because it's public into whatever repo I have, even if it's private. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the vampire theory, right? Vampires can't enter your house unless you invite them in. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so crazy, check this out. It ran, I didn't do anything and it's not on the main branch, right? So that's another thing. We still have a branch. So push events apply to all branches. Right, and we can see that here. It's on the add link checker branch. Our other one down here, our weekly sync, is running every time a push happens or attempting to run every time a push happens because it doesn't have a trigger. So just ignore that. It's not actually breaking. It just doesn't have a trigger, so it's freaking out. This one, though, is just not working because of whatever. Let's find out. So it says this job failed. Let's take a look. And here is a bunch of logs on why. So there's runs inside a Docker, um, four packages. Can't find a config JSON. That's okay. Ah, can't find the directory docs markdown files. Mm. So this breaks. So this might be something that makes sense to add in this pull request. If we are going to add this workflow, and this is a hard dependency for that workflow, let's go ahead and create that now. So we will come over to our, well, first let's open a pull request, right? Cause we've got a little bit of work done. Um, good title, good message. We got a little bit of work done. So let's just go ahead and do this. We will link it to um, this issue. So that auto closes. And when we're ready, we'll request the review. And you'll see, look, 
it has since we have something with a push event now we're starting to get checks that show up in this screen so only things that that are relevant are going to show up here notice how we don't see the hello world ones or the, the weekly sync ones and there's not really a way to control all of that um easily for for this purpose there's other fine-grained things you can add to the trigger that control it but we're not going to dive super deep into it i'll show you a small example but not super super deep um so this is currently failing that's great we can click details it takes us back over to where we just were and we can see why so let's go ahead and add that we need docs what is the folder docs underscore markdown or markdown underscore files and you've got your approval on the change okay <laughs> perfect so we'll create a new file it's going to live in the docs um markdown underscore files and we can't create an empty folder on GitHub. So I'm gonna to have to call this demo MD and like actually create a file. And let's just put a link in for the sake of watching this thing run. And we're gonna say HTTPS colon slash slash google.com. We know Google's up, right? <laughs> Should be. <laughs> All right, we'll commit that to our branch. We're still not committed to main, um, but it's running. So let's try to watch it because this one builds Docker. So uh, we can kind of see that we can catch it, right? So this is the setup job that just is building the Docker image um, that is present in that, that actions repository. Uh, now it's checking the links. We see it. We're getting all of this extra output because mm -hmm. we said like be verbose i did that on purpose but look all links are good nice so we know that that's that's cool and it's a green check so let's go in here and break that let's see what it looks like when it fails oh and now look the pull request will be able to merge right every all checks have passed so like from a CI point of view, you could say, hey, like now we're kind of running continuous integration on content, not on code. So we could see that everything is there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to merge this now and then I'll, I'll break it. Let's delete yep. the branch. It auto closed our issue like we wanted it to. Pretty cool. I'm going to break some rules as I break this. We're going to make a commit to main. Just for demo speed purposes. I hope this is not a URL. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think this is a real website. And if that hits, that's gonna be great. <laughs> um, so let's see, that was a push event, right? I click the commit button, push event fires. It's updating. Let's see, let's see, let's see. This is the weekly sync one that's always going to fail because it doesn't have a trigger. If we click on it, it might throw an error for us. It doesn't. Um, so we'll go back to check markdown links. We're updating. We can come over here. And I can see this, Matt, uh, sort of on the backside of a push event where like, did everything work? Is the URL up and running? Are we getting back a, uh, an okay resp a 200 okay response from the site? Yeah, that's the thing is you could configure multiple triggers. So you could say, hey, on every push that is not to the main branch, mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and parse all the links. Um, also on a schedule, parse all the links. Um, also when, I don't know, an update to that folder happens, parse right. all the link, whatever. Like you can set up all kinds of triggers for that. Mm -hmm. Now, Look here, one dead link found. We got all this information about the links in that. So that, that's cool. So we know how to fix it. Now, this doesn't, it's not tied to a pull request. It's not going to stop anything from merging or whatever it might be. But consider the next step to this. This is, this is one step. We just had an issue creation thing, right? We, on a schedule, we create a new issue. Well, what if 
we created a new issue if this failed like if this step fails then we create an issue saying you need to check these links mm -hmm. that's a helpful thing so like let's see what weekly sync looks like i think it might be easy to edit let's see yeah this thing just creates issues right so we could actually we could do that we could steal this whole section and tack it as another step onto the link checker thing and say if failure so meaning if the previous steps failed then run this one and it could create an issue and say hey man like you need to go check that workflow run you have some invalid links and that would just automate that maintenance for you it's kind of cool homework for you if you want to try to tie it in and play with this once you get these notes all right um super cool let's take a look at our issues let's jump in and let's add uh let's add our github pages app i think this is going to be quick and easy so we'll start with that one so what I, the first thing i need is a branch right so i'm gonna mm -hmm. come over here I'm gonna grab me a branch you and see how that flow happens y'all it's just the automatic way we start working we have a new we start with issues we go in there we create a branch that's good or you can call it your feature branch for your coding it's just this natural rhythm you start doing when we use github yep exactly so add pages app um i'm gonna scrap this branch and i'm gonna do this because of how github pages works first i'm gonna come over how dare you 404 on me of all people uh I'm going to come over to our settings. I'm going to come down to pages and I'm actually going to enable it. And I don't want to enable it off of main. I'm going to create one called GH pages. And it says no results are found. So I probably need to create that branch first. It, that has changed. It used to create it for you. So I'm going to oh, create a wow. branch called GH That's pages. That's a cool feature. I wish that was still there. Yeah. It used to create it for you. So I'm going to create a branch called GH pages. This is the only time I'm not going to have a deliberate name for, for my branch, right? Although that is kind of deliberate. It is the GitHub pages branch. So see, look, just by creating that branch, it automatically enabled GitHub pages on this repo. It didn't even think twice about it. Um, so I could select a folder. I'm just going to leave it in the root and that's fine. So let's go back over to our branch. It automatically did that. That's so. What, cool. So was it? Wait, hang on, everybody. Hang on just a second. So we created a branch called GitHub Dash Pages, and GitHub internally just picked it up. Yep, and deployed it to Pages. So y'all, that's that's a gotcha. Watch for that. That's some insider information. You're going to create a branch. You create a gh a gh dash Pages branch. <laughs> Something else is going to fire. That's almost like a reserved word type thing. So yep. careful. Very much so. So um, we have it set to, to serve our, our page from the root. So I'm going to create a new file. Um, this will be super quick. I won't bore you too much with code. And honestly, it's not about the code. This is just a reiteration kind of day. So we're going to call this code. index HTML. And we're going to oh, paste man. in some HTML. Always about the code. We're going to commit that to GH pages. Guess what else just happened? That workflow to check our links just just fired off because it's oh, on a push so event. Cool. That's so cool. It's on a push event. That's simple, people. That's simple. So um, we're going to add another file to GH pages. This is going to be main.js. The reason why I'm including the world's smallest JavaScript file is just to show you that pages is capable of interacting with client side JavaScript. Yeah. So and, and matter thing. of fact, y'all, while, while that was running, as I go look at workflows, if I'm manager, if I'm just responsible for what's going on or just what is going on, I can see right there what called it. Like I just see now create main.js. I can see it running. I can see uh, uh, pages build and deploy is running. I can see exactly what's going on. Yep. There we go. Lots of status about what's going on. It is taking place. So the purpose of adding 
a CSS file, an index file, and a JS file is when we showed you pages before, we kind of just showed you the markdown side of it. Truth of the matter is, is I could write real code if I wanted to, and that's going to get deployed out to pages for us. So now if I come over here, again, it's not server side. That JavaScript just adds an event listener. If you know anything about web dev, that's all in the browser. So it's it's not server side. And that's the limitation is it can only do um, client side rendering. And right? that makes me wonder about how much fun it would be to use um, Rust for uh, web assembly. So here you context. go. I had to clear the cache, right? I had to do that hard reload. <laughs> Once I did the hard reload, here we go. Hello, this is the in the HTML that's in there. If we hit this, we get an alert, right? So like JavaScript works, all of this is client side rendering. So maybe you can't find a cool docs library that you want to do. So you write real JS or real HTML or whatever. Okay, cool. Pages done. Look at Just that. Just find a great example out there on the web. You know what's great now? That's kind of done. We don't have to merge this branch. As a matter of fact, we don't want to merge this branch. How come? Why, do, why would we not want to just go ahead and merge that in, Matt? Because that is where GitHub Pages is deploying the code from. So what becomes really cool about this is notice how main doesn't have an index file. It doesn't have a CSS mm -hmm. file. It doesn't have a JavaScript file. And as I create another branch, like, let's just check this one off really quick. Okay. We'll say you're closed and then we'll pick one to create a branch on. Let's do add a non-static web app. So I'm going to create a branch for main, um, add non-static app, right? Now this branch has none of that fluff from GitHub pages. So all of the GitHub pages code is isolated to the GitHub pages branch. So to be honest with you, what we probably should have done first <laughs> is set up GitHub pages so that we didn't have these markdown files or the .github folder over here. And we could have just had a very clean page deployed. It doesn't hurt anything that we didn't do that. But now when we make a change to our non-static app and we merge it into main, it's not going to show up on that GitHub pages branch. So we can continue doing private things or whatever we need to do in our repo while pages remains publicly deployed and independently managed for our project. Hold up, Matt. So this actually, this actually is not, y'all, I'm not, I'm not making this up. I'm quite truthful here. So quite literally what we've got here is we almost have like a separation of concerns that we use in programming, like modularization. Yep. So we have this project. It's super cool. It could be code. It could be documentation, whatever. I, I like it. I don't want to mess with it. I want the GH pages to give it a nice front end for whatever reason. And instead of that mucking around with main, I can have this branch, which is like a first, uh, what we call in programming, a first class citizen yep. in this ecosystem that says, this is for sending out JavaScript enabled. This branch, again, another first class citizen. This is our static. This is what we also send out where we don't want. So is that kind of where we're going? Because this is some very inside stuff right here. Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate to how you could treat it. Um, you just can't do fancy stuff like make back in calls, right? So oh, yeah, yeah. It might be really good for like a project blog or some mm -hmm. documentation or a portfolio or mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever you come up with creatively, but there is a separation of concerns. And now the question comes in, well, why wouldn't I just deploy a website? Well, let's pretend that I didn't already have my own domain. I don't have to buy a domain. GitHub supplies one for me, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm a student or I don't care about what the URL is, which is, there's plenty of things I wouldn't care about the URL for, I don't have to buy a domain. I don't have to configure a web server. So no Nginx here, no Express here, no, no Apache, no whatever. I don't have to configure a web server. I don't have to configure any of the networking that I might need to allow access on specific ports. All of that's done for me. DNS um, off the table. Yeah, it's, it's completely handled by GitHub. I focus on nothing but the code. It's kind of cool. And now... Whatever that page is, I'm assuming fits with the project 
So it's again, all in one place. So here I have a page deployed. Now I have the source code. Over here, I have the Docker image. I have all the automation and the CICD pipelines. And I don't really have to go many places. I have the entire project management all shifted left right where the code is. So instead of, there's a document in, G in Google that we use to describe this, but over on the network drive, we've got a Word document that describes something. The actual source code is sitting in um, team server someplace. Um, uh, we've got Jira for keeping up with what's going on. This is all one place, y'all. This is, this is not a little thing that we just said. It's for a lot of people, that is a ugh, bane of our existence that we have all many separate disparate systems that don't talk to one another. Whereas with this, it's all in one place. Exactly. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you what the, the web application we're going to add is. Uh, again, this isn't about the code. I don't really care about what's going on in the code uh did this this is the wrong repo <laughs> stand by just kidding i lie i gotta get the right repo with the code in it <laughs> um i don't have it give me two seconds let me pull this up um, basically, I want to show you this app running really quick so that you understand what we're going to do and uh, you'll understand why it doesn't work or else this is not as fun. Like there's no point in CI if you can't see what we're doing. So <laughs> it already exists. Where? I didn't know. Oh. Derp. <laughs> Whew. It's everything's so zoomed in. It's hard. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me pop up. Go. Leave me alone. Um, see, day two and three. And this is our, what is this called? Demo app, I think. Yeah. Demo app. And is this an express app? I think it is. Yes. Is there not? Oh, sorry. Dependencies, right? So like, yep. Y'all oh. hang tight, hang tight. We're getting it. Yeah. So I got to install the dependencies and I'm glad you're seeing this because guess what we're going to need to do with actions. We're going to need to install dependencies. And I just used a mm -hmm. terminal command to install dependencies. And that's exactly what we're going to do with actions as well. Okay, cool. So. Let's come to my super cool web app. It's super sweet. I know you're jealous. Okay. Man, nice. I know. I know. Let's go ahead. We're going to pick a number. We're going to say two. We're going to say four. We're going to hit add. And two and four is 24, right? Man, that's good stuff. Super <laughs> sweet, right? Nice. Super crazy. Okay. That's what this currently does. That's it. So that's the code that I'm going to currently add to this. That's what this currently does. Um, so that's where we're at. And some of you are like, yo, that's not right. And you're absolutely correct. So I got to add a couple files. It's going to take a second. So feel free to ask questions if you have them as I do this. Our web app. The problem is we, we're just not going to be able to see this. Um, because it's server side, it's rendered from a server, right? And GitHub pages can only do static stuff. So we can't, there's no good way for you to see it outside of me showing it to you like that, but that's okay. So we're gonna commit this. This is just uh, the JavaScript. Um, we are going to commit this. Um, add a file. Add that. Add another one. There's not that many, I promise. <laughs> oh, that's a few, uh, few lines of code there, huh? little bit 
so many that I had to zoom out to find the button. <laughs> okay, and uh, let's see, that's that. We'll create a new file. Source, what is in here? This is our culprit, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not gonna work after we quote unquote fix it either. So if you're, <laughs> if you're expecting it to work after that, you're gonna be sorely mistaken. Um, that's okay. All right, last file. I feel like as I'm getting older i can't type as well <laughs> it's a bummer i don't even know how rooks does anything man i swear <laughs> okay so this is our web app cool uh i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna continue the git flow for this or yep. open a pull request uh this is a non-static web app good title do something better than that good message And I'm going to say, okay, cool. Create this. We're going to pretend that Brooks is going to review that. And we are going to link this to, what is it called? Static. There we go. Yep. I just right. got it over on my side. So our markdown check is failing because that Google link is not a, a real one, right? We hammered in that, that crazy link. That's okay. The good news is we can admin merge this if we uh, really, really need to. So I don't think we will. Okay. You've got an approval from me. Perfect. So notice how it's saying I can merge, but the button's not green. That's because of this, right? So yeah, I can do it, but it's not like a green light to do it. The whole box is yellow. It's like, it is, you should think about this. Double check yep. what's failing. <clears throat> Thank you. I double checked. We're fine. I'm going to delete the branch. All right, cool. So that web app that I just showed you, this, this super broken thing, it's really good. It's a good app. Also allows us to do stuff like this. Right, you yeah, can't that's add. Super fun. That's some super fun checking letter. on your uh, data type, right. man. Nice work. So, <laughs> th yeah, there's there's some problems, right? Yep. Yep. If if you know uh, anything about programming and or math, uh, you'll realize that you can't add letters together, and even the numbers in this application are coming in as as letters. Okay, the actual code that's doing that. Um, I think it's in here, right? This form is is passing it in as as text, right? It, that's mm -hmm. just the it comes in as text. See, type text. Uh, so that number is is a is a text field. It's not a number field. Um, that's okay. We might want to fix this though. We could very easily fix this if we use something like continuous integration right like we wouldn't ever want this change to make it into our our code base because it's broken but brooks just approved it well what if we had a check that would run our tests for us and the good news is is we have tests i wrote some tests uh so if we do npm test i hope that's right right we can see like hey like these things are are failing completely right and we could have GitHub Actions run this test and tell us that. So let's go ahead and set up that. And that's called continuous integration. We're not going to go deeper than that on what it is. So like, let's, so this is going to be interesting. So this is technically two workflows for us. The CI part and the CD part, but it was one issue. So what I might do in this case is create a new one that says config CI for the app, um, I realized that number, uh, I don't know what number it is. What number was that? Baby, come back. Number seven. Man. <laughs> number seven um, contains two work items. So 
this issue addresses the first one. Right, and I'm gonna submit that. And what's cool is I can always click number seven and go see what number seven originally was, okay? Um, so sweet, this is definitely uh, <laughs> broken stuff. This fixes a bug, right? Um, so we'll come into our code. We've got our issue. Let's create a branch. Add CI for app. And in this case, we want that NPM test to happen all the time, like automatically. I always want my code to be tested when something changes to this code base for whatever reason, right? Um, so we're gonna add a file. I said, we're gonna add a file, <laughs> do it. That is gonna be .github slash workflows. And we're gonna name this um, web app ci.yaml, okay? And this is where actions gets a little bit fancier. First, we give it a name, nothing new. Oh, we've defined two triggers, okay? Two triggers. When there's a push to main, when there's a push to a branch named main, I could also say a branch named dev or a branch named testing, whatever. It's a, you can specify more than one. Whenever a push happens to main, this is going to run. So this is good for, I've worked on the pull request. I've now merged it into main. I just want to run my tests one more time to make sure that the entire code base, now that that merge happened, just, <laughs> just double checks out, just in case there was any weird drift between the two. And it also runs whenever a pull request is created from the main branch. So whenever we create a pull request from main, we're going to run this workflow. Is this the most optimal way? Nope. Is it a good way to show you that two triggers can exist and we can start filter them out? Yep. And that's the only reason it's here. Okay. So you would want to think this through a little bit more pointed for your use case. This is a really good example. So when one of these two things happens, guess what? We got a job called build runs on Ubuntu. And what is this hoopla? What well, is go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, just what is that? <laughs> Teeing you up, man. What on earth are we doing with the Node yeah. version? Yeah, so programming languages change, right? There are different versions of Node.js, which is a Node.js app. This allows me to test it against the different versions of Node.js. So the other thing I might be able to do is test it on Windows, test it on Mac, test it on yeah. Linux, right? I can test it with this language, that language, whatever it might be. It allows me to run these various tests. And I happen to know that this one is probably going to fail. Node 10 did some silly things that I think express breaks on Node 10 now. Um, so we'll see how that reflects. And I could be wrong. But since we are going to run the code, right? We're going to do stuff to the files. We need to run checkout. And then we can specify this matrix node version. So that's going to like say, hey, like for the current thing in the matrix, grab the, the version. So it's going to say the name of this step is use node.js 10, use node.js 12. Use no so we're going to get a series of steps all so as gonna, a loop. So that's going to iterate automatically without us creating like a for loop or a while or anything like that. If we say node version in brackets, it's going to treat that like a loop. And then all we got to do is matrix node version, or it could be, it could be matrix dot uh, something with Rust where I'm checking versions of, of, of libraries that I'm bringing into Rust, whatever it is, I yep. get that automatic iteration. And we could call this whatever we wanted. Okay. But it's just uh, already yeah. written. Yeah. So then we're going to grab another GitHub maintained action that just does some node stuff. 
and it it just ensures that it's using the right version of node to run the following commands which happen to be npm commands just like i just ran in the terminal mm -hmm. right and they have these as like individual run steps um this will install our dependencies just super quick if we have a build step in our script this will run and then this will run npm test which is what i just ran down here to get this output yeah. okay now, the reason that that just a, just a quick question to make sure we're all clear. I noticed that the name down there are actually the runs. I've got three different runs. Uh, the first run doesn't have a dash next to it. So is that because of the name? Yeah, this just denotes an object in the list. This is YAML syntax, which mm -hmm. we could really dive into on a whole day if we felt like it. Um, name is optional. I can add a name here. Name. Um, build if there is a build step right so it so, adds it gives us a bit of a bit of documentation then about what yeah, this thing's doing and okay. all name does is it shows up in the ui so i'll leave this one without a name mm -hmm. and and you'll be able to see the difference in the name yep. uh or in the ui so let's go ahead and commit this to our ad ci we're really zoomed in here so just to give you give y'all a reason i want to point that out was that that piece right there y'all so that if um you know if you're developing an application if it's just you know again it could just be a documentation repo if there is somebody other than you say like the devops team or the help desk or whoever it is who keeps an eye out for this stuff by using that name tag you can make it easier for them to figure out what just broke mm -hmm. okay so uh we haven't opened our pull requests yet Mm -hmm. and we haven't pushed to main so therefore this uh hasn't even showed up right so we probably actually need to get that to main so let's see what happens we're gonna try that might be one of those weird ones that has to be on main but we're gonna find out um we're gonna pretend that there's a good body to this okay we'll request our review right now just to get it out of the way we'll mm -hmm. link our issue this closes Closes number config CI. Cool. Now let's check. Here we go. Here we go. Pull request is what happened. Okay. Let's see mm -hmm. if I can show you. So a pull request just happened, right? So that's why this is triggered. So we can go into it and you'll see, look, the jobs, even though we had one job block, is now running on 10 it's running on 12 it broke on 14 it broke on or it might break on 15 yep i don't know why it broke on 14 i'm pretty sure that's what i use right works on my machine not yours no i use 16 okay so we'll see where else it breaks if anywhere we can they all broke fantastic <laughs> plot twist they should all break right now so <laughs> I'm gonna go that. ahead and approve, by the way. Are you cool with that? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. We can just get out of the way, right? Okay. So we can come in here and we can see why it broke. Um, there's no build step. This is CI, no such file or directory. Um, package.json. Did I misspell that? Let's take a look. By the way, y'all, as I approve that, as soon as it popped me back, I see that my uh, I approved something that broke dramatically so now i feel like a big old goober <laughs> as you should let me go see if i misspelled that that's possible no that's correct we heard let's check the branch mm -hmm. it's there love me what is broken? I don't know. Again, we're not going to spend forever troubleshooting yeah. if something yeah, goes wrong. Um, I would try <laughs> to get this quickly because the next part's cool. If so, if not, it uh, we're kind of dead in the water, which sucks. Path. It should be right there. Do you want to take a break, dude, while you debug? Yeah, I think that's actually a good call. We're at that time okay. anyway.
right, everybody, welcome back from break. I hope everybody had a chance to uh, jump in there and do the evaluation. Adam got it posted up for us. So again, when you get a chance, jump in there, let us know what you think. Meanwhile, back in Vegas, dun, 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 the chips fell in the right direction. And the problem, the problem was simple. Uh, it's, so it was a pathing issue. So GitHub Actions assumes by default that we're in the root of the repo but i got all fancy and nested all of this in this folder so i needed to go update that and you'll see it's still failing but it, this is the failure it's supposed to have <laughs> so it's still failing now uh but it's no longer saying that it can't find what it it found right the tests are now failing so this might be a problem when we get to putting this into a Docker image. So I might move these files um, out to the root of the repo. But before I do, let me show you how I fixed it because this is a neat feature that is new to Actions. If I switch to the proper branch and we look at the CI, all I did is in the job, I set up some defaults and the default was anytime there's a run step, which is our NPM problems here, what was failing is it couldn't get our dependencies because it didn't know where to find the file. So every time there's a run step, the working directory is now set to be the proper directory and it's able to run our tests as we expect. Makes sense. So that is that was the initial catch. Um, as a result, I think I'm going to move these back into the root of the repo. I don't think that'll cause a problem, but it might. Um, we're going to try to to do it without moving it first. Um, and if we have to move it, I'll move it. And it is what it is. So we're currently failing, though. And we can see that in the pull request. So let's go look where we would actually see this. because We're doing work. We're like, oh, no. <laughs> Yikes. Some, some checks. <laughs> All checks. Uh, right? um, Yikes, this is failing. So like, let's click into the details. We'll find out why. That's the markdown links. Of course, I picked the one that we don't need. Right. The one that is allowed to fail right now. So we'll come into here and we'll find out why. And the test failed. And the reason is it can't find any tests. How about that? So let's go ahead and just pop in here and we'll add the tests really quick. Uh, they're simple. Um, so if we come, let me pull them from my thingy. Where are you? Where are you? Okay, so we're gonna switch to our branch, add a file. That file is going to be in web app or sorry, demo app, mm -hmm. slash web app. And then it's going to be underscore tests underscore. And this is just a, a, a what just the testing library expects. Um, this is going to be different for your project, I'm sure. Nonetheless, so we're going to add our tests, right? Super, super valid testing here. Um, and we're going to run the commit. And that's a push event. It's taking place uh, not on main. So that's not what's going to run it. You'll notice the pull request ran it because there's this synchronize event that happens every time you update a pull request. So since we have it set to pull request, there's a lot of like sub things that take place. So if we came over to the events that trigger workflows and we look at pull request, Anytime a pull request gets assigned to somebody, it's going to run unassigned or labeled or opened or edited or synchronized, which is what happened. We just pushed an update. So we can limit those runs just like we limited what branches trigger this workflow. We can say only run on a pull request comment or only run if a pull request is assigned. So you can further filter down what triggers these things slightly outside of the scope. But let's see why we're failing now. We'll click into 12 and look, 
our tests ran. So now we're failing because we have bad code. We're not failing because actions is broken. This is, is flat out saying you have one test and it failed. And there's the so, difference right there. We actually see the suites, the test suites are failing. Okay, cool. Yep. So let's come in here and let's collaborate in our in our pull request. We'll say this is the workflow. I don't really need to see that one. So we'll collapse that. And this is the test, which that's not the problem either. So we're going to need to go, we could cheat and just edit the test, right? Um, <laughs> let's go back over to our proper branch. And let's grab the culprit, which is this add numbers function. Mm -hmm. And we are going to uncomment this set of lines out. And I think at this point, we can comment these out and we should be good, right? So we just, we, we saw that we had failure. We went in, we fixed the code. Again, not a course on, on programming, which is why I just kind of blew through it like that. But we saw that we had failure. So we're going to go in, we're going to fix it. Since we ran a synchronize, all of this is going to run again. And I think we're still going to fail on 10. I hope we still fail on 10 because I'd like to demonstrate like the matrix because does different stuff. So of course it doesn't fail on 10, right? So now everything is there. It ran cool. We ran the tests. We can still click into it. We see we passed. So now I think it's safe to say that we could merge this into whatever our trunk is or whatever our dev branch is, right? This is the part where we'd probably have a feature branch merging into a dev branch, getting ready to be merged into a release branch before it finally makes its way back to trunk. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, it's safe to say that we can merge this without problems, right? Like our code works. I think, I think that's fair, but probably doesn't work well. <laughs> um, so we'll show you, I guess, uh, what changed. So. Let me um, come in here and I will just grab that, that file and I'll uncomment it so you can see it working. Just maybe some people that's helpful for you. And let me start the server. So this is the change that took place. If we come to this and we try to add D to three, it says, hey, that's not valid anymore. Like you're not allowed to do that. Okay, it's not, it's not still not a good app, right? And now it's saying everything's invalid. So that's broken too, <laughs> right? Cause it's still treating these as text. And like I coerced it into numbers, which it can't, like it's just struggling. So again, bad code, code's not the point. The point was simply that we are able to set up CI to where our test pass when we make these changes, they fail when they don't make these changes. And we did this all right inside of GitHub, we didn't have to do anything um, extra, no Jenkins, no, no nothing. We just were able to do it right alongside our code. But now the idea though here is, uh, Matt, just in case, I'm, so I understand it, what we're really seeing here is we're seeing the development process. I make a change, we test it. We make a change, we test it. We're iterating towards the right answer. Yep, and this is not just for developers too, even though we're doing it with code, like, Imagine that being your documentation, right? We make a change, we, we verify the links, we check the style guide, right? We make sure that a style guide was properly applied to our documentation. Our documentation. We alert the right people. Maybe at the end of it, we turn it into a PDF and go store it on a Google Drive somewhere. We can automate 100% of these steps along the way without the need to like... Um, like write code, right? Like these development tasks kind of exist. So I've been doing a lot of talking. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to send you guys on a little task. I want you to have a little fun. I want to go back to our profile readme's because now that we see that actions can do stuff, I want to apply that to our profile readme's. So if you remember how to get there, it's github.com slash your username slash, well, your username. 
Does everybody right. got that? So you're going to do GitHub slash username slash your username, not Matt's. Do your username. Remember, this is just a repo, right? Special repo that has um, its name the same as yours. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to do something fancy schmancy. Uh, I want you guys to, to do a quick Google search, super quick Google search for RSS feeds. Um, I'll show you. You can find any RSS feed you want. Maybe you already know of an RSS feed. Um, let me shut down this really quick just so we're not using resources. So um, you can use any RSS feed you want. You can, you can find one, what is one. Uh, I, wow, you search RSS feed and you don't get anything good. <laughs> do, do slash dot, man. Top RSS feeds, here you go. Here's the most popular ones. Here's the top 100 for news. Yep. Pick one, doesn't matter. Pick one that matters to you, okay? And what you're gonna do is I want you to copy the RSS link. We're gonna need that link for the feed, okay? I'll see that normally these things begin with RSS and the URL. That's typically what you'll see. Looks like Huffington's got a little bit something different. It doesn't matter. Typically right there next to that orange follow RSS, that's the link you're looking for. That's what you're gonna to wanna to copy. So wherever you're at, whichever one you're picking, grab that value. Yep, grab RSS, <clears throat> any link. You can find one that you like, you can, grab a quick one for now doesn't doesn't matter you maybe you're going to change it later okay but grab an rss link i'm going to use cnn's don't don't come after me with pitchforks it's just uh again it's a link that i'm going to use so what do we issues who created issues i probably created issues what <laughs> just happened yeah i created issues awesome so let's go through the flow, right? We're gonna create an issue to automate our profile readme RSS feed. And once again, y'all, we didn't just go do a thing. We went to issues first. We are going to use uh, GitHub Actions to dynamically update our profile readme with things we care about using rss okay sweet done that's my issue hope you're there hope you got where we're at we're right here let's go ahead and create a branch add rss feed action boom nice and simple now we're going to add a file this is going to be super slick dot github slash workflows slash update readme rss dot yaml okay and i'm gonna you'll you'll be able to to fork this over but it, it'd be super quick for you guys to uh to actually just type it it just wouldn't take you long um i can i think the formatting is going to get messed up if i paste it in chat um let's see hold on what i will do is i will come to github for everyone i will create an issue and i'm going to say this is your rss feed code and i'm going to come in here and i'm going to say this is yaml and i'm going to paste that and i'm going to say that so if you go to the github for everyone repo you can copy the code from this issue and you just click this little thing up here okay we'll cover it real quick we're going to update the repos readme nothing special it's going to happen on a workflow dispatch which means when we click the button it's going to update again this is one that probably benefits from being on a schedule right if you want to update your maybe let's take a step back like maybe you want to add your projects dynamically to that readme. Every time you work on something new, you wanna update it so people know what you're working on. The, you have to decide what that trigger is. If that schedule is once a week, fine. If that schedule is every time you push to a specific repo or whatever, that's fine. You might have to tweak the trigger. RSS feeds kind of make sense to do like, hey, like every day or every hour, go ahead and update this, fine. In this case, we're gonna use a manual trigger, but just know that 
this is something that benefits from being on a schedule. I just want to show you something that you can do. That's all. We have a job. Job has a declaration. We didn't give it a name. Didn't give it a name. So it's just going to say update in the, in the actions thing. Mm -hmm. Runs on Ubuntu. Notice how it doesn't check out the code because it doesn't need the code. This is uh, We're going to reach out to that RSS feed, that link you just copied, and we're going to make a GitHub API request. Um, honestly, I think Jason does check the code out just a little differently. Uh, Jason is uh, a developer at GitHub. He's built a lot of like crazy GitHub things. So you can definitely uh, look into his account, follow him if you're interested in stuff. He's actually responsible for a learning platform that I'm going to turn you on to here in a minute. Um, and we paste in that URL and we're going to take this commented stuff and we're going to need to copy this, right? It's, it's commented out now, but we're going to need to copy it because we need to configure a section in our readme where we want this to go. So there's two different steps here, configure the workflow and then edit the readme. So once you have that committed to branch, you're going to come on that same branch. You're going to grab the readme and you're going to edit it. And wherever you want it to be, you paste in what you copied and undo the hash marks. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You can just leave that there like that. And that is where the RSS feed is going to populate. So we can commit those changes. We see nothing yet. Next step, pull request, good title, good body, always a good body, create pull request, and merge that back to me. You're on your own, your own repo. You're the only collaborator. Go ahead, merge that in. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting nothing over here because that's just go, loops back to you. So now we're in actions. We click this thing, hit run workflow. And as we run that, our profile readme will now dynamically be updated every time this, this gets triggered to uh, pull the latest top five things from that RSS feed and update our profile readme, right? So this is just, again, a non-developer thing that you can do to make your readme a little more personal. Look at that. I didn't do anything but run <laughs> actions. Mm -hmm. So GitHub for everybody, this is something you can do. Maybe you write a blog post and you want to update your blog post. Maybe you have projects. Maybe, I don't know. There's a million things you can do. The, the latest hacker is, knows. Yeah, the latest you go out to Ycom and you know you pull the news RSS feed. You could pop that in there, make it look like you're doing stuff and you're not, yet everybody's getting the latest hacker news <laughs> right there. Exactly. Which is why the other day I asked if the, the links were manually put in because I said this looks an awful lot like something I'm going to ask you to do. And uh, <laughs> it does, but this was all dynamically pulled. Um, and if we give it a couple minutes and we run it again, we're going to get five new things that show up mm -hmm. there. And you can go to that actions re our repo from Jason and you can see the different ways to configure it. You could probably have 10 things show up if you wanted yep. to. So exactly, Lola. That is a it's a very cool trick you just showed us. Very cool. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. Um, super cool. I'm trying to keep this as for everyone as possible. And I feel like <laughs> we just took a really deep dive into overly technical stuff. So this is a good way to to reel it back in. So yep. work on your own profile readmes. Think about how you can apply actions to them. Uh, and honestly, if you look up like awesome profile read means you're going to find a lot of them use actions to do cool stuff. And that's mm -hmm. an interesting way to get ideas. So, all right, we have one more piece. Just one, one more. We have one more issue. All right. Let's see what it is. Okay. And then we're going to talk about a little bit of stuff, but that's it. So then we could create an issue off of this and the aspect of time we're not going to create another issue to break this up, but you'll see it was mentioned in a different one. So let's go ahead and create a branch for setting up our CD. So once again, and, yeah, other than the fact that we did that, there's your workflow again, y'all issue branch. It just becomes natural to work this way. Yep. And some of you, some of you 
might want to argue that this isn't CD. And I will hear your arguments and I will side with you, but this is the beginning of CD. Okay. So just, we're not going all the way through. I'm going to need you to just work with me and pretend a little bit. All right. Can we do that? Can we do that? All right. Thank you. All right. So what we're going to do now is we have this code. Yay. It's really ugly over here for some reason, probably because it's JavaScript. Uh, so oh. we have this really ugly code and we're going to put this into, we want to dockerize this. So we want to create a container out of this. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to pipeline that. So we're going to do our, our tests first. And once our tests are good to go, then we're going to build that Docker image and we're going to store it in GitHub packages. And then we can pull it and run it from a Docker container and all that fanciness. Caveat, pathing problems might exist here. This is another one of those things that it kind of expects it to be in the root repo. I will try to fix it quickly on the fly. Um, but I kind of expect this to break, even though the workflow is accurate, it's totally going to be a path problem guaranteed. So we're going to add a file to our workflows. Let me copy this. And we're going to say create and pub docker image dot yaml. Now we're getting big, huh? Mm hmm mm hmm Okay, I got to zoom out a little bit. So this is one that you could probably find in the starter workflows. Like when you when you come over to a repo and you hit actions, you hit new workflow and you, you look through here, there's probably one, let's see, Docker. We hit enter. Yeah, publish a Docker container. Right. So you, it's probably one that was over here. I can't remember where I found it, Yeah, but I think it is. The point is I use official Docker actions. So this is what makes me think that I just grabbed the one from the starter workflow scroll, please. Is we have this like disclaimer that this uses actions that are not certified by GitHub. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think we're using <laughs> actions that are certified by GitHub. So we'll see. We gave it a name. Check it out though, new trigger on tags. We haven't even talked about tags. Tags are a way for us to say, this is a release. This is a stable release that we are going to, to send out, okay? Which kind of helpful when we're talking about Docker images, right? Like we don't really wanna go through the, the hassle of building them all the time. So for our use case, we're gonna say, hey, like once all of our tests are good and we decide that we're ready to go, we will tag a release and that's going to get us a Docker image that we can then deploy to wherever we want. Okay. Not exactly the ideal pipeline here. Just pretend. Come on. All right. So here we set some environment variables. What's cool about this is these variables now become available to every single job. And in this case, we only have one job, but if we had three, four or five, they could all access these global environment variables. These get set as environment variables in each machine that gets spun up, okay? We're setting one just to point to the GitHub container registry rather than the Docker hub, okay? And then we're just gonna name the image the same thing that the repository is named. So we're gonna end up creating an image called GitHub for everyone, right? Kind of a bad name, but it'll work. Whoever named it, should be fired. So our job is going to be a build and push image. That's the that's the, the, the declaration. It's also going to be the name because we didn't declare a name. It's going to run on Ubuntu and we're going to give it some scoped permissions. Now, what we're actually giving permissions to is this GitHub token on line 32. Okay. We're going to say, you're allowed to read the contents of this repo and you're allowed to write an image back to packages. Everything else you need to simmer down and sit down, okay? No touching, right? So those are the permissions that the GitHub token is gonna have. Since we need to deal with the code, we're gonna check out the repository. We're then gonna do some setup steps like logging into Docker. In order for us to publish to a registry, we gotta log in. So we're gonna log in with 
the GitHub container registry, we're going to use our username as our Docker username. And we're going to use that sweet little GitHub token as our password. So I'm not configuring nor storing nor risking my actual Docker, Docker Hub credentials at all to do this. This is all self-contained inside of GitHub. GitHub.actor is the GitHub context, which is metadata about the repo. The actor is the person that triggered the workflow. So if Brooks triggers it, it's going to be Brooks. If I trigger it, it's going to be me. And that's going to change every time. And that's okay. Because we're using the GitHub token as our password. So Docker is just going to let us log in like that. And that's what the GitHub container registry expects from us. So we get away with some little secrecy here. <clears throat> the next thing is we're going to do is we're going to use Docker as a metadata action. And you'll notice here's a release tag. Here's a SHA. Here's another commit SHA. We're going to use their metadata action to format what, the, what we want the tags to look like. What's really cool is this um, has output. You can't see it, but we end up using it down here. You see it says steps, meta, outputs, tags right here. Steps, meta, outputs, labels. Well, meta is the ID for this step. So we're saying steps up here on 23 dot meta dot outputs, which we can't see. This action sets them though. And then we're using them. Okay. We can find that out by going to this actions repo and looking at that action.yaml or the documentation. We can find out what outputs it sets. That is also where I got this crazy pattern of information is from that actions documentation. They have a couple different formats for the Docker tag. This is the one I chose to configure, okay? Lastly, we're gonna use Docker's build and push action to look at the current context and do its thing or build from the current context. This is why I think this is going to break. I genuinely think that it's going to expect all of this in the root of the repo. Mm, yeah. Right. And it's not going to find it there. Yeah. If it breaks, I will move everything to the root of the repo and we'll see what happens. Okay. But I, and I can't, I can't set that working directory because all of these are uses steps at least i don't think what i could do is try i'm, I'm okay with trying uh let's see it was defaults and we'll say uses and we'll say working directory and that is uh demo app slash web app we can try that the other thing is, yeah, okay, let's try that and we'll see if it works. Yep, give it a swing, man. I don't know that I can do that. So step one is done. We've got that set up and configured. Um, it's not going to run because we haven't tagged a release. However, our other stuff is going to run because we're doing stuff that matches those triggers like when we open this pull request guess what cic or our ci is going to run right all of that's going to happen we're, we're burning a bunch of actions minutes right now it's cool um because it's free public repo yeah. um all right so let's get the pull request open we're going to pretend there's a good title we're going to pretend mm -hmm. there's a good body mm -hmm. um we're not going to request the reviewer yet because we want to get a couple more things set up first um, I guess I'll link it to our only open issue and let's get back to work. Cause we're not ready yet. So let's come back to that branch and we need to add the Docker file, right? Like we got all the Docker stuff set up for the workflow for actions, but now we want to add that Docker file to, uh, our code. So I'm going to come in here and let me just grab my Docker file.
Boom. Really simple. Okay. We're going to grab node. We're going to set the working directory inside the container. We're going to copy all of this stuff over and we're just going to run npm start. It's not going to be fancy. It's not an overly complex Docker file. Um, and, uh, okay. I don't have it. I'm going to add, a, well, I'll skip it. I was going to add a Docker ignore file, but there's only one thing in it. So it's not a big mm -hmm. deal since we're not really caring about trimming this container down or this image down to be super, super small. All right. So the damage has been done. And I think, I think this will work, but break. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and merge this. If I can get, I'll request my approval now, because we're going to pretend that all of our checks were good and sweet approvals in. And this one doesn't run until we tag a release. So would I want to wait that long? Probably not. Okay, I would probably build that that container right now. Once the CI finished, I would say, hey, like this job depends on this job. Give me that artifact now, like, but to just to keep these a little separate and it gives me an opportunity to show you tags, right? So you got to work with me here. We're breaking some conventions so I can show you stuff. Uh, all right. Let's just double check that it's in there. Cool. Docker file exists. Great. Let's create a new release. Dun, dun, dun. It's simple. Choose a tag. What do we want our release to be called? We're going to call it V1. That's it. We're, we're basic. Okay. We're going to say V1. The target I can set to a branch, right? Mm -hmm. I can set it to uh, a couple other things um, a little differently, like if I was using git from the command line. But in this case, we're going to set it to a branch. We're going to set it to main. We're going to call this our initial release. Uh, and we could write up some documentation. Here goes docs about our release. Maybe a change log exists here. Just saying, wink. Uh, so maybe a change log exists here. This is where you might want to specify what's changed between your releases. Um, you can set this as a pre-release. That's fine, but we're just going to live real close to the sun. We're going to publish that release. Why? Oh, I didn't tag it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I didn't hit create a new yep. tag. Yep. You got to do that. Create a new tag on publish. Hold on. I need to have control over the tag, which is the problem. Uh, okay, I hit enter. I didn't click that. There we go. Now the tag has changed. So sorry. The reason we need control over the tag is because in our workflow, we said trigger when a tag gets created that matches a specific pattern. And that pattern was V anything else. So if I tagged this breadcrumbs, it wouldn't trigger our workflow, which is why I need to do that. Right. So I'm not just attached to the tag that much. There's a reason. There's a reason. Cool. That's it. We published a release. It, it zipped up some stuff for us. Um, some things I've done in the past is use like Pandoc to take markdown files. And when I tag a release, it converts them into PowerPoints and then attaches the PowerPoint to the release so that clients or, or customers or other teams can download the presentation if they didn't want it in Markdown, right? So you can tie in workflows to edit releases and stuff. But now that that's there, look, we should have actions. Where are you? And that was a commit to main commit let's see what doesn't it like it says failure invalid type for on interesting so it's saying that our trigger is not invalid so it could have uh just a bad space somewhere on tags oh wait i saw it go back to it dude did you yep 
you've got a double you got a oh no it's you're okay you got v star okay you're okay coming at me sideways whatever whatever aha uh-huh. it's probably release not tags mm-hmm. i don't see a tags in here so yeah um that's fine <clears throat> so pretend that that works and in this case we're going to do a workflow dispatch in the event of time just so that we don't um have to re-tag a release yep and i hope that doesn't hurt the actual tagging of the of the workflow we'll find out so push has happened that's not what we want we come up here create and publish a docker image let's run this workflow should we do this is the worst part you gotta watch paint dry yeah. Uh, as you're watching the paint dry, feel free to update your uh, your profile readme's. And it failed. And my guess is invalid workflow. Why? Unexpected value uses. Yeah. So it's saying that this isn't valid. What's awesome about this is you're seeing some <clears throat> actions troubleshooting. Remember that default section? I'm almost guaranteed I'm not allowed to use uses in the default section. So if I just click right there in the error. It, it opens up the, the nice. workflow file for me right to, to it and it annotates what's broken. And that's exactly what I thought. I can't use this defaults thing. So there's going to be a bigger problem. And that's that this probably won't be able to find what we need it to. Yeah. But the point being right there is just how smooth and easy that was to get to the source of the problem. Because oftentimes we're doing, we're talking about pipelines and trying to figure stuff out y'all. I mean, just to sit there and stare at it. And, and y'all, I have done it so many times through my career. Um, you know, you're sitting there at 3 a.m. in the morning staring at something like, why isn't this thing running? And you just don't simply have the output from your um, from your uh, development environment to figure out what it is. That right there is a big deal. The fact that it took us right to the problem. Yep. So we're going to let it run. <coughs> and we're going to see it fail, I'm guessing, because, right, it can't find the files, right? It can't, like a tag is needed to push to a registry. So maybe it's not a file problem. Maybe it's, uh, it didn't, well, it didn't even get to building this. So, yep. okay. So we can come back and find that, right? And you're just going to drill this whole thing down uh, until you get to the, the bottom of that, which this is a, uh, um, no Docker image version has been generated. No Docker tag has been generated. Check the tags input which is interesting. So we're getting, we're getting some verbosity on the feedback so that we know what to look for. Again, we're not going to spend a whole ton of time here. Um, it didn't like the tags, couldn't find tags, probably because it's supposed to come out of a version, um, which I don't know if that got tinkered with because of the tags so not gonna go through crazy troubleshooting here yeah no don't need to but it shows you how we can find it really quickly yep so you'll have this if you fork the repo so you can edit just that little piece to Mm -hmm. that that's in the, the web app you could if you do it all from this you'll see that it builds just fine and it would upload it to the registry. Um, you know, and that's you- kind of the, the, the point of what Matt just showed you right there. Like if we were working on this together and, and all of y'all could do this, you can fork that repo, you can hack away on it, figure out exactly what's going wrong. Then what do you do? Pull request. Yep. Do a pull open re- a pull request. If you want to open solve a pull it, request, let us know. Free. Hey, let us know. Hey, I found it. I know what it is. Then we can review it and go, you know what? Dead on. Add it back to ours. Then ours is updated. Yep. That's a really good point. And if you want to contribute back to this repo, that's, that's fine too. You don't have to, but you you're going to get like contribution graph stuff and it's good yep. GitHub practice. And if you contribute back to our repo, we're probably not going to tell you that you screwed up. We're probably going to help you. Uh, right. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's a difference. So I'm going to add in uh, one last thing. We're going to close this issue. We're going to pretend that this, Oh, we already closed the other one. We're going to close I'll leave this open. Some of y'all are going to need that code. We're going to add one last thing and I'm going to do it without an issue. As soon as the code tab loads, I think I can, I think I can. 
No. GitHub has its moments. Um, I'm gonna add one last thing. I'm gonna break the rules while I do it. And I'm gonna stage um, staged workflows. Uh, I'm gonna stage some workflows for you. Actually, I'm gonna do this differently. I think. Yeah, so if you if y'all are going to fork the repo, wait a second. Don't do it yet. Yeah, I'm going to do this differently. Hold up a minute. I am going to add a file, but instead of creating a new one, I'm going to upload one. Hey. Right? I figured this might be fun. Uh actually I do need to create the folder first. Okay. Let's see if I can create that folder. Y'all, I don't know where he's going. I don't know what we're doing here. <laughs> Ooh, no, it didn't let it happen. Yeah, oh, it created it as a file. Oh, no. My goal is to show you it can't just create empty folders. Nope. Um, you got to create like a like a like a touch to file. Yeah. Yep. Read me. Dot MD. Staged workflows. Here are some examples for you. Okay, cool. We'll commit that. Wow. <laughs> oh, me, oh, my. The demo gods said not today. They did not. This is why everybody not live demos today. are the worst. <laughs> All right, one more time here. Staged workflows slash no, no, no. Hey, hey. Read me. Staged workflows. By the way, there has to be a space or else that thing freaks out. Yeah, give out. it a space. Yep, give it the space. Um, here are examples for you. Wink. Wink, wink. Okay, cool. Great. So I'm in this stage workflows thing. I'm going to click on add file. I'm going to say upload files, which is cool because now I can drag and drop files and I don't have to do all that crazy, like copying, pasting of the, the Git mm -hmm. flow, everything. So if I come to home and I come into INE, I should have all of my source code files right here. So check this out. I can just copy all of these. These are all YAML files and I can drag them right here. And that just did the upload on all of those files for me, which I can then stage workflows, right? That's a, mm -hmm. a commit message. I hit commit and uh, it's going to go ahead and it's going to add all of these. So that's just another small way that you could, if you're not a uh, command line person, you know, right. open text editors, you come into stage workflows and here you go. They're all right here. So I want to talk about a couple of these and then we'll get you guys out of here because it's Friday. So yes. we looked at our check markdown links. Boom, it's here. We looked at our create and publish a Docker image. Boom, it's here. The next step could be taking that Docker image and deploying it to ECS, right? Spinning up a container, running Docker, this one actually goes through an entire build and tag process again, right? But nothing stops you from plugging this into Amazon. Nothing stops you from plugging this into Google or Azure or whatever. Here's an example workflow because some of you guys said you were a little devops -y, So I will leave that example workflow in there for you, right? Which is why I said, I know it's not quite CD, but you put these pieces together. You got yourselves quite the CI CD pipeline. Okay. All right. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. Uh, we talked about the scheduled weekly sync. And we did the update readme. Here it is if you need to copy it because of that issue. And we did the CI portion where we ran some NPM tests. Okay. Let me see if there's anything in this file that's worth chitty chat chatting now. Oh, first and foremost, whenever a push happens to the branch of release, this one triggers. That makes sense, right? We want to release code to Amazon when we make a push to the release branch. We just automated deployment. What up? We'd set some environment variables. Remember, 
Uh, setting GitHub secrets right here might not be the best play, but there's other places to set them down here. All of these secrets are stored inside of the repository secrets, and then the environment variables are read in. This is a specific commit. This is a release tag. I'm not seeing anything that's jumping out as you, if you want to run more than one command in a run step, you can use some YAML syntax to run multiple commands. Okay. Uh, that's, yeah, I think that's about it. So what cool. I really want to do, push that in. All of that's pushed. All of that's ready to go. If you want it, fork it. Yep. And uh, you have all the notes to include all the code uh, that exists, which you saw how bad it was running at your own risk. Um, it's, it's all there, <laughs> but that should give you all the examples you might need. You can, right. you got the project board. This is also a public repo. You can always come back to this and reference all the closed issues. Mm -hmm. this is what we talked about and what we did. It's, and uh, I just want to point out, like we put on this whole three dates boot camp. And it didn't cost a single penny in GitHub fees. And like, we did a lot of stuff. Yeah, we did. And so going back to what's the catch, the catch is this is a public repo and GitHub can now use it to train something called Copilot, which I guess I'll leave you with because it's cool. Check this thing out. Copilot, my VS Code peeps, is a, I'm trying to zoom out just a tad. Copilot is an extension for VS Code that I do not have installed on this <laughs> VS Code. Of course. So we'll install it really quick. Now be careful with the one he's doing here, y'all. If you want to make sure, make sure that it's from GitHub because people love to name their stuff after other things. And so you'll download some bad stuff. Yep. And then you get this cool little guy down here. And I don't want to disable Copilot. We're going to leave you on. Uh, Copilot activation failed. Why? Well, let me register. How? Boo, hold on. I'm going to share a different screen with you. <laughs> uh, let me grab my personal workspace <laughs> where I know these things exist. Uh, so you'll never write code again the same way if you don't know what Copilot is, is basically what this boils down to. Yep. Can I just share VS Code specific? Cool. All right. Oh, now all my Zoom windows are messed up. Hopefully we can see VS Code. I just lost the chat, so hopefully that's true. Um, we got VS Code. I'll, I'll get. Yep, we can see it. We can I'll see it. Try to zoom in here for you. Awesome. Oh, that's too much. We'll close all of this out. Uh, don't save. Don't care. All right, so I have Copilot running over here. You can see it down here. It says, hey, would you like to disable Copilot? Never. Um, I can close the terminal. We don't need that. So if I were to come into whatever this is and say, I'm going to write, um, we'll just say JavaScript really quick, a JavaScript file. And Copilot supports much more than JavaScript, okay? Uh, I can do something like this. I can create a comment with Copilot. Trying to make this a little bigger for you. And I can say um, import express and create a web server. And if I hit enter, like it writes all this code for me. And it's it's sometimes correct, right? Use uh there we oh, go. It that. even knows the comments that I want. Um listen for requests. Right. And it'll write a lot of code. Right. So there servers listening there. I didn't I've not written any code on my own. Right. So I, I can just come down here and there we go. It even had an idea. So this is what the catch is, is GitHub is parsing all these public repositories to train this thing. Right. So we can say create uh, a route to handle the requests. <laughs> right. Matt B. Exactly. But yeah. The thing yeah, but the thing about that, the thing about it, uh, uh, Mabby, is that, um, yeah, it is a little bit spooky. This is one of those things where if the product is free, you're paying for it somehow. You are paying for it somehow. 
right? So pretty cool. Um, now, security folks, fun fact number 400. Uh, I'm sure this number has changed. Um, cool, stop sharing. We, we don't need to anymore. Uh, I'm sure this number has changed. However, at one point in time, when Copilot was really new, it was responsible for 40, per, like the code that it would put up, 40% um, of the GitHub Copilot suggested code was vulnerable. <laughs> wow. so, you still need a developer. You still have to have somebody that knows what they're, they're doing to, to look through everything yeah. to make sure that, that the code is good. You're not going to automate yourself out of a job. Uh, wow. Simply Copilot parses public repositories. Mm -hmm. Let's think of who creates those public repositories tons of students right tons of people learning to code right so half right. of copilot's suggestions or almost half of their suggestions are written by people with little to no experience and they were like 40 percent of the suggested code was vulnerable so it, it's important to set up the pipelines around something like copilot copilot's not limited to javascript if you're a devops person and you need like Kubernetes manifest suggestions, Copilot will write your manifest, Copilot will write your Docker files, Copilot will write Go for you, Copilot doesn't touch Rust. Um, actually, it might, I don't know. If you- I haven't even looked, dude, to see if it would do it. I, I, would, yeah. I would be really reticent to try that because Rust can be so tricky. As far as, you know, like ownership and stuff like that goes, I, it, it may take a minute for them to get something like that to work. Um, at the same time, though, Matt, couldn't we just as easily, because I saw that we did have access, for those of you who don't know what uh, CodeGuru is, it's an automated system in AWS that'll look at certain code, not all languages, but certain code languages, and um, and scan those. We can make that part of an auto automated process on the back end, couldn't we? Most likely. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's probably an action for it. If there's not an action for it, as long as there's an AWS API for it, you could write an action for it. There we go. Um the GitHub offers something called security folks. You might like this. It's called code QL. Uh, they acquired a company called Semel uh, a little over a year or two ago. And they brought in a different type of code scanning. It's not static code analysis from the point of view of like the, the typical like static analysis that you might do. It's a pattern like it, it observes the, the coding patterns that your developers have implemented and tries to detect vulnerable patterns in their code. And that is a direct feature, especially for um, enterprise GitHub that you can, and you can configure it on your repos. It's called code QL and uh, it's, it fires off through GitHub actions and you can yep. set all of these really interesting rules. There's a giant like bug bounty program for it to, to write your own custom code queries to see like what's pertinent to you. Uh, and CodeQL has found, it's responsible for finding a ton of vulnerabilities and helping update all the CVEs um, that, it, that we see Dependabot use to say, hey, this is vulnerable or that's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So CodeQL, you can, you can tie that right in. That's a really cool thing. That's, it's not a standard static analysis tool you would right. still need to run static analysis if you wanted to be super covered, but it is possible. Do you have any parting thoughts for us, Matt, before I throw in? Actually, I'll start with- Oh, Mona. yeah. Look, I'm so GitHub, my cup has Mona on it. Oh, man. What a <laughs> goober. <laughs> um. Y'all, honestly, uh, when it comes to there's at I and E, we're really focusing, you know, not on what the industry wants you to learn. We're focusing on what the employers want. Okay. Which means that we do things is like not only are we talking to some of the biggest, you know, the biggest companies around there that in uh, higher um, IT staff, but this is also my personal experience, you know, being in the rooms with Fortune, you know, probably every one of the Fortune top 100 companies walking around. And this is something I kind of did to myself. I would look at their laptops. Like if I was just in the back of the room talking with some folks, I was doing a lecture on something like that. I would look at the tools they were using. And typically these are the things I would see. Visual Studio Code. Obviously there's coders in the room. I would see stuff like Terraform. I'd see Slack and I would see GitHub. 
This is a big, this is a big demand skill. This is what folks are looking for. So anytime, and, and again, thank y'all so much for showing up. Huge deal for y'all for uh to us for y'all to show up and be a part of this. Um, and see this delivery of this GitHub for everyone. But at, for you personally, I'm gonna really, really, really going to encourage you, keep working with a skill. Make this your daily thing. Even if it's you're continuing to learn, set up a repo for your notes for a particular subject that you're studying and start putting notes in there and, and go through the whole process, exactly. issues, branches, do the whole thing. So when that day comes, when you're either at that job interview or if you, congratulations, already have the job, when they say to you, clone the repo, fork the repo, open up a pull request. Your reaction simply is, Psh, I got this. Matt? Yeah, one of the ways that I really got involved when I was new with, with adopting GitHub was I have like profile files, right? Like my dot files on my, my Macs and my Linux, right? Like both of those machines have like my bash RC or my whatever config, ZSH config, right? For my terminal. And every time you reinstall those operating systems or those tools, like you got to go through the pain of like reconfiguring them. And all it is, is just text in a dot file. Right. So consider creating a repo that's, that's for machine configuration where you just simply store all of your dot files, and then you can quickly set up your terminal. If you ever need to reinstall your terminal app or whatever yes. it might be, that's, that's how I got started is I, I did that stuff. And then I started storing like scripts and small stuff to help with my daily work um, inside of GitHub. And then that, that stemmed into now I'm doing applications, mm -hmm. Terraform files, mm -hmm. Docker, Kubernetes, yeah. you name it, it's all there. Yeah. Um, but definitely uh, start small, right? Pick something that matters to you in that moment right. you need it. It's all going to like turn on. You're going to be like, Oh, thank God I had that in GitHub. Exactly. It's like, it's like a, one of our, uh, one of the labs that I'm working on right now for our AWS track. It is, you are completely out of luck. You don't have access to anything and you've got to rebuild an environment. What are you going to do? Well, a little more to it, but at the end of the day, it's GitHub. It's pulling from the repo that's got your infrastructure as code in there, pulling it in there and throwing it back out. And again, having those GitHub skills, y'all, it's not going to be a nice to have in times to come. It's going to be a requirement. You're going to be expected. Like they're not even going to ask you, do you understand GitHub? They're just going to say, hey, you need to fork that repo and figure out what's going on. That's going gotcha. to be the whole conversation. Yep. So thank you all for your time. Yeah. We're happy to hang out for a couple minutes and answer any questions you might have. I'm just seeing a bunch of excited and thank yous coming in. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Yeah, you're this way is... too kind to us, especially Brooks. You can't, you shouldn't be that kind of Brooks. Uh, yeah. Well, it's actually Matt that, you know, <laughs> you, have to, you have to be kind to him. <laughs> uh, that That's all we have. I mean, boot yeah. camp is wrapped. So enjoy your weekend and we'll hang out. So. And again, if you guys would, um, if you guys want to fill out the uh, the survey, we'd really appreciate that because that way we can actually say, hey, we actually did this thing. So leave us alone. Wow. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, they kind of <laughs> like to know that we do work. Actually, you know, j j as we're closing up here a little bit. Uh, hey, Adam, we're done, dude. If you want to uh, close things down, we're just going to keep running our mouse. I kind of half lied, everybody, when Matt said, when I said I didn't get anything from AWS. It's one of the funniest things. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the mascot of Amazon is a little character called Pecky. He's supposed to be peculiar. Oh. And uh, when we first got that, we found out it was actually a USB drive and nobody uh, at all used it. We all thought it was a security trick. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, if you plug that in, you're getting a call. Don't do it. Yeah, right. Don't do it. I, uh, <laughs> when I was, thanks, Patrick. I got really into social engineering early in my career, like, because again instructor people like the personality yeah. side of it so i have cufflinks that are usb like they're usb cufflinks so i had like whatever nefarious stuff i would want on yeah. those usb cufflinks and i would just try to social engineer in my place to plug in the or into places to plug in those usb <laughs> wow yeah. thanks matt b thanks lola hey by the way real quick about lola that's uh carolyn's you see there she's the one that's got it rough she's sitting in tokyo so oh, she is yeah, up, you're way she is crazy. Very late, y'all, uh, interacting with us. So thank you so much, Lola. <laughs> That's awesome. 
She's probably laughing right now at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 5.15 a.m. Yep. On a weekend. Come on. Yes. On a weekend. Two, two, two. Well, cool. All right. So I think we're ready. I think we're done, man. So if you guys don't have anything else again, thank you. This was really cool of y'all to show up, participate, be a part of this. Wish you the best of luck. Absolute so best of luck. Yeah. Genuinely this, just fun. Yeah. And again, imagine if we'd been in a room, there would have been yelling and throwing. There things would have been thrown. Lots of throwing. There would have been throwing. So with that said, on behalf of myself, Matt, the awesome producer, Adam, um, everybody at AINE, thank you all so very much. And with that, Matt, click the magic button.